Good morning, everyone. We would like to welcome the President of Israel, Mr. Isaac Herzog. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 18th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. We are very excited to be back physically for the first time after three years. My name is Miri Michaeli, and it's my honor and pleasure to moderate this year's conference. The theme of this year's conference is Earth and Space Becoming One. This year is a very special year for us. On the one hand, we are proud to be celebrating the Israeli Space Agency 40th year. On the other hand, we are also marking 20 years to the Columbia Shuttle disaster, an event that was engraved in our hearts and has shaped the Israeli space and education communities for the past two decades. So with these bittersweet feelings, on behalf of the Israel Space Agency within the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us in this special event, the 18th Ilan Ramol International Space Conference. In the next two days, we will listen, discuss, meet, connect, and engage with leading space actors from industry, academia, and national organizations, both Israeli and globally, all united in one goal, to bring space and Earth closer together. During the conference, we will hold panels led by industry experts who will discuss issues such as space policies, climate change, investments in space, manufacturing in space, and more. In addition to the talks and panels in this fabulous conference hall, you are welcome to visit our extraordinary exhibition hall where top Israeli companies are showcasing their technologies. And now, without further ado, the audience is requested to stand up while we invite to the stage His Excellency, Mr. Isaac Herzog, the President of the State of Israel. Good morning, everybody. Please be seated. Shalom uvracha, good morning. My good friend, Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Ophir Akunis, and it's an opportunity to wish you great success in your new position. Minister of State for Public Education and Advanced Technology of the United Arab Emirates, Your Excellency Sarah bint Yusuf Al-Amiri, welcome, marhaba, and I want to thank you for hosting us in your conference not long ago in Abu Dhabi. NASA Associate Administrator Robert D. Cabana and his excellent team, outgoing Chairman of the Israel Space Agency, Professor Yitzhak Ben Israel, and incoming Chairman of the Israel Space Agency, Professor Dan Bloomberg, Director General of the Israel Space Agency, Brigadier General Uri Oron, heads of the space agencies from all over the world, ambassadors, and most importantly, members of the Ramon family, first and foremost, Tal, who's here, 
and I know Iftach will join us later. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure and honor to be here at this 18th annual Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. Ilan Ramon will always be a hero and role model for us, a proud Israeli and a man of vision and courage who gave so much to our nation. The Ramon Foundation, which carries his and his son Asaf's legacy, was his remarkable wife's Rona's way of transforming devastating grief into a force of good. Her children, Ilan's children, Noah, Tal, and Iftach, continue to carry this amazing legacy, even as their own lives have been imprinted with indescribable loss. They continue to use their creativity, their determination, and sense of purpose to make it a better and more beautiful world. Friends, we live in a revolutionary era of space exploration. I would say a new era. And its promise for humanity touches our deepest imaginations and dreams. Like Jules Verne at the time, who was imagining realities long before they played out in practice, so are we here as we see the fate of humanity depending on outer space. It is my personal belief that the human colonization of space is only a matter of time, we just discussed it outside, an inevitable future destination point in the arc of human development. In Israel, there is already a dizzying array of public and private actors actively exploring these new directions. Just yesterday, I met with the Israeli astronaut who's here with us this morning, Eitan Stiebe. We had met as he was preparing for Axio Mission 1, and I had given him a, a token to take with him to space, a glass cube imprinted with a prayer for the well-being of the State of Israel, originally authored by my late grandfather, Rabbi Isaac Halevi Herzog, Israel's first chief rabbi. Eitan promised he would make, to make it back to Earth safely and return it to me for safekeeping, and here it is. And it is a great honor for me to introduce it to you. And thank you, Eitan, for protecting it throughout the mission. Likewise, in our own Negev Desert, in a remarkable international research collaboration, a crew of astronauts whom I met at my residence just a few months ago spent weeks stimulating, simulating living conditions on Mars. And I want to thank my friend Chilik Sion from the Manufacturers Association of Israel for bringing this project to my attention. Yes, the possibilities seem to stretch beyond anything we can imagine. But, my friends, we must remember that all of this seemingly infinite possibility isn't only about reaching beyond ourselves to new planets, it is also about using our new capabilities to preserve and protect this fragile and beautiful planet we call home. In fact, when Elon was abound, aboard the Columbia spacecraft, he talked about how beautiful planet Earth appears from all the way up in space, but also about how unspeakable fragile it is. Earth, he said, must be protected. And just as hundreds of kilometers above land, borders disappear and are replaced by an intense awareness that we all share one Earth, I believe we must work together across borders and divides to help make life on this planet better for everyone. I believe that we in Israel have a great deal to offer, not just as an active contributor to the space ecosystem, but as an actor that brings willingness to see across divides and work together for the common good. And I'm proud to say that beyond long-standing cooperation with NASA, and others, we are also welcoming new collaborations like the joint space venture with the United Arab Emirates, unthinkable only just a few years ago. Of course, 
Beyond investing in research and in collaborations, space education for the future generation, and this is what I spoke about with our good NASA friends this morning, you can see it in the children's eyes as they sparkle like stardust when they learn about space. So the last great era of space exploration was driven by the competition of the Cold War. And I believe that a new era of space exploration can be driven by goodwill of our Western, uh, sorry, goodwill of our warm peace. So let us walk in the footsteps, or rather soar in the flight path of Elon Ramon and his fellow astronauts and move upwards and onwards, harnessing the power of space for the promise of Earth. Together, we can take space exploration and our capacity for human collaboration to new heights and save our planet from new and terrifying depths. I thank the Israeli Space Agency, excellent people, for everything it has done to promote the Israeli space industry and acknowledge in particular the Director General, my good friend Uri Oron, and the new Chairman, Professor Dan Bloomberg. I further thank all of you for the participating in this conference. I envy you. I would have loved spending all the hours and time with you, but enjoy it and bring good to humanity. Todaraba and good morning to all of you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. 20 years ago, we were all struck with the sad news of the Columbia shuttle disaster. Coming out now as they are making their way to the astronaut pad. Commander Rick Husband, Halo Space Specialist Ilan Ramon, Pilot William McCool, and Mission Specialist Michael Anderson, David Brown, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Houston now controlling the flight. A very good morning to the red team. We're looking forward to another productive day with you. Uh, the music was for Elan. That was Hatishma Koli. Hatishma Koli. We took uh, several special things, uh, first of all the Israeli flag, and the Israeli declaration uh, of independence. Mission Control confirms it lost contact. There's been no further communication with the shuttle Columbia. The Columbia's lost. There are no survivors.
Today, we pause to remember the crew of the Columbia Space Shuttle, including the first Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon, who tragically lost their lives in the service of all humankind. To honor the memory of the Columbia Shuttle crew, I would like to invite to the stage Mr. Robert Cabana, the Associate Administrator of NASA. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Bokertov. Uh, I would like to thank uh, President Herzog, um, Minister Akunas, uh, the Israeli Space Agency, my friends Dan Bloomberg and uh, Uri Oran, and the Ramon Foundation for bringing our international community together uh, today for this conference. Uh, 20 years ago, tomorrow, uh, before 8 o'clock in the morning, I was out at midfield at the shuttle landing facility at the Kennedy Space Center, waiting for those twin sonic booms that would usher Columbia and the crew home to KSC. Unfortunately, those booms never came, and uh, it was obvious that we had uh, lost Columbia, and I had the unenviable task of telling the families that their loved ones uh, were not going to come home. Uh, I don't ever want to have to do that again on my watch. Uh, we are in a business that is terribly unforgiving of mistakes. And as I discussed with some uh, last night at the uh, dinner, uh, we in leadership positions have a responsibility to learn from our mistakes of the past and not repeat them in the future. And I hope that all of us in leadership positions create an environment where everyone is heard where we listen to people's concerns and we act on them so that we don't repeat the uh, mistakes of the past. Uh, Elan was a, a remarkable individual. I wish I could have got to know him better. I, I will never forget his infectious smile, uh, his attitude. Uh, he was a, a great man. Uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity uh, to speak to 2,500 students. Uh, in the finals to select experiments to fly on the International Space Station uh, that the Ramon Foundation is sponsoring. And uh, their enthusiasm, this is what we do. This is what space does for us. It is our future. It's imperative that we work together. And uh, to see the enthusiasm that those students had, it, it, it excites me. It energizes me. And I know that Rona would be extremely proud of what she started 18 years ago had she been able to be there yesterday uh, to see that. I want to thank uh, uh, Israel for the partnership that we have. Uh, we flew on uh, Artemis I together with the Mare experiment. We're partnering on Ultrasat and uh, Bearsat II, and I, I think it's really important. Uh, thank you for your, your friendship and your partnership. I want to uh, pass on uh, the best regards from our administrator, uh, Bill Nelson, and Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy. I know that they wish they could be here. And uh, I look forward to all of us working together as we move forward, exploring beyond our home planet, establishing a presence for humans uh, within our solar system. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cabana. Sal Ramon, Ilan Ramon's son, is here with us today. I'm humbled and honored to invite Tal to say a few words and play music in honor of his father. First, I'd like to thank you all for being here today on this very special gathering. My mother was one of the founders of this conference and the Israeli Space Week. She used to say on this very stage, Asaf and Ilan's smile is our legacy. Her words continue to echo strongly today, as they did years ago. 20 years have gone by since my father fulfilled his dream and became the first Israeli astronaut. My father taught us always to stride forward, to not be afraid to take risks, 
and to see the human potential for doing good and making positive change in the world. My brother, Asaf, did exactly that. When the late president, Shimon Peres, awarded him his flight wings upon graduation with excellence from the Flight Academy course. This was one of our most happiest times as a family and one of our most proudest moments. My father's achievements and passion continue to remind us to strive to build a better future, a future full of meaning, a future of peace, and equality. He reminds us to see the bigger picture, to see that we are all part of something bigger than ourselves. To this day, his strong character shines as a beacon of inspiration and hope. His endeavor continues to motivate so many people to innovate, to develop new ideas, open minds, and dream beyond what we can see and perceive. And I remember, as a child, how much he loved and admired his fellow crew members on the STS-107. They had such a deep and meaningful connection. They did the thing that they loved the most, fulfilling their dreams for their country and for the better sake of humanity. When we were in Houston during the astronaut training program, one of our good friends, told us that once a country sends their first astronaut into space, it has a profound impact in the field of science and space when the astronaut comes back. Sadly, my father did not get the chance to, get this, to see this realization, but my mother had the understanding of this unique opportunity. And so, with her strong intuition, the Ramon Foundation was born. The foundation was born to, uh, to form to aid, educate, and maximize the potential of youth and adults in areas of leadership, science, space, and innovation, bringing people together in the name and inspiration of my brother Asaf Ramon and my father Ilan Ramon. I'm so proud to tell you that because of what they have accomplished, we continue to see inspired and smiling faces all over our country. And it's amazing how this foundation has grown and everything and everyone joined hands together for this wonderful cause. My mother knew that turning pain into hope would not be an easy task. But my father and my brother's memory lit the way for the fulfillment of this vision. This was her way to make a better reality. In many ways, my mother was the one who built the bridge between Israel and space education. This was probably why she was nicknamed the Space Ambassador of Israel. It is really heartwarming to see how the actions of my brother and my parents continue to ripple throughout our society today. 20 years have gone by, and still, when children hear the story of Israel's first astronaut, they get filled with such strong motivation and pride. And now, we look forward to the next 20 years, when the, generation, when the next generation will grow up and go after their dreams, no matter in what field, because of this great legacy. Many don't know this, but my father played the piano. His mother, Tonia Wolfelman, was a Holocaust survivor, and she was a piano teacher. Through the years, I've been playing his piano, which he purchased with his first pilot paycheck. This is how my connection to music was formed, as a cherished reminder of my father, knowing that he sat and played the same keys as I do. Today, I choose to play a piece I composed on his piano called Victoria. It is a composition that my mother really loved, and it symbolizes victory. To prevail and to rise from hardship, to expand the light and live. Thank you. 
Thank you, Tal, for your touching word and beautiful music. Distinguished guests, at this point, I would like to thank the president of, for honoring the event with his presence. Due to previous commitments, His Excellency will need to leave us now. The audience is requested to stand up as we bid farewell to the president and his staff. You may be seated. Thank you. The Israel Space Agency is part of the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology. I'm honored to invite to the stage the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Member of Knesset, Ophir Akunis. Thank you. Good morning. Where is Tal? Still here? Tal, you're here? It was beautiful. It was really beautiful. Thank you. And Iftah is also here? Good morning, both of you. Ramon's family. Dear ambassadors, astronauts, Mr. Gadi Arielli, Director General of the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, Mr. Uri Oron, Director of the Israel Space Agency. Uh, Dan Bloomberg is here as well. And your predecessor, Itzik Ben Israel, is here with us. Her Excellency, Sarah Bint Yusufil Amiri, Minister of State for Public Education and Advanced Technology from United Arab Emirates. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm so glad. I remember when we uh, approved the peace treaty in the cabinet um, more than two, two years ago, something like that. That was very important. I'm very happy and I'm very happy that you are here in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Dear heads of space agencies, Mr. Robert Cabana, Associate Administrator, Administrator from NASA. Dear guests, throughout the years, the Ilan Ramon International Space Conference has become a milestone for the national and international space communities. Also, the research and development sectors, along with businesses, defense ecosystems, all united to explore and to be at the front of innovating activities of the space sector. This conference is held in a memory of the first Israeli astronaut, Lieutenant Colonel Ilan Ramon. He was an Israeli hero. He is an Israeli, an Israeli hero. The legacy of Ilan Ramon will linger forever and will continue to be an engine behind the entire Israeli space ecosystem. Over the years, heads of space agencies from around the world have attended the conference, and even today, leaders of the global space community from far and wide, such as Italy, Morocco, UAE, United States, Germany, Rwanda, France, Germany, have gathered, and much more, have gathered here together. NASA, the US Space Agency, has been represented at this conference since its, in, since its inception at the highest levels. The Ilan Ramon Space Conference is also a showcase for the Israeli space research, development, and industry sector. I encourage you all to travel this country, visit fascinating companies and research centers spread across the country. The space sector naturally thrives of international cooperation. I am confident that this conference and the bilateral meetings, and we'll meet right after the, the meeting, the, the, um, the, this event, uh, will con uh, contribute to the expansion of international cooperation in the field of space. 
We hope, and I'm sure, that we will continue and promote Israel's strategic plan in the field of space, which includes investment of 600 million shekels over a period of five years. I would like to thank all those who have worked in the last few uh, weeks for the success of this conference. To Mr. Uri Oron, the director of Israel Space Agency, thank you very much, Uri, and your, of course, your entire team in ISA, the Department of the International Relations at the Ministry of Science and Technology, and many more. My deepest gratitude and appreciation to you and to the staff. I wish our guests from around the world a successful and enjoyable visit to Israel and all the participation. Enjoy the conference. I welcome you to Israel. Welcome you to Tel Aviv. Enjoy your stay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Akunis. Following the Abraham Accords and the important relationship that has grown between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, we are honored to invite to stage Her Excellency Sara Bint Yusuf Al Amiri, the UAE Minister of State for Advanced Technology and Chairwoman of the UAE Space Edge Agency. Her Excellency. Good morning. Salam alaikum. It is a pleasure being here with you today in this historic moment for both the Emirates and for us joining in this historic event for the space sector here in Israel. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed attendees, as we gather today at the 18th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference, let us be inspired by the words of the first Israeli astronaut who reminded us that from space, our world looks as one unit without borders. And it is with the great pleasure that we are here after the Abraham Accords to be participants in this wonderful conference. In the spirit of unity and cooperation that we must embrace and as we continue Ilan Ramon's quest to deepen our understanding of the universe and our place in it. As leaders of the space industry, it is an honor to be in the company of such esteemed colleagues to discuss the latest advancements in space technology and exploration. This conference is a valuable platform for us to share our knowledge, ideas, and vision for the future of space exploration. We have witnessed significant advancements in satellite technology, human space exploration, space-based research, which have expanded our knowledge of our planet and our universe. We have also seen the emergence of new technologies that have the potential to revolutionize the way we work together to address the pressing challenges our planet faces. We have also witnessed times where space brought nations together, and unfortunately, times that space was used to further polarize our world. Under the strategic vision of our President, His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed Al Nahyan, President of the United Arab Emirates, we have echoed the values of the space sector and the importance of cooperation. But more importantly for us, we have echoed the role of sustainability and the sustainability of our very fragile planet. As more young nations establish their space programs and private companies enter the field, the importance of international cooperation and collaboration in developing the space economy has become increasingly urgent. In December of last year, we held the very first edition of the Abu Dhabi Space Debate, a global platform for leaders and policymakers. We had the pleasure of welcoming the President of Israel as the first keynote speaker in that inaugural event. That event brought decision makers together with space leaders to discuss pressing topics of, and the importance of global in, uh, participation and global leadership in addressing key challenges and open questions, such as the congestion in the lower Earth orbit of space, the geopolitics of space and its impact if we continue down the path that we're going to, the importance of updating legislations and regulations in the space sector 
to serve the diversity of nations today in the sector and the private sector that continues to grow. Additional sessions, of course, of this debate must continue as we come closer to COP28, which is being held at Dubai Expo City. The role of the space sector in furthering sustainability, the role that we all see of how fragile our planet is needs to become very evident in this COP28, which will be held in Dubai. It is becoming increasingly apparent that cooperation between advanced and emerging countries in the space sector is the key to sustainable development. This can lead to development of more effective and cost-efficient technologies, implementing bigger and more sophisticated programs. We can only be able to achieve this if we further uh, collaborate and we further ensure that collaboration mechanisms is inclusive, includes both emerging and growing nations, and ensures the development of both the private sector and assured access to space for generations to come. The UAE Space Agency has initiated multiple programs, a lot of it under its space fund, which, which is around 3 billion dirhams to be invested in the creation of the space sector. We have worked on space analytics and solutions program for both environmental monitoring and food security, two important factors that are close at heart for the Emirates. And our space data center's geospatial platform aims to increase products and services in Earth observation to continue to grow the private sector in the Emirates, but for the region. And we continue to work in collaboration with the Israeli Space Agency to grow that. Our collaboration as leaders in the space sector through this conference, agreements, cooperation, and partnership ensures a peaceful coexistence, equal utilization of space resources, and the development of solutions for humanity's most urgent issues. The spirit of understanding and discovery drives us to continue pushing the boundaries of what is possible in space. Today, we are witnessing a new era of space exploration, one that is marked by collaboration and cooperation between countries, private companies, research institutions. In, in conclusion, let us continue to work together and make the impossible possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Her Excellency. I want to thank the Minister of Kunis for being with us. Thank you very much. One of the most important space events in the past year is the Artemis project that's going to bring humanity back to the moon and onward to Mars. Today we have the honor to learn about this project from the person leading it. Today's keynote speaker is Mr. James Free. Mr. Free is NASA's Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development and as such he oversees the Artemis program, NASA's courageous endeavor to the moon. Free has served in a number of leadership positions, including Director of Space Flight Systems at NASA's John H. Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, where he was responsible for overseeing the management of Glenn's significant activities in NASA's Space Shuttle Program, the International Space Station, Space Communications, Human Research, and Science Programs. Mr. Free will shed light on the Artemis program, present the latest findings and insights from the Artemis One mission, and share his vision of future sp space exploration programs. Mr. Free, the stage is yours. Our return to the moon will be different than the last time. We plan to explore more of the lunar surface and the learn space how to system move. is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. And here we go. Hydrogen burn off igniters initiate. Seven, six, five, four stage engines start. Three, two, one. Boosters and ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. We are all part of something incredibly special the first launch of Artemis. This 
view of Earth from a human-rated spacecraft not seen since 1972 during the final Apollo missions. Distant retrograde orbit, we're going to be about 38,000 miles away from the lunar surface. We're going beyond anywhere we ever went for Apollo. The Orion spacecraft is barreling its way back home after circumnavigating the moon and beyond in an elliptical distant retrograde orbit. Splashdown. Orion back on Earth. Well, good morning. Yeah, Our return absolutely. to the moon will be different than the last time. That's, uh, it's been almost two months since, uh, since the landing. And last night, we were down here practicing the video um, to, to make sure it worked. And, and I sat out in the audience. And I've seen the video, I guess, twice. I thought it was just once. Um, but both times before some kind of stressful meetings. And last night, I was kind of jet lagged, let down a little bit. And uh, I have to tell you, I actually got very emotional when I saw that video last night, thinking about um, the sacrifices that people made to get us there, but knowing how hard it was, but really that first step that we're taking now. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. And it's a great honor to be here today to speak at this conference, to be in Tel Aviv, to be part of Israeli's Space Week, and to honor Alain Ramon at the conference in his name. Um, as we honor the 20th anniversary of STS-107, Alon's story remains striking to me. He is one of the millions that watched Neil Armstrong's first steps on the moon and couldn't believe his luck that he would have the honor of meeting both Neil and Buzz Aldrin 30 years later while training for his own mission. Neil, when he was in space, was always amazed with Earth's beauty, and Alon was certainly no different. You've heard some of that today. During his time in space, he played the role of ambassador for bringing Jewish and uh, Israeli objects with him on the shuttle. And his legacy lives on today through this conference, through all the people he has touched, supporting science and education in Israel. His story inspired and touched many. As they say, may his memory be a blessing. Alon's flight was absolutely fantastic, a demonstration of what can happen when countries work together to achieve for all humanity. I'm honored and excited to lead our return to the moon with the coalition of international partners, many of here today, to really do that long-term research and technology development that we can begin to learn how to live on another world. After all, going to the moon and learning to live, work, develop systems, and test these systems at the moon is how we'll put humans on Mars. Space exploration benefits humanity. It promotes innovation. It fosters diplomacy. And while exploration advances our understanding of the universe and inspires us to pursue our dreams, international cooperation in space will increase scientific discovery, grow the global economy, and inspire a new generation to study science, technology, engineering, and math. And working together, we together can fuel that new technology development. Technology as we know it has been shaped through research conducted outside of Earth's atmospheres for many years. For, from commercial applications in health and medicine to advancements in manufacturing, tremendous leaps have been made. Likewise, the technologies developed in the aerospace sector have been transferred into commercial products and services that are used throughout our daily lives. More groundbreaking technologies are just around the corner as we explore the moon more than ever before. We took that first critical step on Artemis I, and I could not be more excited about the next one. And as you saw on November 16th, the Space Launch System rock rocketed off the Earth for the first time, lifting the Orion spacecraft into orbit from our Kennedy Space Center on a historic, groundbreaking 1.4 million mile journey around the moon and back. Using 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, 
the only rocket powerful and safe enough to launch Orion and its future human occupants to the moon in one shot lit up the Florida night sky. I was honored to experience the launch from inside the launch control center and, and the, the windows had a lot of condensation on them. So, so for us in the, in the control center, it looked like this little light, which I knew it was a lot bigger than a little light, by the way. And uh, as it went up, I was like, hey, this is, this is really happening. And we're looking at data and turned around to try and see it. And I was like, I know it's going up. And then the sound hit the windows in the launch control center. And, and that's when you knew something significant was happening. Over the next 25 and a half days, our team executed a, a picture-perfect mission. Orion became the first human-rated spacecraft to enter a distant retrograde orbit, a highly stable orbit that uses very little fuel to main maintain it. At its farthest point in orbit, Orion surpassed the distance record for a spacecraft designed to carry humans and safely return them, traveling 268,953 miles from Earth on November 28th breaking the record set during the Apollo 13 mission. We used that distant retrograde orbit to test Orion's systems far from Earth. Engineers uh, further validated Orion's systems and pushed the boundaries of the spacecraft's performance, from certifying the optical navigation system, which you saw images of, to understanding the propellant use, to stressing the limits of the communication systems. We put Orion through its paces, and it performed wonderfully. I'm pleased to say that the fully integrated space launch system and Orion met every primary flight objective. We performed an end -end de demonstration of all the mission phases and ground support facilities with the launch and flight of the spacecraft, including safely landing and recovering the Orion capsule. The mission went so well that we added additional objectives midway. In total, we accomplished 21 added real-time objectives in addition to the 124 we planned at launch. An example, an ad objective occurred on day 14 where we collected information on Orion's thermal characterization to help the engineers explore the range of capabilities of the thermal system performance. This reduced uncertainty for all our future Artemis mission planning, helping us feel better when we put crew on the next mission. The additional objectives also put Orion and service module thrusters through its paces, testing a range of, uh, an array of firing configurations and timings that we'll incorporate on Artemis II. However, one of the main objectives and the most challenging phase was bringing the spacecraft home. Before splashing down in the Pacific Ocean on December 11th, Orion began its uh, skip reentry technique to demonstrate the performance of its heat shield at lunar return velocities with temperatures exceeding 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly half the temperature of the sun's surface. The last half hour before Orion sa uh, safely landed in the water was truly nail-biting. Uh, we were able to watch the uh, splashdown from inside MCC, and I have to tell you, uh, we, we were hearing the, the calls from mission control, and uh, we had a, a loss of signal period that was a little longer. We expected two. The first one is a little longer, and the second one started a little earlier. And uh, there was a little angst, I, I have to say. Uh, when we saw those parachutes come out and that hit the water, I have to tell you, I kind of bent over and grabbed onto my knees and let out a pretty big sigh, um, along with most of uh, the agency. Seeing an Orion, Orion later uh, that day in the well duck of the US Navy, uh, USS Portland, filled me with a great deal of pride. We did it. We flew a successful Artemis I mission. In doing so, we validated NASA's deep space transportation system, which astronauts rely on for human exploration. In 25 and a half days, we came incredibly far. Everyone involved in Artemis I across the world should be proud of their work. And while Ar Artemis I was a phenomenal step, it's just that, a step. It's a flight test to prove the integrated Artemis I vehicle. On our next mission, Artemis II, we'll fly astronauts around the moon, traveling farther into the solar system than humanity has ever traveled before. Artemis III will mark humanity's return to the lunar surface in more than 50 years. However, Artemis is more than just about that lunar return. With Artemis, we're returning to the moon to accomplish something more ambitious than anything humanity has ever attempted. I can tell you, when you look at the schedules, it's pretty daunting. We'll learn how to live and work on another planetary body. The impact of Artemis and our lunar exploration efforts will ripple out in ways that will be impossible to measure precisely. In short, in short Artemis will change the world. 
It will demonstrate global vision, inspire generations of outstanding achievements, and inspire those future explorers. Under Artemis, we'll advance a robust cis cislunar ecosystem to prepare for future missions to Mars. To get to this point, we need a sustainable campaign of missions. The pri priority of sustainability is in inherently different from anything that NASA has done before or been charged to do. And as a result, we'll need strategic direction because sustainability comes from understanding why we're going to the moon and keep that why as our North Star. To create that lunar ecosystem, NASA has developed and released Moon to Mars objectives, guideposts for what we like to achieve at the Moon and Mars, which will shape an architecture that keeps the Moon to Mars visions consistent and constant. How we go to the Moon and how we go to Mars will inform how we go even further. Our objectives provide clear direction for new technologies, vehicles, and elements to be developed. And the objectives are stable enough that fluctuations in funding, geopolitical influences, and other external pressures are independent to our continued progress to achieve them. When we develop these objectives, we aim to cover the practical and the aspirational, giving ourselves political, financial, and technical resilience. To fulfill our objectives, we are building an extensible, evolvable architecture that supports that long-term presence that I mentioned. The systems are required are vastly different than previously developed. Our efforts will not be possible with our international and industry partners, the steadfast support towards a collective vision. As countries join the Artemis effort, they'll advance their own economies and improve their own national po posture, much as Alon, Alon continues to do with his legacy in this conference and the inspirational words that you've heard today. Through our agreements, we'll make commitments to one another that will set up the interdependencies for success. These, the countries that participate with us, continued investments and the investments countries will make on future missions will ensure that every nation that wants to invest will go and learn. Nations worldwide will develop hardware for lunar orbit or the moon, or, moon surface. Others will contribute scientific instruments, our plan is to contribute to, that all contributing companies may participate on the science teams and in scientific data sharing. What collectively we learn will revolutionize our understanding of the moon and the history of the Earth. Together, our partners will show the world that space is for everyone, exploring with Artemis crews from a highly diverse astronaut corps. Artemis astronauts will step into the future when they land, bringing humanity with them. Everyone living during these missions is a member of the Artemis generation. When I say everyone, I mean it. Underpinning our approach is the belief that will be a global effort and our actions will set a precedent. This means how we go is as important as what we do. In the spirit of peaceful exploration, it will mean our adhering to shared values of openness, transparency, shared data, and commitment to norms that will help us work together. This is why we established the Artemis Accords, of which Israel is a signatory. The Artemis Accords are a set of principles grounded in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty by which the signatories commit to behave in a rules-based, responsible way in their space exploration activities. The premise of the Artemis Accords is very simple. They're based on universal principles that will enable the next generation of international partnerships going forward to explore the moon and beyond. Principles like transparency, interoperability, deconflicting activities, and tackling orbital debris. Today, 23 countries have joined the Accords, committing to establish that safe, peaceful, and prosperous future in space. Additional countries will sign the Accords in the months and years ahead. Working with both new and existing partners will add new energy and capabilities to ensure the entire world can benefit from the journey of exploration and discovery. Artemis is that complex endeavor that humanity has never embarked upon before. And it's not just an American endeavor, it's a global endeavor. Many nations have an important role in this journey back to the moon, and our collective efforts are needed to make this path a success. As a result, we need partnerships from across the world, of nations of all sizes, companies both large and small, academia, Many countries, including Israel, have a significant role in this journey to the moon, and our collective efforts are needed to make Artemis a success. NASA and ISA have a strong and long-standing relationship. 
Israel demonstrated its commitment to Artemis with the contribution of the MARI experiment and Astrorad radiation protection vest on Artemis I, building on decades of partnership. There's a strong mutual interest between our, our country in scientific and lunar exploration, and we're excited to extend that partnership with new collaborations in space science with the Beersheet 2 lunar mission. We continue to explore operations and cooperations in joint missions, data exchanges, research instruments, onboard air and spacecraft, sounding rockets and scientific balloon flights, space communications, and other platforms impacting space exploration and Earth and space science. Most recently, we've discussed how to handle data from the lunar surface and life science. We know that Israeli industry is excited to get involved. Signing the Artemis Accords only strengthened our longstanding U.S.-Israeli relationship in space exploration. And with General Rohn as your leader of the future, I can tell you, is very bright. In our Apollo missions, our goal was straightforward, visit. What we're trying to achieve for Artemis is different in our Moon to Mars approach. Artemis will teach us how to live and work on that other planetary body. Because of this, our systems and strategies need to be different. Landing spots are a prime example. Because our goal during Apollo was to put boots on the moon, we picked landing, sp landing spots that were easier to get to, which were near the equator. It required minimal performance to land there, requiring the least amount of propellant and delta velocity. During Artemis, we want to explore for longer durations, potentially build bases, and demonstrate things we need to to go to Mars. Mars missions will last two to three years round trip, so we need to be able to conduct long stays on the moon to simulate that. As a result, we must look for resources, including water ice. This means going to the poles. Lunar ice can be melted into water for drinking and processed into breathable oxygen or converted into hydrogen and oxygen for power. We can extract that water ice also for rocket fuel. These storehouses of water, if we can get to them, enable us to spend more time on the surface and make going to other planets even easier. Additionally, the moon is a very unique and fascinating place, and we've only scratched the surface of, of being there. Uh, my uh, com uh, counterpart at the European Space Agency uses a great analogy that when we went to the moon before, it's like going to a museum. Um, but when we went before, we only went to the gift shop. Now we want to go to the rest of the moon. And the South Pole is far from Apollo landing sites, which were clustered around the moon's equator. Teams across NASA and across the lunar science community and the world are working together to consider possible landing sites from all angles, using expertise learned from decades of research and missions. Last year, we identified 13 candidate landing regions near the South Pole, each containing multiple potential landing sites for Artemis III alone. Several of the proposed sites within the regions are located among some of the oldest parts of the moon, up to four billion years old. And together with permanently shadowed regions, provide the opportunity to learn about the moon's history through previously unstudied lunar materials. To get to that point which, where, where we are studying the moon in depth and learning how to go onto Mars, there needs to be more to our architecture. While Artemis I flight test helped us validate two foundational pieces of our architecture, we need more than just those transportation systems. We need more than the Space Launch System and Orion. We need to consider what ele other elements are necessary for the lunar surface. This includes super heavy launch vehicles, an Earth return crewed spacecraft, lunar orbit docking, a lunar lander system, lunar surface um, uh, EVA suits, gateway, on-orbit fuel transfer, surface habitation, expanded mobility capabilities. Our entire architecture is being designed around going to the moon to do more for longer and increase that cadence of missions. As a result, we're acceler accelerating sustainable exploration through the capabilities we're building, from how much we can bring to, to the moon to even what we did on Artemis I to characterize the lunar environment. We captured vital science data about the environment and protective measures for future crews on Artemis I. The Space Launch System deployed 10 science investigations and technology demonstration called CubeSats, each the size of a shoebox. Each CubeSat had a unique mission, many from international partners, with the potential to help fill gaps in our knowledge of the solar system or demonstrate technologies that may help the design of future missions to explore the moon and beyond. We also had uh, mannequins inside the Orion capsule. Commander Munikan Campos, a human stand-in, sat in the spacecraft commander's seat and wore a first-generation Orion crew, crew survival system pressure suit. 
a spacesuit astronauts will wear during launch, entry, and other dynamic phases of their mission. Commander Campos was named after Arturo Campos, the electrical power subsystem manager for the Apollo 13 mission and its crew. He was a keen contributor to the safe return of Apollo 13, representing the diverse backgrounds that make the space program possible and keep astronauts safe on a, uh, uh, ambitious exploration missions. Commander Campos served multiple purpose, purposes. The Moodkin was equipped with a sensor under the headrest and another behind the seat that recorded accelerations and vibrations throughout the mission, as well as two internal radiation sensors. The seat was positioned in a recumbent or laid back position with elevated feet, which helped maintain blood flow to the head for crew members on future missions during ascent and entry. The position also reduces the chance of injury by allowing the head and feet to be held securely during launch and landing, distributing forces across the entire torso during high acceleration or deceleration periods such as splashdown. Joining Commander Campos were two identical phantom torsos that I know most of you are familiar with, Helga and Zohar. Sponsored by ISA and the German Aerospace Center, Helga and Zohar occupied Orion's lower seats. They made up the MARI experiment and the first time measured the amount of space radiation astronauts may experience inside Orion during missions. My gratitude to the MARI team for pulling together a phenomenal experiment. You are helping us all characterize the deep space environment. Space radiation is a significant human health risk and greatly influences how we plan long-term human spaceflight missions to the moon and to Mars. Understanding this risk and developing protective Measures like STEMRAD did with AstroRad vests could allow the crew to continue during working, during working during critical mission activities if a solar flare occurred while they're flying. This knowledge will improve our ability to prepare for and limit the effects of radiation exposure as humans begin to travel further into space on longer missions. Reducing this risk is essential for missions to Gateway, our lunar orbiting space station, and future missions to Mars. I'm looking forward to seeing the results of MARI later this summer. Concurrently, a small satellite is at the moon called Capstone to help us characterize our non-rectilinear halo orbit, or NRHO, for Gateway, our future lunar orbiting space station. Discovery of that orbit and understanding it will minimize the fuel we need and help us understand the cislunar space better. Even what we've learned about communications will accelerate sustainable ex uh, exploration. How we use our deep space network today and how we'll use advanced networking techniques in the future. Everything that we can learn at the moon will feed forward to Mars. The benefit of going to the moon is we're only days from home. Mars is years. Learning to operate these systems from the comfort of a few days from home will help us gain that confidence when we go on to Mars. This is similar to going on your first camping trip. For your first trip, you're not going to go deep into the wilderness or a remote area. You'll likely go someplace local where you're an hour away from home, where you can practice setting up your tent and lighting a fire, and if anything goes wrong, you can easily pack up and come home. And if everything goes right, the next trip, you'll have the confidence to go further, maybe even to that remote place. The good thing is we've done this before. Learning to live off the planet Truthfully, the last time all living humans were present on the planet was over 22 years ago. The International Space Station has been continuously occupied, actually set up by Colonel Cabana, since November 2, 2000. In the past 22 years, we fostered a strong economy in low Earth orbit. We live in a world where NASA no longer bears the burden of holding up both sides of the supply and the demand equation. Our goal is that in the future, we can purchase services as one of many customers. We hope that we'll create a competitive environment, thus driving down costs, increasing innovative solutions, and adding to the knowledge we as humankind gain daily in space. To foster that strong low Earth orbit economy, NASA established the Commercial LEO Development Program, which will facilitate the development of commercially owned and operated LEO destinations that are safe, reliable, and cost effective. This program will allow NASA to maximize its resources towards missions beyond LEO, including the Moon and Mars, while still having the ability to use LEO for its ongoing needs. There are indications that industry is currently on track. Spaceports globally have been operational busier than ever before with launches. 
Building on the success of commercial cargo and crew partnerships, we're embracing and expanding commercialization, including hosting private astronaut missions. We're pleased to see the second Israeli astronaut, Eitan Stibbe, visit the space station and conduct many uh, scientific experiments for Israel and outreach with students as the first part of the first private astronaut mission to the space station, Axiom 1, in April 2022. Some of the technology we developed in LEO has reached a readiness level where we can buy these elements as a service to use at the moon. Spacesuits are a prime example of this. This past year, we awarded two vendors for space walking systems. These vendors can compete for tasks for both International Space Station missions and Artemis missions. We awarded the task for Artemis III moonwalking suits just this past fall. And just as we have done in LEO, as part of our Moon to Mars strategy, is proving business cases for various aspects of the campaign to help shape that new frontier. Developing market business cases create an environment where innovation and partnerships can continue to advance what is possible while garnering the support and advocacy for Moon and Mars explorations. However, to create that advocacy, keep Artemis alive, and maintain the momentum to send humans to Mars, we must focus on why we are going. We can build those rockets and rovers, habitats and spacecraft, but the de demand for knowledge must drive our engineering. We have so much to learn about our place in this solar system, more than we could ever hope to learn in just one generation. As a result, we must keep inspiring young people to enter careers in STEM and encourage them to stay thirsty for those new discoveries that will change how everyone on Earth perceives our place in the universe. We hope Artemis I did just that, because these young people are what will make Artemis possible. Returning to the moon under Artemis is one of the most challenging journeys humanity has ever embarked on. And Artemis I was the completion of step one. While we're celebrating a successful mission, we have much to look forward to when we fly crew on our next Artemis mission and then land on the surface after that. A momentous development is ahead of us. While there are no historical parallels to what we're doing, none rival the complexity of simultaneously building lunar, orbital, and surface infrastructures 250,000 miles from Earth with increasing government, international, and industry partners. We have our work truly cut out for us, but we know what it takes to build long-term sustainable presence. And I'm looking forward to the close collaboration that started before this, is enabled by this, and we have in the future with Israel and other countries. We are going, and our time is now. Thank you for letting me be here, and go Artemis. This insightful look into one of the most important and interesting projects of our time. And Mr. Free, may I ask, after you go camping on Mars, please call me when I can come glamping, okay? More into glamping than camping. Our conference will uh, consist of several panels, each focusing on important topics in the space industry. First, we'll be discussing how space policies can be leveraged to achieve national interests. To moderate this panel, I would like to invite to the stage Dr. Dganit Paikowski. Dr. Paikowski is an expert on international relations with a unique focus and first-hand experience on the interface between space and world politics. Dr. Paikowski holds a PhD in political science from Tel Aviv University. Currently, she lectures at the Department of International Relations at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and is a non-resident scholar at the Space Policy Institute at the Elliott School of Foreign Affairs, George Washington University. In October 2019, Dganit was appointed as Vice President of the International Astronautical Federation, the IAF, Advancing Diversity Initiatives and the New Space Economy, a role which she finished last year with great success. Ganit will introduce us to the distinguished panelists and call them up on stage. Ganit, please come to the stage. Okay, 
Good, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm delighted to open this special panel on leveraging space policies to achieve national interests. This morning's panel includes distinguished speakers representing diverse international perspectives overlooking their nation's space activities as both providers and as customers. But before I begin and call the speakers on stage, let me come back to the dilemma that we opened with last year's panel with, with those representatives of space agencies. And back then, I triggered them with the question, why, if at all, we still need space agencies? So today, we'll take that discussion one step forward, and we will emphasize the new roles that space agencies must take upon themselves to meet national objectives of economic prosperity and national security achieved from and through space. We could also identify the different perspectives on the challenges and opportunities toward reaching these objectives. So in this context, we will take this further and, take on, and hear from them on their different perspectives on how to leverage space policies and how policy affects national space ecosystems. Please welcome on stage astronaut Bob Cabana, NASA Associate Administrator. Doctor, yes, please. <laughs> Dr. Walter Peltzer, Director General of the Space Agency at DLR Germany. <laughs> My friend from the IAF Bureau, Mr. Giorgio Sacoccia, President of the Italian Space Agency. <laughs> also a friend from the Federation, and with deep appreciation, I welcome Mr. Dries El Hadani, Director of the Royal Center for Remote Sensing of Morocco. <laughs> Last but not least, of course, Uri Oron, Director of the Israel Space Agency. Please join us on stage. So we have a short time today, so if I read their bios, we, I will not have time to ask any questions. So with your permission, gentlemen, I will refer the audience, if you want to read the bios, check it on the website of the conference and, and we start our fun. Okay. So, um, the space economy had gone significant and marvelous changes in the last let's say even three decades, but mostly the, the last decade. Still, it is more than reasonable to say that we will experience even more dramatic and disruptive changes in the next few years. Uh, I will focus and say especially with commercial heavy lift coming soon. So I want to start with you, Bob and Walter, and ask you how will that change the space landscape? And what does that mean for policymakers? and the main stakeholders in the U.S. and in Germany? Well, having a commercial heavy lift capability, I think, is going to be key to our expansion beyond our home planet uh, when the time comes. Uh, we have a number of companies in the United States. Uh, right now, uh, the space launch system is a tremendous vehicle for what we're doing uh, in our Artemis program and our return to uh, the moon and eventually going on to Mars. Uh, but with uh, SpaceX developing a heavy lift capability, uh, not just to provide us with the uh, human landing system for Artemis, but for their uh, commercial operations with their satellite systems and everything that they want to do, uh, the new Glenn rocket will soon uh, be operational for uh, Blue Origin. And this opens up a, a whole world of possibilities. So I think, you know, we're not quite there on a, on a pure commercial market uh, for space exploration, but I believe that it is coming. Uh, Walter? 
Yes, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for having me and congratulations to our Israel and friends for organizing this event. Uh, it's really, really a pleasure to be here and congratulations. Yeah, I only can underline what Bob already mentioned. Um, going a little bit more into the direction of commercialization, um, the launch services uh, he mentioned, going, the cost going down for launch services is actually the key. So this is the key open up um, more business cases to become profitable. And um, I think the next stage we will see is not in exploration, of course, it's in low Earth orbit. And uh, the, um, I think we will see some kind of breakthrough when not space companies and space businesses will enter the space business. I think the next stage will be when companies which are actually not providing some products to customers which coming from base, not even downstream business. But if these companies recognize that space can contribute to their products and add value, then this will just boost the whole market. So I think from this stage, and I think we are at the border, that a lot of companies which have nothing to do with space yet will recognize that space can contribute to their products and they have now in their strategy to watch space and space-based services to include into their product. So that even customers have no clue that actually space is involved, but they have now space on their watch and this will boost, from my point of view, the space business. Thank you, and you, and you point to the, where we focus now, many space agencies focus on how do you develop and how do you sustain an ecosystem. And, and with that, I wanna ask also Giorgio and Dries and Uri to join the, the conversation and say that at this age of ecosystems, eventually most countries cannot take upon and develop a whole of a national ecosystem, and they have to pick the niche areas um, and, and focus on that. So first you have to identify that, and you, then you have to build on those niches. So what, in your opinion, are your country's niche areas, and where do you as leaders of your agencies put the focus when you try to take your responsibilities and develop these niche areas? Thank you, Dagny. Um, well, I fully agree with you, first of all, that uh, uh, in a global endeavor for space activities, every contribution from every single country is important. Uh, it is absolutely essential that every country will find their own, um, how can I say, um, easiness in, in, in accessing space activities and contribute to a global endeavor. Of course, there are countries that have a, a bit more history on their behind them and can afford, say, uh, in terms of uh, resources, policy, and, 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 uh, and uh, competence uh, to work on different fields or even all sectors. There are, there are a few countries that are capable to do that. For example, in Italy, we are lucky enough to operate in almost every sector of, of application of space activities. Uh, of course, depending on the, on the moment, depending on the, on the emphasis that is put in the specific historical moment of space activities, we can uh, uh, invest more or less in some of those areas. But once you have started working and operating in every field, I think it's difficult to step back. Um, recently, certainly in, um, in Italy, we are investing and uh, concentrating a lot in, uh, in the exploration, of course, and there we are great partners of the Artemis program. We uh, want to do um, even more of what, have done, of what you have done so far in the, in the field of uh, Earth observation, because Earth observation is really maybe the most important contribution that uh, space activists can give to, to the future of Earth. And, uh, of course, we invest in space transportation, the new uh, opportunities offered by the uh, integrated application of, of uh, what communication offers for, uh, from, from space and so on. It's, uh, it's really a, a privileged, say, uh, position we have. Uh, but as I said, it's essential really that every country finds its own way to contribute to something where they really believe they have an opportunity because the return is incredible. 
Thank you. Dries, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel and giving me this opportunity to participate to this very interesting and rich debate. And I would like also to congratulate our colleagues from the Israeli Space Agency for this uh, very successful conference. Um, as you may know, uh, Morocco is a very emerging country in space and uh, we have been uh, working on the uses of space technologies and uh, space remote sensing for several years. And to answer directly your two uh, questions, the first one is that uh, our main focus for the moment is on Earth observation as a strategic and uh, uh, productive sector that could contribute to the socioeconomic development of our country and our region. This is, I think, one of the most important elements. The second element and the niches that we are interested in is to develop all the activities and services around the downstream, which is really important. And uh, beside this, just to give an example, Morocco has developed two main sectors in industry. The first one is the automobile, in cooperation with uh, very big um, companies. And the second was is uh, uh, aeronautics in Casablanca is one of the hubs in the moment, providing services, industry, activities to main companies in the world as Boeing, as, as uh, Airbus, etc. And our hope and our objective, strategic objective, is to develop an uh, ecosystem like this one for space activities. As far as it, it regards our uh, responsibilities as agency to develop this sector, I think we can uh, stress two or three points that are important. First of all is to prepare uh, sort of the um, uh, legal framework, strategic framework, incitative investment framework to, uh, to the development of such activities. As you may know that space industry or space activities are uh, demanding a lot of investment, a lot of efforts, and uh, this is one of the, the, the responsibilities is to prepare and to create a positive and incitative uh, uh, elements to, to, to draw these this, this activities and to be open to cooperation with others. This is the second. Cooperation is one of the most important elements in this, in this responsibilities and these strategies. And we are trying to develop this cooperation with all over the world with different kind of, of actors, space agencies, uh, United Nations uh, entities, industries, etc. And uh, and this third element in this uh, responsibilities and strategy is the development of indigenous uh, capacities. Uh, I think it's very important to have enough resources, human resources, well-trained, well-developed, to be able to contribute to the emergency, in emergency of this, uh, or the, this, this kind of activities, kind of industry. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks very much to you, Ganit. Uh, I will uh, come back to your questions shortly, but uh, I would like to welcome uh, a new friend uh, to here. And just imagine a stage with Her, Her Excellency Sarah El Amiri. Uh, congratulate us. And a stage with a Moroccan friend. That is the new space. The fact that we can sit here together, discuss so-called very relevant issues together, it means we are, we are moving forward. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Going back to the niche question. Uh, uh, first of all, I totally agree with the concept that we need to focus on niche areas, especially to countries with a limited uh, uh, budget. Uh, but it's gonna be a little bit more complex than that because realizing and finding those niche, uh, it's gonna be complicated because the world is changing. What we need to do is, is almost like a process of identifying what is changing and what is the strengths of your nation and where it's combined, it's an, it's an ongoing change. I'll just highlight two examples, okay? An, an area that I think Israel could be very relevant and very strong is what we call downstream application. Yes, we know how to do things with data. It's in the, it's in the Israeli uh, uh, initiatives uh, that we know how to do it. So that's a niche area, but it shouldn't be the only one. 
we should find other places with the upstream. For example, dealing with a low, low, low Earth orbit uh, um, go, um, uh, uh, constellations could be a very relevant to Israel. But let's highlight another question. What is the area that Israel needs to be focused on Artemis? Okay, we are not going to compete with SpaceX. We are probably not going to build the next lander, but we could be very relevant player in Artemis. So what we need to find is those areas that we are strong enough, we feel comfortable on our readiness, and then push it forward. And then came the next question, okay, so what is the role of the government? Because right now, space is still difficult. Space still needs the involvement of countries and governments. So the, the answer in the question of the niche area is much more complicated than just identified one or two or three areas, but it's an ongoing process that all of us must do all the time. Thank you, Uri, and keep the mic. Uh, I'll ask you the next question because it relates to what you just said, and I will ask also Walter and Bob to address the same question uh, after Uri. Um, so you've identified the niche area, let's, let's assume that. Uh, and now you take your responsibility as an agency and you start taking actions. So there are several practices that usually space agencies take. It's international collaborations, it's national, national collaboration and international collaboration efforts, regulation, um, sponsoring for research and development, and etc. What are the best practices that you've identified uh, that are the most fruitful? Great question, uh, not an easy one to answer actually, uh, but I think uh, I will highlight two. The first one is building alliance, building cooperations. Now, uh, it could be in the States, but it must be in with other players around us. And again, I will highlight the UAE, but not the, on, not, not the only one. What we need to do is to build those kinds of alliance, alliances or build those kinds of cooperations uh, and partnerships, because this practice works. Uh, we have, I mean, we have our, uh, our experience with CNES building the Venus satellites. We have experience with NASA, of course. We have our experience in DLR, and we are working to do that with, with the, the Italian as well. So, and, and that's a very good practice, because again, space is sometimes difficult. We need to do, this to, we need to do it together. So this is the first thing. The second is to be able to generate awareness on the public and for the, for the decision makers to the importance of space. Now that's not an easy task, but once we'll do that, or once you'll be able to do it and generate the awareness and the importance to space for, for a modern, modern uh, country or modern uh, uh, economy, then basically that's what opens the door for, for the rest of the things. So, and how you do it, that's uh, for, a longer, uh, for a longer session, but try to focus on cooperations and building alliance and bring the decision makers to understand the importance of space, not just for the benefit of education, but also for us being able to operate in the 21st century. Thank you, Uri. I was gonna grab another one there. I guess I'll go before you, Walter. Um, so for, on the niche question, you know, going back to, I, I just want to talk, yeah, but I'm, I think what I wanted to say was, you know, as we explore beyond our home planet, it, it's no longer the responsibility for any one nation. It's too expensive for any one nation. These partnerships that we have, I think, are critical to our success, and everybody has a role to play. When we go beyond planet Earth, we should go as the people of planet Earth as we explore together. Uh, when I look at best practices, I look at the International Space Station. When I look at what we have accomplished working together, you know, the last 22 years, the partnerships that we put in place, the agreements for the crew code of conduct and so on, those are best practices. I mean, we've got United States, Canada, Japan, Russia, the European Space Agency and all its partners, and, and we work together as one in spite of all the differences that we have here on Earth. Together on orbit, we've been working together as one. I had somebody tell me one time, we should take uh, world leaders and stick them up on the space station. They'd have to learn how to work together. You know, and it's, uh, I think the agreements that we put in place, the Artemis Accords as we move forward, these are key things that our space agencies can work together on to set a path for us 
uh, as we work to explore. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I think the space station is a role model, and I like the idea to put all the political leader over there together too, so that they can learn to, to work together. Coming back to the question actually about best practices, and I would like to combine it with your question about niche, mar niche yes. mar markets, sorry. Uh, because I don't think that's about a niche, it's more about excellence, actually. Okay. Um, and there's no system or no instrument which fits all. Of course, if you want to do big great things like Artemis, ISS, or like JUICE we do together with, with our Australian partners, um, then you have to, to go as a team. Um, I think uh, it was uh, Bridenstine who mentioned, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go in a team or in a partnership. Um, but if you want to create for something you can add into a partnership. If you want to create something which actually adds value to something, sometimes you have to very, very, uh, on, a, on a federal or national level, you do have to develop technologies. For example, we develop laser communication terminals, uh, which is, from our point of view, cutting edge technologies. And we supply it even to, to our US partners because this is, um, value add even, even for, for NASA and our US partner. If we want to do, as I mentioned, um, uh, a project within, within um, the ESA, for example, our, our science uh, projects like JUICE with, with other partners like Israel, then we go in a team. So you can't pick one instrument. You have to choose, okay, what do we want to achieve? If you want to achieve cutting edge technologies, you have to be very focused on something. You can actually develop and then put into a partnership. Gen, just being, being a partner, this is not value add. You are not a, a, a partner, a well recommended uh, partner if you do everything on a mediocre level. You have to add value. And so you have to, to pick your instrument whether you want to develop cutting edge. And if you are adding value to a team, then you are part of a team. And then you can start with something great like Artemis. Thank you. And with that, I'll go to Giorgio and Dries. Um, continuing from where Walter just stopped and ended, how do you leverage partnerships, uh, international partnerships, from your perspective, either as a leader or as a partner, what is the great benefit for you? Well, uh, space is, um, I think space get its best uh, out of, uh, out of uh, international collaboration. This is, goes without saying, this is why after uh, an important um, uh, phase of uh, initial phase of great space activities uh, performed as, uh, as individual countries. Today we seek for international collaboration because then the return is, uh, is much higher in my opinion. There is first of all um, a, um, a larger uh, buy-in by, by all, the, all the citizens that, uh, that uh, are eventually supposed to contribute to, to space activities. But also um, each country can uh, perceive differently the return the space gives to, to everyday society. Um, as, as I mentioned also in my previous uh, intervention, of course, uh, we can uh, benefit at best from the synergy between the competences that is spread over different, uh, different countries. So um, there, there, is, there is no doubt that really um, uh, international partnership, partnership with other countries on space programs Gives, uh, gives a high return. And then last but not least, my experience, our experience in Italy is that space is an incredible instrument of, uh, of diplomacy, international diplomacy. Um, I, I, I have experienced myself a number of, uh, of situations where uh, we have signed uh, agreements on, uh, for space activities uh, with other countries uh, for different reasons. Sometimes because there was really an important benefit and return for the space project we wanted to do together. In some cases, it was more from our side offering to other countries our competence because this was tight, tightening the, the, um, uh, 
the relation between the two countries and the benefit for, 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 for Italy was coming maybe in other areas. Or simply there was really a strong and sincere intention to grow together. It's fantastic. Space is an incredible ambassador for friendship among countries. Thank you. Uh, by definition, uh, I think space is, uh, is cooperation. And from the beginning of the space era 60 years ago, all the important uh, achievement in space was or were built on, on cooperation between countries, between agencies, between different kind of actors. Um, as far as it's concerned, uh, our country or our region, I think that uh, all we have been achieving in space in, in Morocco, for example, or in the region, was built on cooperation, uh, either on bilateral uh, agreements with the CNES, for example, in France, with uh, Israel in India, with NASA many years ago, we have been signing four cooperation agreements on oceanography, on space, on climate change, etc. And this uh, kind of cooperation is a gateway for us to have access to knowledge, to have access to technicity, to have access to uh, a network of uh, different actors that uh, enable us to, 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 to access those, 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 those needs and those uh, specific areas of, of cooperation. Um, uh, I think for the moment in our region, in Africa and Middle East, we are now starting, I think, a new era of cooperation. And, uh, as far as we are facing similar problems in terms of, of uh, science, technology, and also in terms of applications or uses like uh, mitigation of uh, climate change, for example, water resource management, uh, oceanography, and others. Uh, this, this international cooperation, uh, as I said, is, is very, very important. It's a pillar of our activity, of our, our act, uh, 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 projects and our strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to ask all, all of you, all my distinguished speakers here today, space is hard. It's very hard. Space policy in talking to decision makers is even in harder and communicating to the public is also difficult at points. Um, so I want to, and, and there is an expression in Hebrew, I don't, I hope I translate it uh, well enough. When you share, problems that we share are less painful. So let me ask you, what are the problems that we probably share when, in space agencies when you do space policy and when you try to actually implement your policies, other than just you know, referring to lack of funding, insufficient sponsorship, what do you experience day to day as your most challenging issues? And if you give, give examples and maybe how you solve that. Okay, I can start maybe. Well, first of all, let me say, uh, despite of what, I mean, what we, we, we would like to, space activities are not simple. Space, are, space is a difficult business. We, in space activities, we push the boundaries always of technology, of science, of research. And this means, of course, facing situations which are unknown sometimes, uh, that we need to intervene, correct, etc. Uh, the history of space project is full of situations where we had to uh, stop, think, correct, maybe delay with respect to expectation. And this, these are things that we as agencies, as industry, we face every day. That's why, by the way, going back to your question when we're still uh, in the audience, um, is uh, I think we need, we need all the players. We need agency, we need the industry, etc. So th this, are, this is certainly a type of challenge that we, we, we face continuously. We keep on facing until space will remain at the front line of innovation. And then uh, space is also a subject which is incredibly subject to it's a multidisciplinary, multidimensional uh, field, so it's subject to uh, whatever. I mean, first of all, geopolitical situation, what we are facing today in terms of consequences of the, of the crisis, uh, geopolitical crisis we have, is impacting directly uh, space activities, some projects we, everywhere in, in Europe, elsewhere. 
that uh, depends on uh, uh, broken uh, collaboration, uh, depends on uh, a lack of uh, supply of uh, materials, components. So all those things need to be addressed continuously by the policy makers and solution needs to be seek and found in isolation or better in, co in cooperation. So, Giorgio gave a great toast last night for those that weren't there. Space is hard, but, um, you know, we're all very uh, proud to be a part of it. I mean, it, it, it's our passion uh, doing these hard things. I think, you know, we all have similar problems. There, there's a down-to-earth, you know, delivering a quality product on time within budget is always a challenge. I think right now coming out of the pandemic, a problem we all share is the supply chain and the quality of some of the parts that we're getting and the availability of raw materials to be able to deliver. Uh, those are all really mundane things. I think one of the hardest problems that we have to tackle, and I, I alluded to it in my opening remarks, it's the culture that we uh, create the ability to ensure that you know we learn from our mistakes that we create an environment where we can actually move forward and progress and uh, and keep going and I, I think that that to me it, there's anybody can deal with money and deal with technical I love technical problems because I can fix those it, it's the cultural the people problems that present the most challenge uh, and I think we're all blessed to have very motivated, talented workforce. Uh, we draw from the best in all our countries to be part of what we do. And uh, I think ensuring that we continue to do that is always going to be a, a, a challenge for us. So yeah, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but it's, it's more the, I think the, the people side of it presents bigger challenges sometimes. And then, of course, Dealing with our governments, you know, our, at home, we have to make them happy too. We execute what we have been tasked to go do, and that presents its own challenges. So I think all of us share the same problems, okay? And, it, and I think, uh, obviously, when we work together, it makes it uh, a, a lot easier. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sitting be here between Giorgio and Bob, uh, and they actually showed the whole range, uh, so coming from political level to supply chain. But this is exactly what we face <laughs> actually daily, on a daily level, depending on the project we are um, sitting at. So political instability is something which causes question from the decision makers whether it's good to work with them together on what we should do and how we should uh, approach something. And um, of course, your supply chain yeah, the pandemic was mentioned, but also if companies come up with a little bit enthusiastic uh, evaluation of the technology readiness level when they supply something, uh, sometimes there's a little bit more wish than really concrete knowledge and capabilities when they come up with numbers. So it's a wide, wide range. And I would like to add once one topic, um, the, the people stuff. We work with wonderful people together but we get less and less. We are, we are fighting with talents and we have um, excellent and uh, hard competitors, automotive industry, um, airplane industry, and, uh, and a lot of other industries um, coming up with, with a lot of money, with uh, great projects as well. Uh, change or energy, for example, the, the, to move energy system from fossil to renewable energy is, is something which um, is attractive for a lot of talents. So uh, we are fighting for talents, at least in, in Germany, you are fighting for talents. And uh, sometimes the lack of talents jeopardizes uh, projects we want to put into practice. So it's down to earth technical issues, it's political issues and people issues. So it's not going to be boring. One more quick, I just got to add. So in spite of all the challenges, I, uh, we rise to the occasion. We meet the challenges, we rise to the occasion, and we accomplish some amazing things working together. Look at Artemis. In spite of all the challenges, this, all of us working together accomplish amazing things. And I think that's, that's what space does. That, that's absolutely awesome. Okay, 
Um, my colleague from Italy started his answer by saying that space is very complex. And I like to imagine what is the case for an emerging country in this case. It's more, it's more than complex. And I think we are facing at least three main uh, challenges. The first one is the uh, political awareness of the importance of space. Second one is the um, strong and the powerful R&D system that could bring us support to this, to this industry or to this activity. And third one is the implication or the contribution of industry, private industry to these activities. Let us back to the first one, which is awareness and political support from, from, from uh, decision makers in the country. I think this is a very, very important challenge mainly in developing countries to explain what are the challenges of space, the importance of space, what we can gain from space, developing the industry, developing the, application, the applications. And uh, uh, thanks to God, in our country, we have a very high level of awareness from different kind of, of actors from the top of the country on this, in this field. And we have been uh, developing the activity progressively uh, despite the uh, limited resources, uh, financial resources, but we are going step by step trying to develop this activity and to be one of the actors in, the, in this field. Uh, as far as it concerns the uh, research and development ecosystem, <coughs> uh, I think uh, on this, in this issue there is a, uh, a very big challenge to uh, bring all the universities, laboratories, actors that are interested in space to build programs to develop uh, capacities in this field. And we are facing one of the challenges that was cited by my colleague from, from Germany with the talents. And uh, uh, we are struggling to develop talents and we are also struggling to keep these talents in the country as far as they are, um, let's say, uh, drained by other countries and other, other industries in, in the world. And uh, finally, uh, industry or private actor is one of the most important um, components of development of space activities. And uh, this challenge is not easy to, 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 to tackle. But I think one of the, uh, the approaches that was developed is to build a private-public partnership in this field so we can uh, uh, bring uh, different actors either from the country or from the, uh, the, the outside of the country to, to invest in this field and to develop the activity. Last but not least, I think one of the challenges that we, we are facing is the development of uh, regional cooperation in this field. And uh, I'd just like to stress what has been said by my, my friend from the uh, Israeli Space Agency. We are now starting a new era in the region cooperation with uh, countries in the, the Middle East over this. And I think we have a lot of common uh, issues, common concerns that we can tackle together. And developing cooperation in this area is very important for us, as is one of the challenges that we, we, we are trying to, 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 to face and to solve. Thank you. Um, thank you. I actually agree with, with many of the things. What I would like to add is another uh, like Walter says, I will add another uh, challenge. Um, now, we say that in space, if you want to reach places, you need to move fast. Uh, and one of the challenges that I see is our ability to adjust, to adjust ourselves and to change. Now, uh, I can see it internally. I can see it, I can see it when we talk to the old space community. I see it when I'm speaking to others to adjust, to realize the change, and to be able to react on the right time, it's a big challenge. Now, it's, it's even more difficult because you not really know what is true. For example, I will just highlight a question. How the hell do you make money, real money, in space? It's not, it's not obvious right now. It will happen, and, and that's challenging. But you need to start walking in order to be in that place. So how you adjust yourself to the right spot at the right time, that's challenging. And I think in that regard, and that goes back, I think in that regard, we can cooperate. At least we can talk about the challenges, about the way we adjust ourselves to the new 
era or to the new, uh, to the new things that are happening to the new trends, and then maybe we can identify what are the right tracks. Do it on your niche area or do it together. But uh, one ch one, another challenge is we need to adjust and we need to do it fast. As we get to the end of this session, and before I thank you, we can uh, say that we've achieved several accomplishments in this panel. First of all, we have some practical things that we want to implement. Okay, first is put together a mission to space of only politicians. <laughs> and then we also want to put together a support group for heads of space agencies, because I think that was very helpful for all of you to share your, uh, your problems together. So please help me with thanking this esteemed panel. And I think now we go for a break. 15 minutes break, I think. Enjoy your coffee outside and thank you for joining us this morning. To see you all back here and I hope you had a fruitful break. AXA Mission One or X1 was the first privately funded and operated crewed mission to the International Space Station. The flight launched on April 8, 2022 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're getting our first look at the Axiom One crew as they exit. And the amount of work that each of these crew members have done to prepare for this mission has been outstanding. 700 to 1,000 hours of training. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. It's incredible to think that so many of these new studies are being given time on station because of the efforts of this crew and Axiom Space and signifying the key message of this particular mission, international cooperation and collaboration. What an amazing, incredible, eye-opening in so many ways that I think will have such a lasting impact. Fortunately, we were able to accomplish our objectives and hopefully it'll lead to some great groundbreaking research. There they are. Incredible. The crew consisted of American astronauts Michael Lopez Alegria and Larry Conner, Ethan Stebe from Israel, and Mark Pathy from Canada. Our next, our next panel is called The Vast Impact of the Privatization of Human Space Flights the first ever commercial crew to the ISS will share their experience about the mission's preparations, successes, and the challenges overcome. I'd like to call to the stage U.S. astronaut Garrett Reisman, who will moderate the panel, and with him, the team of X1, Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Ethan Stebe, and Mark Pathy. Thank you. So I had the amazing good fortune of being present in Florida at the Cape when we launched back in April the first fully private mission to the International Space Station with these guys. <laughs> and, and when you're standing there watching this, um, you really got the impression that you're witnessing with your own eyes a really true historic, historical moment where things were changing and you're getting a glimpse into the future of what might be happening in human spaceflight, and I was honored to be there. Uh, I'd like to start out with you, uh, Eitan, because, uh, you know, home field advantage and whatnot. Um, earlier we heard a lot uh, about the, the mission of Ilan Ramon, and I know you were, you were friends with Ilan, and, uh, and you watched step by step as he prepared for his journey to become the first Israeli astronaut. How did that affect your preparations for your mission? What did you do the same that he did, uh, by example, and what maybe you did differently? 
So Elon was a good friend and I was fortunate to visit him during his training and stay at their home, so experience the whole training process at NASA, Building 9 and others, and how the family is getting organized for such a mission. Elon had uh, three years of preparation to the, for the, his mission and slowly he absorbed the magnitude and the impact that the mission would have on uh, the Isra Israel, Israeli public, Jewish people around the world. And he started really uh, with friends in Canada and the US understanding and, and dealing with that. His mission was fully de designed by the Israeli uh, Space Agency and by, the, by uh, the Israeli Air Force, while our mission was completely uh, uh, planned for training us as astronauts at NASA and SpaceX, but nothing else. So all the rest of the content was our mission. We had to plan, all the four of us, what are we going to do there for 10 days? And for that, we uh, created with the Ramon Foundation an entity called Rakia, and Rakia created an open source call for proposals to collect ideas from the public, from children to professors, and build, assemble a full uh, um, mission. That's great. Uh, so, uh, Mike, I'd like to turn to you next. It says here that you are the commander of this flight. Uh, who elected you leader of this outfit? <laughs> Shalom, everybody. Um, you know, it's a funny story. I left NASA 2012 and I was finished flying. I had flown four times. I was quite happy to go and take on a new challenge. Um, and that challenge was to run a, an advocacy organization in Washington um, for, on behalf of commercial human spaceflight. I did that for a while, became a consultant. One of my clients was this company called Axiom Space, brand new in 2016. And I finally felt qualified to be uh, employed by one of my clients because we were going to build a space station. And I knew something about space stations, and I didn't have to go lobby people on Capitol Hill, and that was uh, much more appealing to me. So we began this journey together, and along the way, we decided we would do what we called precursor missions to the ISS. So the overall plan is to attach modules to the front of the ISS that will one day separate and become an independent, privately owned commercial space station. But these precursor missions would go to the existing ISS, and uh, we would find customers from private astronauts to other governments, governments that to date don't have access to the ISS, meaning they're outside the five agency partnership. And uh, when we started looking for clients, um, they expressed an interest that they didn't they wanted somebody along who had been there before. And NASA sort of said the same thing. And when we looked around the room, I was the only one that fit that description. That's how it happened. <laughs> OK. Um, so you know, you mentioned Rakia. And, and the uh, work that all of you did up on, the, on this mission was really profound, uh, equal to or exceeding, I think, the workload of a typical uh, NASA astronaut as far as the scientific and educational outreach uh, I understand that, uh, that there were 322 scientific researchers that participated, over 165,000 students, is that right? Yep. 80 artists. Um, so my question for, for you guys um, is why? Uh, you know, you didn't have to do that, right? Uh, this was a private mission. It was your option to decide what to do, as you pointed out, with uh, the mission content. Um, you, you made this tremendous effort to do this. What, what was your thinking? So before I answer that, uh, I did try to be commander, <laughs> but quickly was told that was a no-go. And by the way, Mike's experience and knowledge and, and leadership was uh, invaluable. So I think I speak for all of us. It's interesting, we didn't know each other. So we all came together and we had a common thread. And that was, we wanted to do serious training to the NASA standards. We wanted to do serious research. And we wanted to have serious outcomes. And I think we accomplished all those. And by the way, it was not lost on us 
that we were the first, so we really had to get it, uh, get it right. And yeah, it was amazing the amount of research we did during the period of time. Quite frankly, our original mission was 10 days. Fortunately, we had some weather problems. Turned out to be 17 days. We would not have accomplished everything we uh, planned to do had we not had that, uh, that extension. And even during that period of time, it was not unusual for us to get up at five, six o'clock in the morning, start working at seven, and not end until eight or nine o'clock at night. One other uh, item I think that's worthy of note was that uh, we had great relationships and great assistance from the NASA Crew 3, who were not required to do it, but gave of their own time and effort and expertise to help us uh, accomplish it. So final thought would be is that it is an international space station and that everybody there, whether they're Russians, uh, European Space Station Agency, et cetera, uh, all work together and that was really beneficial for our mission. Great, so I, I'd like to direct a question for um, LA as the commander and um, Larry as the pilot and talk a little bit about the getting to and from uh, in Dragon. So it's a different vehicle. I mean, if from, coming from a traditional NASA background where you were trained to fly in shuttles, Soyuz, uh, there's a lot more automation in Dragon, uh, and, and Larry, from your uh, standpoint of uh, flying airplanes, racing cars, and from your operational background, how would you assess the training that was required to be the pilot and the commander, and, and how is it different? How, what, is the, what is the right stuff today for, for astronauts with modern uh, vehicles? It's a great question. I, I mean, first of all, the vehicle is very automated, as you know, and um, it probably would be more automated had NASA not insisted on some manual capabilities. And we insisted with SpaceX that we be trained similarly to uh, a NASA astronaut crew, and they graciously decided to do that. That said, on a nominal mission, I don't remember the number, Larry, but if everything goes according to plan, there is some very small double-digit number of commands that a crew has to send, which is extraordinarily disappointing because you want to have your hands on the controls. However, I think what it does is it is a, a symbolic of how in the future this automation is going to help crews be more specialized. So instead of having to fly the spaceship and take care of the space station as, a, as an operator, they will be more free to specialize in educational outreach or fluid physics or combustion science or whatever their expertise has to be. And I think this is a, a step in that direction. It's tough for pilots to swallow that, but it's probably the right thing to do. So uh, two thoughts. Uh, when Mike and I started training, obviously Mike had a bit of experience. I did not, and of course they're used to training professional astronauts, people who are scientists, engineers, medical. I am none of the above. So I was really in, as they would call it, the deep end of the pool and drinking from a fire hose. But because of Mike, the people at SpaceX, NASA, we were able to come up to speed. And I think it was good that, I mean, it was rigorous training. And even though we recognized we weren't going to do much piloting, we still got trained. And I'll, I, if I may, I'll give you one real short story, which I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say, but we're all friends here. I'm sure this is not being recorded, so it won't be a problem. So as we started to our approach to the ISS, we had a communication problem. And with Mike's uh, uh, headset, and so uh, as we started to head toward uh, first waypoint, uh, we had to switch communication where I started doing it. And it was completely seamless, at least from my point of view, it was completely seamless. And apparently afterwards it worked out pretty well. Well, the point is, have we not had great training at NASA, at SpaceX, with Mike's leadership, that wouldn't have gone as smoothly. 
May I add something and complain to you, Garrett? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this beautiful uh, designed by Marvel spacesuit of SpaceX, white with a helmet connected, is actually very difficult to take off and take on and put on a Don and Doff, they call it, because the zipper is from just on the bottom part. So you have to dive in, the helmet is connected, and that's your fault, right? <laughs> Yeah, I had something to do with that, but uh, it looks good though, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, M Mark, I want to bring you in on this, uh, uh, in this conversation. So I want to have a question for you, which is, um, the, the solar wind, are you pro or con? And please elaborate on your answer. Uh, yeah, thanks, Garrett. I wasn't actually expecting a question. I was just supposed to be the eye candy up here. but. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I see we only have another 21 and a half minutes left, so I'm not <laughs> sure I can really get into detail on the effects of solar wind on our mission. But <laughs> yes, actually instead, maybe, maybe you would like to tell us a little bit about the, the research program you had during the flight. Uh, yeah, sure. I had uh, a, a number of uh, research projects that spanned across uh, health sciences, uh, technology demonstrations, educational outreach, and uh, environmental photography. Um, and, uh, but I think probably the parts that I enjoyed most were the, actually the educational outreach sessions. Um, that frankly made me feel connected to Earth uh, in a way that uh, you know, we didn't necessarily experience uh, otherwise doing some of the other uh, tasks. Uh, we also had a great opportunity, Eitan and I, to do a uh, shared outreach session uh, simultaneously with a Canadian and Israeli school, um, which I think was, was great, not just for us, but I think uh, connected uh, the students in both countries in a way uh, that maybe uh, they didn't expect. Um, so I think, uh, you know, as, as Larry mentioned, I think it was important to all of us um, that uh, we had the opportunity to, to select research and, and to bring it up with us. Uh, for me, uh, I would say that that aspect of, of this mission, that opportunity, was what convinced me in, in the value of doing it. Um, and uh, so uh, it, it was great for me to be able to connect with the Canadian Space Agency um, and with uh, some of the hospitals and, and other educational institutions that I'm involved with uh, back home to put together a great uh, suite of research um, and uh, to be able to complete that on, on board. I wanted to ask you a question. You, you were not satisfied with 11 guys on board and you brought on with holograms some other guys. How did you do that? Yeah, that's right, actually. At, uh, one of the uh, technology demonstrations that I completed was uh, the uh, first ever two-way holoportation. Uh, uh, Crew 2 had completed the uh, one-way holoportation and uh, things had evolved uh, sufficiently to the point that uh, when I w was on board the station, we were able to, to do a complete two-way holoportation. So that was with an augmented uh, reality lens. And I was able then to connect with people uh, down at uh, Johnson Space Center. And to me, it appeared as if those people were right there uh, in the space station with me, and obviously in holographic form. And, uh, and they could see me down in, uh, in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, room down at Johnson Space Center. Um, it was very, very cool technology. It was real kind of Star Trek type stuff. Uh, but it has really great uh, implications um, for both uh, space travel and uh, the communication and, uh, and task completion uh, up on the space station as we travel deeper into space, but also in terms of combating uh, the inevitable sense of isolation that astronauts feel uh, during uh, long duration spaceflight. Uh, and of course, as with so many, uh, uh, as, as with so many technologies and, and innovations that are designed uh, to en enable uh, space travel and to, to make it more, uh, more bearable and more uh, efficient, it also, of course, has great advantages for life here on Earth. And in the case of the uh, two-way hull importation, that would be in the form primarily of, say, telemedicine, uh, which is uh, increasingly uh, effective in terms of uh, treating people here on Earth in, in remote places. Cool. So, uh, as we mentioned several times, this was the first private mission to the ISS, and it's not always easy to be first. Um, and in this case, you had to get a lot of different organizations to work together and coordinate. So, of course, you had Axiom, 
but you also had, uh, as we always do with the space station, you have NASA, you have the international partners, Roscosmos, ESA, JAXA, um, and so forth and so on. Plus, you had SpaceX as the provider, getting all these groups to work together for the first time in a context that was really completely new. How did that work out? Do you think it's going to be easier next time? Um, and is there any good lessons learned about the things you would do differently or things that worked really well the first time? Well, certainly what you say is absolutely true. Um, it was a slog. I mean, it was a tough uh, sledding for a lot of it, and I think we just got there by sheer will. And of course, it'll be easier the second time. We learned a lot, um, both within Axiom, I think certainly NASA and SpaceX, our, co our cooperation has evolved into something better. So AX2, which will launch um, in the month of May, is, is reaping the benefits from that. Um, specifically, we've kind of um, de-densified the timeline to give people a little bit more of a realistic uh, pace uh, we have improved the training greatly to not spend time on things that are really unnecessary for private astronauts and spend more time doing things, uh, working with the operations product, so the timeline uh, procedures, et cetera. So absolutely, and I would say that if there's an AX3 and an AX4, that they'll be better than AX2. I mean, it's logical, right? I'd like to add to that. Um, from my experience as a pilot, uh, it's very important to have someone to lean on, especially if you're in a one-seater jet plane, and that is usually the ground controller. So for me, I knew that when I was working as the uh, uh, delegate of a scientist on anything in a glove box or on uh, biolo biological uh, experiments, with a headset and someone from mission control or from Huntsville, from PACOM, in my ear, I knew that the person I am going to rely on is the person that I, is nearest to my brain, so in my ear. So we really uh, created a great cooperation with the team of NASA in Huntsville because they were the guys guiding us and uh, the liaison between us and the scientists on ground. So you guys obviously gelled together as a crew very, very well and are very, very closely knit. How, what do you attribute that to? I know you did a Knowles trip early on in the training. Was it that? Was it, um, what, what, what was it that did the trick? Well, I think it started with that wonderful Knowles trip. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, 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 so Knowles is... Uh, an opportunity, at least that's what they told us, to bond together, go to Alaska, to go very, very remote, where literally a bush plane flies onto a plateau, drops us, our gear, and a couple guides, and said, see you in a week, which at that point I knew might not be good. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be more of bonding through adversity. Mm -hmm. And so, in my humble opinion, it was a fairly miserable experience. <laughs> but, in the end, it was very, very valuable. And because of all that, we really, really connected as a team. And I couldn't believe it afterwards. I'm still not sure I believe it, and said to Axiom and NASA and SpaceX, hey, look, it's absolutely something that all of the uh, private uh, astronaut missions should do. So that was really the lead-in. There were lots of other things after that, but I think that was the catalyst. I will add that uh, the insistence of SpaceX, for example, to do more and more training in the capsule, in the simulator, in this very tight, it's narrower than the uh, distance between us, um, donning and doffing the suits and uh, emergency cases and everything for hours and hours. We didn't always understand the value of that, but eventually when we needed to help each other in the, in the capsule on the way up, on the way down, it was essential. One last thing to add to that. Um, 
you know, we didn't know each other from Adam when this whole thing started, obviously. And when um, a private astronaut comes to Axum and says, I'd like to fly in space, <clears throat> we really don't want to say no. Um, and we started training together, and we could have got any kind of crew. I mean, it could have been a total disaster. It turns out it wasn't. Um, I, and Garrett, you know, you and I never flew together, but we spent some quality time in Star City outside of Moscow and underwater training for spacewalks. And beyond the amazing experience that it is to see the planet and float weightlessly and experience the acceleration of launch, something that we don't talk too much about is the bond that you form with the crews, with the people that you train with and fly with. And I'll tell you that these, these are my family now. It's, it's really... It's something that I kind of knew could happen because it's happened with other crews in the past, but I wasn't expecting it with these guys. That's fantastic. And I think that it's, um, you know, it's becoming a common refrain. I think we've, we've seen it with other private missions, the Inspiration4 mission that NASA did, for, I mean, SpaceX did, for example. Um, the this, this sense that, uh, and I know from my personal experience, uh, the experiences I had on space flights are secondary compared to the importance of the people I did it with and the bonding that you get. And you don't get that if you, if the original model of private space flight that my old boss Elon uh, uh, had in mind was you show up at the door, you, you show your boarding pass and you get on, right? And I don't think that's gonna work. I, I, I think one of the key lessons uh, from these early missions is the importance of all that preparation and getting to know one another and bonding together as a team. And I think that also helps you get into your seat and get that seatbelt on because you're doing it as a unit instead of doing it as an individual. Yeah, I, I'm, I think you're, you're right, Garrett, and, and I think that one of the reasons uh, it, it doesn't work uh, as, as Elon might envisage one day where you just show your boarding pass and get on, uh, the reality is that this is still a, a major and potentially dangerous undertaking. And I think that uh, you need to be able to bond with your, with your crewmates and work together effectively uh, to be able to be prepared for any kind of emergency. And uh, you rely on one another, and, and that's something that that's, I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, agreed. Well, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to make sure we uh, talk a little bit more, Eitan, about your experience since uh, we're in front of your home crowd. Um, I remember uh, with Rona, Rona Ramon would often con um, make the comment that her husband Elon was the first Israeli astronaut, and that means that there will be a second. And so this idea of the next Israeli astronaut has been out there for years, and it was something we talked about frequently, but never really had the opportunity to make it happen. And I remember talking to you uh, in your office years before we had ever successfully sent humans on board the SpaceX vehicle. But it was beginning to become something that might be in the realm of possibility. And I said to you, hey, are you interested, you know? And you told me that Aura would never let you. Um, and then I found out you were joking because she said that uh, she couldn't wait, wait to get rid of you, actually. Um, but I could see with that, you were jesting or joking about it, but I could see that, that light in your eyes that this was something that was going to be of interest. And when it came time that it really was a possibility, we began to realize that this, you know, the second Israeli astronaut, you're stepping into some really big spacesuit boots um, following Elon. And for those of us that were there and, and knew Elon, and especially for uh, the family, it, it could have been very awkward or difficult, depending on who was selected to be the second Israeli astronaut. And I personally was overjoyed that you agreed to do this because I think there is no possible better choice. Because of your friendship with Elon, you flew with him, your excellence as a pilot, your support over the years of the Ramon Foundation, um, and, and your support and friendship with, with, uh, with the family, especially with Rona and, and all the kids. So now you've taken it one step further with Rakia. And uh, really what I love about this is it's an opportunity to continue that this is, you know, it wasn't just splashed down and it's over. 
I, w I want you to tell us a little bit more about what Arkea is going to do in the future along the lines of continuing to complete Elon's mission, which is how I see it. Uh, it's, it's true meaning. So the truth of the previous story is that I answered you yes before I asked Ola. So <laughs> I first said yes, and that was a, a month before the first human launch by SpaceX in uh, May uh, 2020. And I signed the contract only after they returned safely home. So anyway, uh, after Ola knew she couldn't refuse, we talked both of us talked to the children of uh, Rona and Elon and asked them if they think this is proper and they gave me a big hug and support. And they too understood, like the Israeli president you met before and the previous one, that the impact on the Israeli industry, on the public, on the children, on inspiration, during Corona, during period where everyone's folding into his house and a bit uh, uh, concerned, to open the eyes, to look, uh, from far away to participate in an in a exciting, uh, inspiring mission um, and really take part because we, through the Ramon Foundation, through Rakia guys, we uh, called for proposals from students. We did over 150,000 students participated in the mission, not watch TV, but they took part in competitions. We uh, had a competition for uh, poem writing about perspective. So thousands of children send uh, poems, and I read some of them from space. Uh, philosophers, artists um, proposed ideas, and I took uh, 12 artworks to space, which is very uncommon. Um, the NASA and the Russian astronauts, when I told them the next artwork that I'm going to do is sit silently in one position and do nothing, which is art probably, and just uh, uh, contemplate, it was very peculiar because NASA sells uh, every astronaut hour for $130,000. So every minute is very valuable. So the, the mission was to bring everyone with me and enable um, everyone to participate, and we're continuing with that. The idea is that uh, as many as possible, more and more people can go to space or send their ideas to space, if it's scientific, if it's uh, philosophical. Do you, do you want to say anything about Axiom partnering with Rakia going forward? I want to say something. So uh, a couple days ago, we signed an agreement which basically just permits the Hakia mission to continue in cooperation with NASA. So through our connections at the um, International Space Station National Laboratory, formerly known as the Center for Advancement of Science and Space Cases, um, we will fly, we will collaborate with Hakia to select and fly missions to the ISS even without an Israeli astronaut on board. And this continues the participation and the idea that many, many thousands of people can go to space even without going to space. That's great. Very cool. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, to wrap up, does anybody have anything that we didn't get to that you want to point out? Or if not, maybe just one funny story, one quick little anecdote about something that happened during the mission that you want to share. Keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start with a boring sort of um, commercial spaceflight federation type statement and say that uh, low Earth orbit is open for business. Uh, whether it's private astronauts, other government astronauts, research, one day in space manufacturing, we are now, we have passed an inflection point in what human spaceflight looks like. It used to be just governments and it, it's been that way for 60 years. And now it is, uh, we have opened the door to a new era. And I, for one, am very optimistic about what that era looks like to involve more of the billions of people on Earth instead of just the 600 or so of us that have had the fortune to do it so far, whether it's actually flying in space or flying your experiment in space or participating in an educational outreach event. This is, uh, this is the dawn of a new era. Uh, you guys can say some dirt now. 
no dirt. I think that, uh, yes, this is the dawn of a new era, and I think uh, we're very much looking forward to rapid progress on the, on the part of uh, NASA and uh, SpaceX that will uh, enable us to uh, get to the moon. So I think uh, we're all keen to go back to space. We're all jealous of Mike that he's going back. You can call Axiom now. You know, operators are standing by to take your call. <laughs> so the excitement about this uh, um, conference and exposing our achievement of going as private citizens to the International Space Station is really, um, the objective of it is to gather more and more uh, things to do there, open your minds, do whatever you can dream about because I'll give you a small story. The toilet, on, I'll keep it clean. <laughs> the toilet on the American section of the station is exactly the same as the toilet on the Russian part and it's a Russian toilet. So the Americans haven't succeeded yet to create a toilet that goes to the moon. So that's a challenge for the Israeli public <laughs> industry. <laughs> So I would have just uh, two final thoughts. One, ours was not space tourism. It was a serious mission with, as I said earlier, serious uh, research and hopefully great outcomes. And while I think there's certainly a place uh, for space tourism, if you're gonna go and launch and go to the International Space Station, you need to train professionally and take it uh, very, very seriously and have worthwhile outcomes. Uh, the other thought is, this is my first time here in uh, Israel, and so thank you for inviting us. And <clears throat> I personally think extraordinary country with uh, extraordinary people. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It, it's, uh, I thank you all for coming uh, all this way and being here today uh, at the Ramon Conference and uh, for sharing those insights. It was really, I, I learned a lot, so it was really fascinating. Thank you very much, and we'll turn it over to the next uh, panel. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for this personal and insightful look on the AX-1 mission. Next, we'll take a unique look at climate change and how space technologies are assisting in mitigating it, from space tech to climate action. To moderate this panel, I'm happy to call to the stage Ms. Dana Lynn Barnett. Ms. Barnett is a system engineer at Elbit Systems, one of the leading defense and space companies in Israel. Joining Dana on stage will be Mr. Ricardo Conde, President of Portugal Space, Mr. Philip Campinan, VHR Mission Director at Planet, Mr. Marco Brancati, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at Telespazio, Dr. Shira Efron, Senior Researcher and Head of the Climate Change and National Security Program at the Institute for National Security Studies, and Dr. Ophir Almok, Chief Scientist at Momentic. Good luck. <laughs> I can't see it. Thank you. Okay, hi. Welcome, everyone. Um, Today uh, we're going to talk about how climate change uh, is impacted by space technologies. Uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 13 is, is to take uh, urgent action to combine, combat climate change and its impact. It has five targets, of which one of them is including <laughs> building uh, knowledge and capacity. In the last, in the last few years, have shown how um, space technology plays a major role in Earth's monitoring and measurements of the uh, global uh, climate emergency indicators. 
In this panel, we hope to take this uh, discussion to the next level, not just uh, what space technology can do, but how it can progress forward and what can we do to, to help the different customers identify the gaps and what is the future for using space tech for climate action. I, I have uh, the honor of having here these distinguished members from uh, the space agency, um, the industry, and defense covering all aspects of this uh, uh, topic. And, and we will start by asking um, the first question, which is uh, basically, uh, what are the technologies and data, and how do we use it today? So uh, we'll ask you, um, Philip, to start. Yes. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I don't know if we can see the slide. Yes, yes thank you. Um, uh, so, I, I, I could start with talking about all the details of what data are uh, and what, how data are important in, in contributing to, 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 to measuring climate change, controlling it, following it. I think it's more important to, to think about how data can be converted into gradually to more precise, more uh, meaningful layers of information. So besides collecting data, we do that every day uh, on tasking or systematic acquisition. Um, and we collect archive up to 2,000 uh, images of a single point on Earth today. But this needs to be converted in something that all the industry can, can use and, and analyze. So analysis the ready data. And out of that, extracting um, variables which are more significant to uh, people who are really controlling um, the, the, the climate change. And ultimately, in order to gain insights and to deliver indicators to decision makers who don't need to know about space, about space technology. So what matters is not only to generate data to have sensors in space. What matters is really to turn that into something which has real value to a broad range of people, broad range of application. And I think this is, we will elaborate more on, on that, but I think what is important there is to think about the whole ecosystem will contribute to this understanding. Okay, so while Planet is collecting the data and imaging every uh, almost place on Earth daily, uh, I believe, uh, Ophir, you can have an, uh, an ice insight about what else can be done. Yes, sure. <clears throat> First, it's a, pleasure, it's a pleasure to be here, so thank you. Dana, when I go to work every day, I deal with that specific uh, question. I work in a company, Momentic, that develop capabilities, proven capabilities in detecting and quantifying GAG emissions from satellites, from image satellites. The GAG, greenhouse uh, uh, gases, are emitted from everywhere, industry, vehicles, and more. And they are transparent, especially in the visible light and also in the sphere, shortwave infrared, they are 90% transparent. This is a very big effort. However, the government tell us reduce 50% of the global GAG emissions by 2030. Now, experts believe that we now detect only 2% of the GAG, only 2%. So if we cannot measure that, how we can handle that? So why don't use sensor ground? Sensor ground are very limited. They have a very narrow field of view, and we cannot place them everywhere. So if they demand us to find MRV, measure, report and validate how can we do it. If we look on the sky, on space, we understand this is the answer. It's available. It's available, it's cost effective. We can see 
everything from space. We're in a new era, a new space era. Many, many, many platforms observe the Earth every day. Each point on Earth is captured between one to 10 times a day. It's a lot. We can utilize that. This is what we do. The problem is that most of, most of the work is done per demand. And we, my friend and I in Momentic, believe that we should do it autonomously. We should do it accurate, autonomously, and we believe that every image should be analyzed at the moment of acquisition, and, and we should do it at the platform themselves. Okay, and, and once we collect all this data, uh, how do we share it, and how do we, what can we do? Uh, I would like uh, Mr. Kondo to have some. Thank you, Dana, um, and thank you for the nice invitation. I, I just want to share with you one thing that comes to my, my hands in the last month, which is a really incredible report for IMASAT. It's a MASAT study about satellite-enabled decarbonization. We should take the numbers, and particularly the, uh, the SATCOM, what is the impact with uh, some uh, methodology to reduce um, the, the car carbon emissions. And they, they, they give some examples, and particularly in transport and logistics, and also uh, oil, gas, uh, agriculture, which is really recommend uh, to read this report to see the impact and the sustainability. It's one of the probably the most important reports regarding space and sustainability that uh, at least uh, I, I, I really read. Let me just tackle one thing which is important. I'm coming from Portugal. Uh, Portugal is a south country in, uh, uh, in Europe together with Spain, Italy and Greece and we are facing one of the biggest problems nowadays which is the wildfires. This is something that is linked to our territory. That means one of the sources of sustainability is to manage our territory. And then we have also another huge heritage and responsibility. We, are, we have in front of us this huge ocean, which is the Atlantic, that becomes ourselves one of the biggest countries in Europe. And probably you know and you are aware that the outcomes of the UN Oceans Conference that 30% of the maritime area should be protected. How can we do that? The only uh, possible way to do it is using satellite technology, of course, combine it with other data. And uh, this is why I think space must deliver. I must put in the agenda, this is one of the reasons we use these cases, these use cases, to put in agenda in our governments to leverage, of course, an industrial agenda to build and to implement in the national level what we call a open data policy. Because we know, and we know very well planets, and we have very good relations with planets. Uh, they are quite impressive that you are achieving, in particular, a new constellation for um, monitoring uh, uh, gas and... Uh, and uh, but we still think there are a lot of barriers to assess data. I normally, I give the, this example. In our, in our mobile phone, we have access to GNSS data for free. And this helps us to have so many applications here, right? We are not paying for GNSS data, GPS, Galileo. I think one day we'll reach the time that probably we'll not pay for uh, uh, EO data. And this is the role of space agencies. I heard in the last panel with uh, my colleagues uh, that we share also some ideas in the European level that what is the role of the space agencies? One of the roles of space agencies should be, let's say, act in the data policy. And I really believe that, and at least in Portugal, we are doing that. We are trying to build what's so called a geo-hub. A geo-hub is some kind of, uh, let's say, open platform for institutions, public institutions, to tackle problems about of wildfires, 
the drought, the lack of water, the manage of coastal areas, and this huge problem that we have in hands with the sustainability of our oceans. And if we can provide data to people, I really believe they have, they, they, they produce what we get with the GNSS data. I think this is uh, the way forward. Yeah. May, may I just, uh, um, I, I fully agree with your goal, um, and we just need to, to build the, the models which work uh, towards what you are aiming at. And I have just one example, and I want to quote that example because it's not only planet, it's, it's an example of something that we are doing together with Airbus, uh, sharing uh, data for free to anyone who is interested in um, monitoring for deforestation, so it's totally co connected to, to, to climate change. Uh, but that needs some funding source. And in that case, this has been funded by a Norwegian fund. Uh, but that works. And, and it's, a, it's a great success in, in, in terms of number of, of users, in terms of, of results, of outcome of, of that initiative. So it shows that we just need all together to be creative to make that happen. But, but I, I agree, this should be the goal uh, at the end. But private industry needs some funding, so we need just to find a way. Okay, um, Dr. Fon, would you like to address also um, where Mr. Kondo's vision and how can we get there or what other aspects of users we have? Yeah, maybe I'll speak. Uh, first of all, thank you for including me. It's such an honor to be here among distinguished uh, space experts. I think I'm more on the consumer side. Um, um, actually advising the Israeli Ministry of Defense and National Security Council on climate change uh, and how we integrate it into national security considerations. So, uh, Philip, I'm one of those people that need to get information without knowing anything about space that you refer to. So it's not just the, the data, right? It's also the analytics. So I, maybe I'll just uh, explain where, as a defense, defense communities, where we're coming from, um, when we look at uh, climate change, cl clearly it's an environmental issue and a social issue, an economic issue and a health issue, and, but it's, it's really a national security issue at its core. And for five, uh, there are probably five elements, right? It's this threat multiplier. It's gonna make every problem we have worse. It's gonna exacerbate socioeconomic tensions and ethnic problems can lead to mass migration, instability, and uh, conducive uh, conditions for terrorist groups. Uh, it affects the basic capabilities, and we'll talk about space capabilities, but it affects all our capabilities, our readiness for the Hebrew speakers, she wouldn't say it, anything, service members. Uh, it also, um, we know that armed forces will be called upon uh, more at home for uh, responding to disasters at home. It happens everywhere. Um, it's the most organized force usually in countries and they will have to respond with more extreme weather events. We see that more often. Climate change action, speak about it all the time. It re requires international cooperation. It's a little bit hard to do in a time of war and it's a little bit hard to do with the great power competition, right? Um, and finally, if militaries today, there's a new, uh, 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 speaking about uh, GEG emissions, if militaries uh, combined were a country, they were number four emitters in the world. They would emit more uh, greenhouse gases than Russia. So uh, this is something uh, they also, if we wanna move into uh, more green militaries and uh, abide by national commitments, militaries have to do their role. For all these things, you need uh, data. And you need data uh, that comes also from the climate and space nexus at the very uh, immediate term for uh, operations, uh, also for uh, uh, disaster response to be effective. Here we know it's with forest fires. In other places, it's more landslides uh, and floods. But we also need it for the longer term issues. You know, we, we tend to speak about, uh, oh, uh, climate change we know already today is uh, making approximately 20 million people uh, move out of their homes every year. That's every year. The numbers are going to rise to half a billion by 2050. But where will that be? We have no resolutions. And if we had early warning, if we had information that could give us the communities that are at risk, we could also work collectively to preempt it. And uh, we can't do this without um, the space uh, intelligence. Okay, so once we, um, we do this, but uh, how do we use all this data and, and translate it? So 
how do you bring it forward to, to the users? Let me, let me just give you an example that Europe did in 2009, I guess. Um, we had a um, very serious problem in the North Atlantic regarding the oil spills. There are some ships, they wash their tanks, and we implement in the European Union quite unique program to uh, using at that time one of uh, our SAR um, satellite, it was MVSAT at that time, I remember, and we used to try to, together with RadarSat to build an operational scenario to tracking in near real time oil spills monitoring. And this evolves so quickly then this force also to implement the Copernicus in, in Europe. And this is based in the constant monitoring in the near real time that nowadays we have a North Atlantic quite clean of these threats. And this is a good example how to foster to new sensors, new also international collaboration. I know that, for example, from companies in Israel, they are provide data for these European Maritime Safety Agency to, that are responsible to implement this, uh, this program. And, but let me, uh, and to, to back to, to Philip here. Philip, we don't want to destroy the business of the companies. We want to promote. And for that, if I want to buy to the private companies, for example, a yearly coverage, which will be the same price that I will, for example, ask you for an offer of a weekly coverage or to provide a near real time. What we are looking here is how we can have access to near real time data. The thing is, the price is so high that you cannot implement it. They are not a question of technology. It's a question to assess the data to, for example, to not, not, not only to prevent wildfires, as to monitoring the wildfires. So that means the role of space agencies is to try to converge in the, some kind of public procurement to give this data to the public. And this is what I think is the next step, the next level for the EU and to really help the monitoring. Yeah. Um, well, on, on this question of access to the data and the cost of data, the, well, first of all, there is a price, but there is a price because there is a cost. So um, I think the best way to reduce the price when the cost exists is to mutualize, to, to, to make more people use the same data. So we heard you. I think this is something well, the example, again, of Nick Fee, this, this uh, initiative for forestry, is probably a good example where the actual price which has been given to that initiative, if counted by per, per square kilometer, is extremely low, simply because we know that, well, there is a funding source, and we know that there will be a lot of people using it. So it becomes practical to everyone. The same idea is something we are working. I don't want to bother you with, with the internal things of, of plant. We are working on, on business models in order to, uh, to, to, to flatten a little bit those, those prices. So you are heard. It's not a simple answer, but, but I think we are moving into that direction. The second thing that I hear from what you say is cadence, um, uh, near real time, and on that axis as well, we are working. So today we are collecting imagery of the whole landmass almost every day, to make it simple. We say every day, it's actually 80 to 90% depending on, on the places. But so this already exists at medium resolution, at a resolution, and I want to give an, an anecdote there. Uh, in Amazonia, with Landsat and Sentinel, it became quite easy to monitor simple deforestation. And the bad guys understood that, and they started cutting not all the trees, because this is, you can see with Landsat or Sentinel, but one tree out of three. 
And this cannot be seen with Landsat and Sentinel. And we came with our, with our slightly higher resolution, and there it becomes visible. And that's where the technology needs go, to go faster than the bad guys in order to offer solutions. And last but not least, the next generation of, sat of tasking satellites will give the possibility to observe several times in the same day, which means, for instance, coming to uh, observation on the ocean, when something happens, being able to monitor things every hour, every two hours, instead of once a day or once every three days. And this is the trend that we are trying to, to, to put to the, to the users uh, collectively, again, planet of course, but, but I, I want to, to recognize that all our colleagues and competitors are also going into that direction. I think this is important. We, the competition here doesn't mean anything, in my view. We need collectively to give better service so that more applications are possible and we will just widen the market, and that's the way. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that the data is the name of the game. We have to take the data, we have to analyze it, to measure, to report, to validate, and to give it to, decision, to the decision makers. They should decide about the regulation, and I think very important thing, based on accurate insights, they should allocate budget. Biden administration allocated $20 billion for technology to, reduct, to reduce methane in the incoming five years. It's a lot of money. Many, many, many researchers, entrepreneurs, and more can utilize that, that money and do better things for the climate change. So, um, do you think there's is like a new kinds of users or a new kinds of markets that I can use to combine with the um, space agencies so I can lower the cost and still have a business case? Well, well, well I, I can start. Um, yes. Uh, New, new users are important because, uh, again, it's, it's a matter of finding ways to fund uh, this, uh, this data collection and this provision of, 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 of insights, ultimately. Um, as an example, big players like Microsoft, Google, to, 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 to quote a few from, from the US, but I think it's extending now in the rest of the world, uh, are more and more willing to support uh, this, this monitoring. There is this, this kind of green attitude from, from big companies, uh, and, and, and we need all to use that to, to get some funding and to, to give, as far as possible, unbiased uh, information and unbiased measurement and monitoring of, of what's going on. I think that space agencies have a key role to play, as well as institutions, academia, uh, universities, in order to, to put this label of, of uh, unbiased analysis. The private sector, uh, private, private data providers have their role to play because in a way or another we are optimizing the, the um, the, the cost and, and the, the effectiveness of, of delivering those data. And this ecosystem needs to be made of all these players together. But the, the users, the funders, are very important because without money, unfortunately, this will not happen. Uh. I can give you also uh, our example. We are promoting, uh, we already launched this uh, initiative at the national level. Uh, in a cooperation with, uh, with Spain, we are launching this initiative that Atlantic Constellation, which is uh, a constellation for several satellites to address, of course, the sustainability and the, 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 the problems that I, I mentioned before. Uh, but this is the way we are, let's say, promoting the companies at the same time 
to reduce the barriers to access the data. So we are uh, two in one. That, that means we will invest and we are, let's say, put a lot of uh, money uh, to build these constellations, around 200 million to build together with Spain this constellation. But at the end, what we want is to, in uh, some years, uh, implement these concepts. Uh, we will implement uh, from now on, but uh, uh, to be more mature when we start to get some data with this constellation. Why? Because we want to give, uh, let's say, some answers, particularly to, uh, to manage the territory, which is, as I said, the uh, source of uh, the sustainability. And to put in our verticals, agriculture, monitoring the resources in the ocean, even the pollution that I, I mentioned before, uh, uh, also the, the wildfires, the, the lack of water, all these, the, the agriculture, the precision agriculture, which is a, a very important in the context of the uh, European Union. So we want, as a country, to have a word on that. And at the same time, as I said, uh, Philippe is also uh, to promote an industrial agenda uh, to leverage uh, for new level the census, but at some time, at the same time, to implement uh, some kind of op not open data policy, I wish, because I, have a fan, I am a fan of open data policy, but someone must pay. I agree, I agree. But uh, this is, again, I uh, insist on that, this is the role of the national policies for, for data. So, um, with the new uh, markets and data, do you think we can aspire with new technologies and analytics um, to, to go forward and, and use this data? Um, like, you know, what do you think? Yeah. Yes, I do think that analytics, analytics in the few years will be the, the, the game changer. I want the data to be accessible for everyone, starting with the researchers, then with the academy, when to anyone, I want everyone to be able to open a satellite image, to analyze it, to think about it, and to share his idea with everyone. Um, you know, I, uh, um, I learned that you can answer questions from TV. I learned that you can answer questions any way you want. So <laughs> I'll just uh, say that I think we're talking a lot here about you know the satellite and the data and uh, how uh, space uh, uh, capabilities can help us address the threat of climate change. But I think we also need to discuss how climate change is threatening space capabilities. And this goes to everything that surrounds it, right? So when I look at uh, uh, climate change effects on ground-based infrastructures, launch, launch pads, communication towers, uh, the chillers for servers, and also all the other facilities, which by the way, for the Western countries, are more vulnerable than those of uh, Russia and China because they're along the coast. And, you know, if you look at predictions, we're talking about uh, one to two uh, meters uh, sea level rise, this without the storm surge, by the end of the century. So this is also, I think, something we need to talk about it. I mean, to what extent can you continue providing these services, whether privately or uh, as a government? Uh, the launch itself, uh, there are 14 weather criteria that have to be met for the launch to be successful. Right? These are becoming extremely uh, harder to meet as we go because one of the manifestations, physical manifestations of climate change is extreme weather events. Um, even if the launch is successful, uh, reuse can be uh, complicated, uh, which would make this uh, immensely uh, costly, of course, effects on supply chains. And what is also concerning, maybe this is more the payloads and the sensors, but we are losing the ability, at least when we're talking about the Middle East, the electro-optical space collection capabilities are really hindered by fog, uh, sand and dust storms, and the image processing by, uh, by, by heat. And I want to give you a very concrete example, because this sounds like uh, all talk, but uh, in 2015, there are a few examples, but the most, uh, uh, I, I think, illuminating one is that um, the Islamic State, ISIS, remember, when they took over Ramadi, that was under the cover of a huge sandstorm. Uh, it happened also a few months before in Kirkuk when there was an attack on the Kurdish Peshmerga. And it, by the way, it happened this year. ISIS is still around. It happened again in Iraq. Now, when you look at Iraq, it's 272 uh, days of uh, uh, dust that, uh, per year. We're going to be 300 days per year. Uh, 
by 2050. And as everyone in Israel knows, when we wake up to cars covered in uh, orange dust, the, the dust doesn't know borders. So yeah, you can say, well, that's easy. We will replace the electro-optical with, uh, with IR and SWIR and SAR. But I think we need to also, also think about uh, these questions. So um, while we have, uh, we have time just for one more question, and I would like to ask you all, um, Shira, you can start. What do you think we should go from now? We have a call for collaboration and open data and, and hopefully somebody to fund all of this, but w what should we do like coming out of this uh, panel? I mean, I think it's easier uh, said than done, but uh, this cooperation uh, between uh, business and government is key, right? The knowledge is no longer, the lead is no longer with governments, and this is, and also between governments, the space has become such a contested uh, area, uh, very difficult to cooperate, uh, but, it, but it's really a must. Um, I think another area, which maybe if I can be a little bit uh, bold, and this is sort of the science fiction part, but you know, when, when we think about what, what if we can't stop climate change? What if we need to find a, an emergency solution? A lot of countries are toying with the ideas of geoengineering. One of these uh, uh, ideas is uh, huge uh, solar mirrors. Uh, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but I think we have to start looking at what uh, others might do <laughs> and how that uh, would affect our planet. Yeah, maybe, well, I, I, I repeat that I think we need collectively to build new ways, new, new business model, new ways of make, making data accessible. That's for, let's say, the very practical side. Now I want to make all of us dream um, a little bit. And what if we would be able, when we have an ID, something based on artificial intelligence or any kind of ID, to upload some algorithm on board the satellites, make the satellites analyze the data in orbit and download directly the results, something which means something to, to, to everyone. And I, 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 I quote that because I think this will happen, and this will happen sooner than what we think. Uh, artificial in intelligence on board satellites is a reality for next years. Let me just point out one, one thing, and this is also related to what this planet we, is doing. It is this old perspective for monitoring the carbon sequestration and also to implement these carbon uh, stock markets. Uh, this, this is an arena for collaboration. There are no borders uh, for, uh, for this, for the climate change. And this is something that uh, I really believe uh, that the, uh, some companies also, uh, some institutions, particularly space agency, must uh, have a role on that. This is uh, uh, still in the early stages of development because it's quite complex. Um, but uh, I think it will be the future in the next three, four years. So monitoring from space about the whole um, emission of carbon dioxide and also carbon sequestration to try to really to implement this idea about uh, the whole environment on the planet. I don't see more than uh, uh, other, let's say, areas of international collaboration than exactly that because, as I said before, there are no, no borders for that. Yeah, so on, on that particular case, so our approach at Planet has always been to push the technology first and then find uh, a business model to, to, to make that sustainable. Uh, and this is, all, this is the case for, for, for uh, greenhouse uh, gases, for methane uh, measurement and, and carbon dioxide measurement. We are preparing a constellation of satellites which will be measuring that in complement to, for instance, what Sentinel-5 is doing in Europe. Um, uh, with, with a, um, a sharper resolution, not as broad um, a, a coverage, but in order to complement the measurement of, of Sentinel-5. So this technology is under development right now, will be launched by the end of this year. Uh, we'll start with start building that constellation by the end of this year. And then we will find a way uh, to make that available to a maximum of people. Uh, that business model is still to be invented. 
to be honest, this was possible because of some funding support from NASA, from uh, California State, and, and a few others, and, but, but on the long term, we just need to build that model. So, that sounds like a dream that we can uh, finish with. Um, I want to thank you all for this uh, very interesting um, discussion and for coming here today, and I hope that we can reach this um, dream for open data and accessible data uh, with a lot of analytics for everyone. So thank you very much. much ladies and gentlemen thank you thank you for discussing this important issue and offering ways to mitigate it through space technology our next panel will take us back to the moon and will assess the technical technological challenges and opportunities in space exploration the panel will discuss advances in lunar exploration as a gateway to even further missions while examining the opportunities for small countries and startups working together with leading agencies and established industries. To moderate this panel, I'm excited to call to the stage Mr. Ofer Doron, CEO of EVR Motors. In his previous role, he managed Israel Aerospace Industries Space Division, where he led the development of Space IL's moon lander, Bereshit. Joining him on stage is Ms. Catherine Corner, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development at NASA, Dr. Oren Milstein, CEO and Chief Scientific Officer at STEMRAD, Mr. Massimo Comparini, Deputy CEO and SEVP Observation, Exploration and Navigation at Thales Alenia Space, General and uh, retired Jiman Sarid, CEO of Space IL, Dr. Julian Alexander Lamami, Managing Director at InSpace Europe, and Mr. Meir Nisim Nir, Director of Advanced Space Systems at the Israel Aerospace Industries. Welcome. Thank you, Arnold. I'll be calling them up one by one in a moment. I'll be calling them up one by one in a moment. We'll be discussing the advances in lunar exploration as a gateway, not just to the moon, but to what goes on further than that, and also be looking at the opportunities for small countries and small space agencies to work together with the larger countries, with the larger corporations, the larger space agencies. So we're sort of be looking at how can David and Goliath, both good guys in this case, work together to make the moon a much, much more exciting place. So first I'd like to ask Kathy to join us. Kathy was director of, uh, was flight director for multiple shuttle missions, ISS missions, spanning 20 expeditions, 12 assembly missions, and count them, 63 spacewalks. She was then program manager for Orion, so that beautiful movie we saw before, I think that's you, Kathy, is that correct? My yeah, that was your spacecraft. Wow. And she now leads human spaceflight development and operations. In other words, she has to develop the system and she has to run it for all of NASA's missions to the moon and Mars. I think what she's forgotten about running human spaceflight missions, everyone else here will never know. Next on board, Please, yes. do give her a round. Next on board is Massimo Comparini, my friend, come on. Massimo is Senior Vice President for Observation and Exploration and Navigation at Thales Alenia Space. They are the industrial prime contractor for ExoMars. They've been contracted to supply key modules to the Lunar Gateway. They are supplying key modules to the Axiom Space Station and they've got multiple exploration missions ongoing. So I think they know a few things about exploration as well. Now let's go from the Goliaths over to the Davids. <laughs> Julien, come join us please. Managing Director of iSpace Europe, where he's leading rover tech and space resources business. But iSpace is originally one of the Google Lunar X Prize competitors. And they are the only ones on this panel with something actually on the way to the moon right now. So the next, hopefully successful, Julien, lunar landing is going to be yours in a couple of months, and we will be watching that very, very excited. And hopefully it will be the first private 
mission to land on the moon successfully uh, and the fourth country to succeed landing. Dr. Oren Milstein, CEO of STEMRAD, just sent on Kathy's wonderful spacecraft radiation suits to protect astronauts and tested them very successfully together with Lockheed Martin, with DLR and with NASA. So I think he's probably got a few things to say about how David and Goliath work from the David point of view. Shimon, CEO of Space IL, he's got the very enviable task of getting Israel to the moon once again. And he said, ah, they didn't succeed once the first time in landing well, so I'll do it twice the next time around. And he's gonna to try to land two landers on the moon. And he is going to be supported by Meir, the Director of Advanced Space Systems at IAI, who is going to be building the orbiter, which, aside from bringing the landers there, is gonna be doing a lot of space work. So, I think we've got an extraordinary panel of people who have sent things to the moon, is going to be sending things to the moon, some of them both, and let's hear what you've got to say first. I know you can each talk for at least two hours about what you've been doing and what you plan to do. I'll give you two minutes to get us really, really excited about what you're doing, and I'll let you go last because I know that otherwise that's never going to finish. Mayor, start, please. <laughs> I'm running a small uh, new space start startup in the biggest Israeli aerospace uh, corporate. Uh, what we're building is a light satellite uh, program that fits all. From the same program, we are shipping uh, the Bereshit 2 uh, lunar orbiter. We are offering uh, lander programs. We're going to geo with a, a space uh, monitoring telescope and building uh, light satellite uh, constellations. So join, at, join us for an uh, interesting ride. Yeah, I'm uh, Shimon. I'm the CEO of SpaceIL, a nonprofit organization aimed to inspire scientists, next generation scientists, engineers, and dreamers. Uh, our mission is to bring Israel back to the moon in 2025. Uh, we are currently developing the Bereshit 2 mission which is a system comprised of three spacecraft, uh, uh, one orbiter and two landers to land in each side of the moon in 2025. Uh, our program is defined uh, by ourselves as an international program, international collaboration program. We are collaborating with other space agencies, other u universities around the world to make a, a one mission. And we attach to it a wide education system to follow the mission, to track the mission with many, many school children and students all around the world. Thank you, Shimon. I'm uh, Oren Milstein, CEO of STEMRAD, an Israeli-American company developing radiation protection for extreme scenarios, both on Earth and beyond. We have products for nuclear first responders that are currently servicing uh, first responders uh, to nuclear reactors and also uh, first lines of defense in the form of the National Guards uh, in America and other places. And we've implemented uh, an adaptation of that product uh, for the use of astronauts in space uh, called Astrorad. Astrorad is a personal radiation protection, a wearable vest uh, to be used by crew members venturing into deep space for the first time since 1972. In deep space, you have a very harsh radiation environment, quite different from what's been uh, experienced on ISS to date, much more harsher, specifically when you have a solar particle event. Solar particle events correspond with uh, solar activity, which is reaching its maximum now as we venture to land on the moon for the first time since uh, Apollo 17. So since then, we've also developed a product for protection of physicians working in cat labs. Uh, it's a very successful solution that you can see on the floor here. If you go outside to, to check our booth, it's, it's right there. And it's now servicing uh, thousands of doctors uh, around the world. Uh, so I'm uh, very proud to pass on my microphone to the next participant of the panel. Thank you very much. Good morning. So iSpace is a company uh, with the ambition to become the catalyst for the development of the lunar economy. And our first contribution to make this ambition happen 
is um, a transportation service that's open and can provide uh, frequent access to the lunar surface. As Orfer said, um, our first demonstration of this service took place in December. We launched our first spacecraft, lunar spacecraft, to the moon. It's on its way. We just passed Apogee right now. We'll be landing end of April. Like the Bereshit lander, it's privately funded. Um, what makes this spacecraft unique is the commercial nature of it. We're servicing seven customers on this first mission. So this is a commercial uh, venture. And uh, we have another mission in 2024 that's also privately funded with customers. And then in 2025, we'll take instruments from NASA uh, to the far side of the moon, uh, Schrodinger Basin, for, for the first time, I believe. Good morning, Thales Alenia Space. Uh, as Alfa said, it's uh, actually working on all the exploration destination. Uh, from the low Earth orbit, uh, you know, our long legacy of the International Space Station, we build up uh, roughly 50% of the pressurized model. Uh, moon, right now we are building the models uh, on uh, international habitat and esprit, which is the European contribution to the gateway. And with Norton Grumman, we're building the logistic model, the HALO. And of course, Mars, uh, we know that uh, we were supposed to to leave in uh, September 2022 uh, for Mars, for ExoMars 2022. And the ministerial conference, uh, last conference in, in November in Paris, uh, uh, find the condition to recover the mission a little bit later in the decade, most likely on 2028. 20, and uh, in, in addition to all those pressurized and robotic vehicles, of course, we have the low Earth orbit, which is really important with the iOS in orbit servicing, as well as with the uh, vehicles like the Space Rider and other HESA project with that we lead. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Kerner. It's my privilege to be here with you this afternoon. It's also my privilege to be the deputy to Jim Free, who was your keynote speaker earlier today. He outlined really what our exploration plans are um, in the near term. And he said something that I thought was very key. He said this, that we are really at an unprecedented time in our exploration activities where we are simultaneously developing not only transportation systems that you saw perform so well in Artemis I, but also uh, cislunar orbiting systems as well as surface systems. So there's lots of opportunity out there. There's lots of um, activity that we're doing. And NASA really is leading both a commercial, academic, but also the global alliance to send humans further than they have ever been before. We're doing that for the purpose of science, but also for exploration. You saw Artemis One again early, earlier this morning being featured. The successful mission there will help set us up tremendously for Artemis Two, when we'll have our first test mission with humans on board the Orion spacecraft. And then Artemis Three, where we will put people on the surface of the moon for the first time in over 50 years. That's really gonna set us up um, so that we can establish an annual cadence of missions to the moon sometime in the Artemis IV time frame. We'll also simultaneously be developing our lunar gateway where we'll have an opportunity to not only assemble um, elements but also provide a depot for logistics and power and communications that will help service other activities on the lunar surface. Beyond Artemis IV, like I said, we're going to establish an annual cadence of Artemis missions to the moon. All of that with the intention of figuring out how best to explore. We're establishing really a blueprint for exploration, first to the moon, and then on to Mars, and then to other places in the solar system. And if you heard the panel earlier with the, um, the heads of agencies, Bob Cabana expressed, I thought, very appropriately that we're not doing this alone. We're going not only uh, with small companies, large companies, small agencies, large agencies. I think earlier you called me Goliath if I understood that analogy correctly. But really what we're trying to do is say space exploration is available to all. So let's go back in time. And imagine we were sitting here on this stage exactly 50 years ago, six weeks after astronauts Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt left the moon on Apollo 17. Just two weeks after, Luna 21 landed a rover on the moon. Pretty busy lunar month. And if I was to ask you, esteemed panel members, 50 years ago, 
what would the moon look like in 50 years? Would you have said that in all those 50 years, there would be five missions to land successfully, two Russians, three Chinese, and two to land much too fast, one Israeli, one Indian? So with that pessimistic hind view in mind, let's time travel forward to 2050. What's happening on the moon? What's happening on Mars? What's your vision? And what has your organization been doing and is going to be doing personally? Where will you be then in 2050 together? Let's start in the middle with the guys going there right now. Julian. Thank you. Um, well, iSpace has a 2040 uh, vision, so I can extrapolate a little bit. Um, I think our, our first mission planted the seed of, of that vision, which is uh, we have the UAE on that spacecraft, we have Canada, uh, we have Japan, uh, and then suppliers from Europe all over. So. One, one big aspect of the, the moon in 2040, 2050 will be uh, international aspect. You know, you mentioned uh, 50 years ago, well, it was US and Russia, that's about it. Uh, we're seeing now uh, since uh, 2018, Israel, India, now Japan, other countries really interested in uh, developing their own competencies or leveraging commercial services like ours to uh, develop their initiatives on the moon. So I hope we continue to see more international engagement from large agencies and smaller agencies um, that can leverage international cooperation, but also uh, you know, affordable commercial services like the one we provide. And then the second aspect, and, and there again, the seed is on our first mission, is uh, it's not only agencies that are hitching a ride with us. We have four uh, private companies that we're servicing one non-space, three space companies, um, and that's really what we want to see uh, you know, expand and go forward is the involvement of the private sector, because that will be the engine going forward. You know, uh, governments have a role to play to get us going, uh, get us walking, like uh, Mr. Oron said this morning, you know, to help us walking. But really to gain speed um, and, uh, and remain at that speed, we need private sector to, to become interested and uh, develop the business models. So we'd like to see personally all business models that we have currently on Earth from exploration, construction, logistics, entertainment, you know, have a place on the moon uh, in the next uh, 30 years. Who's next? Guys, uh, jump. Oh, and go for it. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, so I'm very excited about 50 years uh, from now. I hope to still be around. Uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, trying to keep healthy for that. But uh, regarding my general uh, vision is that uh, on the moon and on Mars, we're going to have permanent uh, presence of uh, man and womankind living in harmony, without borders, without conflict, that uh, we learn from our mistakes here on Earth when we settle uh, those places, and we don't replicate the the template of countries, you know, uh, fighting over resources. So that, that's my general vision. How do we uh, uh, fit in uh, that vision? So we're a small but very important part of being able to live in deep space. And that's uh, your health, your safety, personal protection from radiation in that harsh environment. So in 50 years time, it's gonna be probably the eighth iteration of Astorad. Okay, it's gonna be, uh, now we're at the first iteration which I was very proud to fly on Orion, uh, and thank you, Kathy, for enabling that. And we also flew on the ISS, and we learned so much. So now we're making the second iteration as we speak. So we'll be at the eighth iteration, I imagine. And that iteration is not only going to be uh, super, super protective and ergonomic, using the best and latest materials, it's also going to be 100% made in space. Okay, You won't have to launch anything from the surface of Earth. It's all going to be made, recycled from a material present in where the settlement is, and specifically uh, waste material. Plastic waste material is actually ideal for radiation protection. Uh, polyethylene is what we're using anyway, and it's in 50% of the trash. Currently, it's packaging material highly rich in polyethylene. We're working with red wire space to take that trash, to grind it down, recycle it, and print 
And we've done three successful prints on station already using trash. And now you can see it uh, in our booth uh, in real time. So that's my vision. And uh, next. <laughs> yeah, my uh, vision for 2050 is that on the morning we'll have two synagogues. Because we'll have there at least one Jew. He needs a synagogue to go, to, to go there and one synagogue never to go there. But, you know, the trivial, the trivial answer for 2050, I think, a gateway to uh, Mars and other planets is trivial. Some habitats with uh, local manufacturing capability for sustainability is something that's trivial. If we take it more wild in, in the vision, I see um, a lot of tourism going to the moon in 2050. I can envision uh, a hotel, a, a shopping mall for souvenirs, and also sightseeing tours around the hotel for people coming uh, from, from Earth. If we will go more wild, uh, I can see maybe the moon as a, a data or a storage for DNA and organisms from Earth in case that we'll have to restart Earth, could be. And also some great minds can think of military use of the moon, I hope not, but I believe that in the next 20, 30, 40 years, some people will think about it. And we have to be aware of it. Okay, um, my opinion is more down to, uh, not Earth, but uh, lunar surface. And I'll answer both as uh, Goliath, as you called me, and as uh, David. As David, uh, I think uh, we as a small country can join the forward to moon surge uh, that will be uh, driven by the big powers. And uh, what we will be uh, able to offer them is services for the new frontiers. So Levi Jeans is already uh, occupied here. Uh, but uh, we can open uh, lots for uh, building materials and uh, we can offer uh, um, surveying services, uh, remote sensing uh, services, and uh, this will be achieved by uh, acting as a benevolent uh, Goliath to the uh, ample Israeli startups. Uh, we have uh, several very um, deep thinking and uh, highly uh, technologically rooted uh, startups dealing with uh, remote sensing. One of them within AI with a, a very interesting uh, SAR system, others with uh, hyperspectral uh, uh, systems. And uh, if we can uh, join that with the uh, uh, longevity of our satellites, I think we can provide a very interesting service of uh, studying the moon, mapping it uh, for the uh, uh, actual settlers who will be the, the biggest uh, forces. And after that, maybe uh, provide some more uh, uh, on-surface uh, services with new ideas that we can test on small uh, landers like uh, iSpace is uh, doing now, like we were uh, offering to CLIPS and to many other uh, programs. Thank you. Let's see if I could expand a little bit on what one of my colleagues said earlier um, when he made reference to low Earth orbit. I see a future that is similar to how low Earth orbit has evolved, where initially it started out as mostly governments who were investing and providing resources and really laying the infrastructure for both transportation but also habitation in low Earth orbit that now is being evolved into commercial endeavors. You're seeing more and more commercial space companies venturing into low Earth orbit both doing tourism but also conducting scientific experiments as well as research and really inspiring that next generation. I see that kind of evolution happening on the lunar surface as well where we have um, big Goliath countries but also smaller countries investing in putting the infrastructure in place on the lunar surface that can then eventually evolve to having more industry partners and academia partners. And then of course my goal is always on Mars and making sure that 50 years from now my children are up here on a stage talking about the first missions to Mars and what we've learned there and how we have evolved as a species as a result of what we've learned. 
I think that we have a, a couple of phases. One is uh, we will be back on the moon a few years from now. So Artemis 3 will be a, a, a landmark in this respect. But then I think that we need still to work a lot to make this back to the moon a permanent base. Because this is the difference, I mean, compared to the 50 years uh, ago. And I think that uh, looking to the next 10, 15 years, this is the basic foundation, how to have permanent pressurized structure, how to learn to be protected uh, by radiation. But then, all the elements that we need for a permanent base, which is in situ resources, uh, how to use robot and machines, cognitive machine to help some, the first few astronauts that will be on a permanent base, how to generate energy, how to distribute energy. So I'm not sure that, uh, let's say, the so-called lunar economy will be really so fast in the commercial wave, exactly as you said. And I'm sure that what we are going to see in the low Earth orbit in terms of commercial will, will give us uh, let's say, the idea how fast will be a true lunar economy. I think that we still have a lot of science and a lot of institutional duties to, to, to establish a permanent base on the moon and make of the moon the kind of global exploration lab that we need to go behind. Can I react to this? Because um, I think the way you asked the question with 2050 as the anchor date, the premise behind it is that the lunar economy, lunar development will, take, will happen very slowly and much slower than uh, commercialization of LEO. Um, I think that is, that is not the right perspective. Um, if you look at in-space manufacturing, service debris, um, debris removal, those types of markets are also emerging, I would say the lunar economy is about at the same maturity level or even beyond. You know, we have... Uh, Eight companies that have, you know, with whom we have contracts for our Hakutoa partnership, so all non-space companies that are supporting our first two missions. So that's eight contracts, seven contracts for M1 that we're servicing, more contracts on M2, M3. If you take that, you add the contracts from Intuitive Machines, Astrobotic, our competition, um, that's a lot of contracts. And to my knowledge, it's hard to find that many contracts in in-space manufacturing or debris removal. So I would like to challenge everybody to think, you know, the moon economy is at the same level of maturity and pace of development as any of those LEO markets, space tourism included. So let me remove that 2050 barrier. And let's say that in the next 20, 30, 40 years, the government, the governments have done their job and they've put in place the infrastructure and put in place the capabilities like they do in all other big businesses. Then, is there money to be made on the moon? Not to return the investment on the infrastructure, that will never happen. But to make actual private missions possible. Those that are not government funded commercial missions. That's a great way for the government to make it more efficient and cheaper. But are there going to be actual things where we get a return on investment on the moon or on Mars in 30, 40, 50 years? Is it worthwhile to go there, not just for the science, but because there is dirty word, I know, money to be made there? Who wants to go? I think uh, definitely, and I referred to that uh, previously, we're going to, uh, and, and most of the panel referred to that, uh, being able to extract uh, uh, materials and build outside the scope of uh, gravity will be several orders of magnitude more efficient than to produce on Earth and ship it. And since the powers are going out, and they will need uh, uh, companies that will build and provide them robots, materials, uh, uh, um, propulsion systems, 
And I, I really believe that will turn uh, into an economy uh, by itself. Like, uh, like launchers uh, becoming a private business, uh, actually assembling them and extracting mo most of the uh, uh, ingredients for this assembly on th from the lunar surface. Well, I spoke before about the uh, uh, tourism issue. It could be uh, beneficial or uh, economic um, for, um, for doing business or other than exploration. Um, and also, if we'll find uh, very specific or special materials on the moon that have uh, added value to bring to Earth, because of the quality or precious materials. This is something that can make sense in terms of economy. Other than that, I believe that it's more investment than making money. And he's, he's from the startup, I'm from the corporate. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think uh, that uh, the focus of, of uh, making money is, is incorrect. Okay, so why are we doing space? We're doing it for inspiration. We're doing it for love, okay, for ourselves, you know. How hard can we work? Just money, money, money. What about enjoyment, okay? So why is everybody here? To hear about money? No, to hear about dreams, okay? So I think we earned, you know, the, the benefit of, of, you know, having dreams, having inspiration. And I think this is a delivery time, okay? We have the technology. We have uh, the commitment. People are willing to work for free almost in the space industry, literally, okay? They just want to be a part of it. So, and why? Uh, for the passion. So keep driving that passion, but at the same time, we need to remain realistic. So companies such as ours maybe won't make a lot of money in space, but they will try not to lose money in space, okay? And for us not to lose money, then we need to be able to develop solutions that are necessary for space agencies, uh, for bigger companies. And to develop those solutions, uh, we need some kind of support. So space agencies uh, can provide support, but also uh, cross-national and cross-industrial uh, platforms can provide that support. And uh, we're an example of having used both of those uh, resources to propel our products uh, forward, and in doing so, not uh, losing uh, money, maybe even making a bit. Uh, but for, in our case, everything was possible uh, mostly due to our on-Earth applications. So on-Earth applications of our nuclear and medical endeavors uh, were able to uh, provide enough relief for our investor base, okay, and give me enough time to focus on the space endeavor, even in the absence of immediate uh, profitable uh, returns. So. Thank you. Um, I think inspiration and money can, can go together. Um, I hope our landing in April will serve as the uh, Apollo moment for, for the next generation of, um, you know, of explorers. Um, and there's a role for commercial companies like iSpace and everyone else here to really accelerate development and, and show that there's other paths to have an impact than, than just joining a big space agency. Um, in terms of economic viability, I mean, that's, that's our goal. That's what we're, we're here to do and demonstrate. And um, when I see, you know, some companies that are here, uh, Helios wanting to, you know, turn regolith into uh, oxygen, WeSpace wanting to do surface-to-surface, -surface, uh, you know, transportation, other downstream companies that did not exist when we started 10 years ago, but that are now positioning themselves on telecommunications, power, logistics. Um, that's what gives me hope that we're really on a good track and making progress. I have a little bit different perspective. I mean, we are building right now Sinus number 23, 24. So it's the cargo, unmanned cargo, that's putting a lot of material, a lot of tons back and forward to the space station. So I would love that uh, we build up 100, 150, 200 those cargo models uh, to the moon because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's our business. But on the other hand, I think that uh, if we go behind to 50, uh, 2050, as you said. For sure, we have an economy. For sure, the, the use of the local resources, the in situ lunar resources, has a huge economic impact. But I think that we should take in mind that all of that cannot be just money and return of investment. We need to make something which is sustainable. 
We have a panel before here that's about the climate change and the Earth observation. Of course, it's extremely inspirational to go to the moon, and I agree with you. I don't think that we should have just the symbol of the euros or the dollars in mind, but we have a priority to have this planet sustainable without a sustainable Earth. It's difficult to think about how to be in the future of 100, 150, 200 years. And second, I really believe that it's not just a technology uh, angle. We need to have a sustainable lunar exploration. If we think that just uh, the economic value will drive the exploration, I'm not sure that is the right path, but that's my personal opinion. So I just have one thought I would add. We may or may not make money in space, but I'm convinced we will make money from space. And by that I mean the spin-off technologies, the activities that we conduct in space will help foster the development of economies here on Earth. I think that's a great vision. You're about three to two against making money in space, just so we sort of tally that. Uh, unfortunately, and I, we're actually four against two because I don't think there's money to be made in deep space either. Uh, but I do think it's worth the government expenditure. And one. We can't lose money. We can't lose money. But to try and make money, I think that that's. <laughs> so, one of the things that everyone I think agrees on that this is a tremendous way of, of getting kids excited about STEM education. So, I'd like to hear a little bit from each one on what you're actually doing. We've got about four minutes left, so uh, what you're doing, what your organization doing, what you personally are doing, some experiences you've got with your kid, give us a bit of excitement for the kids. Well, let's see, uh, over 50 years ago, I was personally inspired by watching the first lunar landings by Apollo, and so it is my goal to inspire the next generation of students similarly to how I was inspired with the Artemis activities. Yeah, I think the, the, the STEM is extremely important, and we have, uh, I would say, daily activities really to make what we do an inspiration for the young generation. It's extremely important. Uh, my personal motivation for joining the, the space industry was the uh, Sojourner uh, rover in 1997. Um, and so again, I hope that seeing our lander land uh, in April uh, will inspire many more people uh, to do this, and not only from the U.S., but globally. Um, in addition to this, of course, we, you know, we open our mission control centers in, uh, in Japan, in Europe, uh, to school children. We do a lot of engagement with the community, so, um, and we look forward to continue that. Thank you. So I think uh, space is one of those things where people are drawn to it uh, naturally, as opposed to, to math and chemistry. You know, it's kind of almost like basketball or football. Just open the doors, they'll come in. Okay, and um, we just have to keep doing what we're doing, and, and they will come. We have to keep the doors open and engage and talk and uh, take interns all the time, regardless of profit once again. You know, you need that energy, the young energy, the young blood. And uh, I think uh, this is the best thing about uh, this industry is, is what, what a following it has compared to its size. Yeah, so. We at uh, Space IL define the, um, the product that we do, not a spacecraft, we do inspiration. So this is our goal. And the way to do it, uh, in addition to having an exciting mission, is to connect the young children, the next generation to the mission, by providing them the information about the mission, connected to the mission, and after we take off and make the mission, we plan in our program and our plan to deliver and all the data coming from the orbiter and the landers uh, to the children directly in a way that they can feel that are, they are handling and uh, connected, connected to a real spacecraft around the moon. It's not a simulator. So we have all of the telemetry, all the uh, payloads, uh, information, everything will tailor a, a very a huge educational program and project for the children to analyze the data and do some their own research on that. 
And this is the way that I, we think that we can inspire and connect the next generation to space. I completely agree here uh, that uh, space uh, as an uh, extra curricular activity is great. Um, what we do at uh, IAI is uh, uh, new spaces opening doors to a lot of reach out uh, programs uh, involving kids uh, with what we do up to the level of uh, having them uh, uh, participate in uh, war groups and uh, build uh, uh, small satellites in uh, the future, which is uh, what we're driving now and supporting our uh, uh, customers, whether uh, Space IL or other scientific programs uh, in uh, the accessibility of the information, data, and the programs to kids. I think Bereshit did a fantastic job in Israel of getting hundreds of thousands of kids excited about space. And three years later, we can still see that ongoing. The amount of activities going on, educational activities, this week, Space Week, is incredible. There are, I think, a couple of thousand kids yesterday in Jerusalem being judged on their space projects. There are tens of institutions around Israel this week doing space activities. I was doing a prep call with Kathy's team, and I had my grandson, four years old, sitting on my lap. He was wearing a shirt by chance when I walked in. I, it wasn't planned. With Orion and the SLS on it, I, I put him on my knees for Kathy's team to see that Orion got all the way to Israel, not just to the moon. So kids are excited. I think it's one of the important things. I think we do have, as a takeaway from this, a tremendous vision of what can happen on the moon and in Mars, tremendous enthusiasm that waned 50 years back and is back on track now. Not so sure about whether it is economically sustainable. I think that's one of our biggest challenges, ours, the space industry, the space community, to convince our governments that this is worth the investment, worth the effort, and our countries will all look much better to it. Let's have some great space exploration. Thank you very much, panel members. So let's take a lunch break and meet back here at 2 o'clock for a very interesting second half of the day. Bon appétit, everyone. Hello again, everyone. I hope you had a, a good lunch and managed to talk to some interesting people. And now I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Ron Tomer, President of the Manufacturers Association of Israel, for a short greeting that will kickstart our second half of the day. Good afternoon, everybody. I didn't have the pleasure to get an X, so I'll speak to you from the podium. Don't know about this light, but if somebody can just dim them a bit, because I just see nothing. Oh, thank you very much. Dear Uri Aron, uh, the head of the Israeli Space Agency, all other esteemed guests, which I would not call you all by names and colleagues here, space a territory that until recently was reached mainly by governmental bodies and security organization has become open, open to and much more accessible, I would say, to many civilian and commercial enterprises. I can mention what you all know, SpaceX, of course, which was the entry of Elon Musk into the private uh, space in the inno innovation and incentives, which followed by many others that came after and actually make it uh, much more Okay, open, acceptable, and engaged by the private sector, and it was followed by a dramatic reduce of cost, which allow many more companies to enter. 
The space market uh, last year was estimated in $470 billion dollars and is estimated to grow by 2030 to a, <coughs> sorry, to a $1 trillion, dollars, meaning an average of 10% growth every year. The Israeli space market, space arena, is well established by some very pronounced and known companies like IAI, Elbit, Binat, Rafael, but now there are more than 60 other companies which are operating in space exploration related fields. It's estimated that by 2030, it will employ over 20,000 employees directly in those space industries here in Israel. The Manufacturing Association of Israel, which is the home for different industries, is involved very much in, in improving the industry, in pushing innovation and advanced technologies. We don't see any more uh, industries as low-tech, middle-tech, high-tech. We see every industry as a possibility, of course, to include some very advanced measures inside. And definitely for the space industry, which is one of the top of the head industries, like many other high tech, hardware, software, cyber, we see us as a home that can actually accommodate and, and support them very much in many of our umbrella services. I'm happy and pleased to announce today what we call the Space 5.0 project. When we decide to call it 5.0, people ask us, why is space 5.0? So if you're all aware, there is, the, of course, all the activities called Industry 4.0, which is the next generation of activity in many fields. And we thought that space is always one step ahead, maybe I would say one step high, in that case, to, to add the digit to 5.0 to the project, which is include the, uh, strategic cooperation between the Israeli Space Agency, led by Uri Oron, and our high-tech branch uh, in the Manufacturing Association, which is the fastest growing branch uh, in the association, led by my friend and colleague, Mr. Marian Cohen. Uh, Space 5.0 will work to lead the ecosystem uh, of the civil industry. We will give different services to the space Israeli companies, from helping them with the regulatory challenge, technology incubators, knowledge center, space ecosystem, and collaboration with many other countries, which we have a very firm and strong foreign affairs units to do. Uh, the, 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 the Space 5.0 project will be part of our ITEC uh, branch and will be uh, coordinated by Mr. Hilik Sion, which is present here in, in, in the arena. I wish everyone uh, success in this measure, and I call for all companies in this field to come and join us to make this joint effort successful and to push the Israeli space uh, industry forward, upward, wideward, anywhere else you can imagine it can go through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomer. He's one of the founders of the Elon Ramon International Space Conference, and every year since its inception, he joins us on stage to summarize the milestones of the past year in space. Mr. Talin Bar is a space analyst and consultant. He covers space issues such as space policy and technical assessments of foreign space and missile programs of Iran, North Korea, and China. He's a visiting scholar to RAND and the Washington Institute, an advisor to the Israel Space Agency on various issues, including space education. He was the head of the Space Research Center at the Fisher Institute for Air and Space Strategic Studies. Tal, the stage is yours. Much, uh, for the introduction. Uh, could I see the first slide, uh, please? I have a feeling that space is here to stay, and um, I can tell you from uh, 18 years of uh, participation in the Ilan Ramon Space Conference that uh, there are several aspects of the conference that are constant. Lack of sleep before the conference, and uh, a lot of space uh, news uh, hard to put uh, together into uh, one slide, which I cannot see uh, at the moment. So, please. Shall we take it, Okay.
Uh, sometimes it's easy to go into space than to uh, present here, but uh, this is coming from my time on the stage. So, uh, could we have the presentation, please? <clears throat> Not yet. I can give the presentation without the presentation, but it won't be the same. So, uh, someone, please. Hmm? Okay. So, uh, so uh, in the meantime, um, I won't be playing the piano. So, uh, um, I can tell you first uh, that uh, every year, and there are people in the audience that uh, probably heard me uh, in previous conferences, I, I can say every year the same thing. Wow, what a wonderful year it was. And first, I want to uh, uh, thank David for the translation, and he taught me. Wow, what a year uh, in space it was, and indeed 2022 was no, uh, not, not a, an exception to the rule. And I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about the number of space launches, meaning uh, how many countries uh, sent their spacecraft to uh, various op uh, orbits around the Earth, uh, newcomers into the space arena, uh, and some more issues, but we'll give it uh, one, one, one more try. Okay, so now I will start. Please restart the clock. Well, uh, 2022, wow, what a year it was. Uh, and indeed, it was a tremendous year. Uh, record number of launches and record number of satellites going into space. Just imagine last year, 2021, before this, uh, um, this year, uh, we had 135 launches worldwide. And uh, in 2022, 186 launchers uh, made it in, or tried to uh, made their voyage into space, in which uh, 178 launches were successful, one partial failure, seven failures. And we are living in a reality in which one launch vehicle doesn't equal one satellite or two satellites because we see uh, actually every, uh, almost every week dozens of satellites, from Star be it Starlink or any other satellites uh, that are climbing together into space. And if you look on the chart here, you can see that uh, the major part of the launchers uh, came, uh, that went to space came from the United States. And um, of 87 launchers, 61 were made by SpaceX, which is an amazing uh, achievement. And this year, 2023, might surpass the, follow, uh, the uh, previous year. And then China and Russia, and we had several launches from Europe, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, India, and one from Iran. And by the way, tomorrow uh, Iran might launch something, or in the, in the next uh, few days. They do it uh, every year. I know that the, I think that they want to be included in, in the conference. So uh, we might see another launch from Iran soon. Most of the satellites are traveling into low Earth orbit. 
other, of course, to GSO and GTO, and some special orbits like we heard about uh, ISIS, uh, not ISIS, um, ISPACE, for example, uh, going to a lunar um, mission. Four new countries built their own first satellite, and all of those satellites were launched into space by other uh, means of transportation, a commercial one. And we see now Armenia, Moldova, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, the new uh, four countries, to have their own national satellite. So that brings us to about 80 nations in the world who possess their own satellites, uh, which is very good, but there are still one, 120 or something uh, countries without satellites, so we have space to grow uh, for sure. Uh, several launchers were retired last year, uh, one version of, or uh, several versions of uh, Atlas V and Rocket 3 by Astra, which again, it's a new, new space company building small launch vehicle. And we saw uh, an amazing uh, number of new launch vehicles, uh, many from China, and the world's first uh, Metan and LOX uh, propelled launch vehicle. Actually, it didn't make it into space, but uh, there was a guidance issue and not uh, something related to the propulsion system. And we have uh, several, uh, this is actually the average number, uh, we have several, seven uh, uh, crewed missions, uh, three by uh, uh, Dragon spacecraft from SpaceX. Of course, one is uh, AX-1, we heard uh, about it uh, earlier, two Soyuz from uh, uh, Russia, and two Shenzhou mission, uh, missions from China, and several more, actually just three suborbital this is space tourism, uh, rather than uh, research in uh, microgravity and so. Uh, and there was a malfunction in the fourth launch, which was unmanned, so now it's on hold. So if you have uh, already bought your tickets, uh, it, it might take some time. Those, of course, are by uh, Blue Origin. And Artemis Accords, we heard a lot about it uh, today, and this is a very important milestone and there are some people in the room who worked uh, tremendously hard to achieve this goal, and it was uh, uh, a manifestation of the trust that NASA gives to Israeli capabilities, and uh, we will see what uh, the future will um, uh, usher for us in terms of cooperation and collaboration to the moon in human spaceflight, not just uh, robotic uh, exploration. And we saw the first uh, successful uh, mission of a new type of spacecraft, which will be launched this year with a crew. This is Boeing's Dreamliner, and it was successfully launched and docked with the International Space Station. And this was another great achievement by NASA, the DART mission. This is the first step towards uh, planetary protection against asteroids. So this is not operational system yet. So we might call Bruce Willis to the help and uh, to divert asteroids. But this is, a, a, again, a scientific milestone, technological milestone, because NASA managed to divert an asteroid from its orbit. And it is uh, uh, tremendously important uh, for the future. And I saw Ethan uh, was there. So we had another. Uh, a great uh, achievement for um, Israeli science and uh, outreach. And we heard from the uh, members of the mission, the AX-1 mission, uh, this is a demonstration of what a civilian science can do uh, in terms of uh, influential mission um, and educational, and of course, real science, not just, uh, let's say, playing with some toys in space. And this was I believe just the first step um, for the Rakia uh, mission, and uh, we will see hopefully much more in the years to come. And I think that uh, th those pictures uh, need some uh, applause because uh, this was amazing, amazing mission. And tomorrow we will hear about some issues related to black holes and astrophysics uh, at the scientific uh, um, uh, gathering here. But James Webb is really a remarkable machine. Again, uh, uh, a huge project led by NASA and the European Space Agency. Uh, 
So this was again this year. And China launched two new modules to its uh, orbiting uh, uh, space station, and they achieved a permanent uh, uh, capability to maintain people and crews on board the space station. And by the way, China said that they are open uh, for business, and just recently we heard that the European Space Agency said, well, not with Europeans, and the Americans said, not with your, uh, Americans. So uh, we can see that, of course, space is, uh, Christian, just, this is for you, space is connecting people, but uh, sometimes it divides them uh, due to political uh, aspects. And the moon is becoming more and more crowded. All those missions were launched in 2022. We see the capstone from NASA, uh, by the way, launched on top of an electron launch vehicle. Again, it started uh, like a startup in New Zealand. And Hakuto R, which is uh, the lander from Japan, uh, from iSpace, carrying the Rashid rover made in Dubai. And some people here uh, had the chance to, to see um, in person the, this rover during the IAC 2021 held in Dubai. And uh, another orbiting uh, spacecraft around the moon from Korea. So it is crowded. It will be much more crowded in the near future with the combination, which I, I think it's the best, uh, of uh, commercial space, entrepreneurial space, and of course, there is still room for space agencies uh, to operate in, 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 in the space domain. And those are the two last final for good uh, picture from the InSight Mars mission. And you can see the situation on the solar panels here. And there are no mechanisms to uh, uh, clean all the dust and sand. So uh, we won't see any more pictures or getting new data from this uh, lander, but it was a hugely successful mission, uh, uh, twice the duration that NASA planned. Uh, very good insight to the underground of Mars and to analyze the seismic activities uh, on, those, on this uh, planet. SLS, what can I say? Uh, we saw it, uh, by the way, I, I, I mentioned it to uh, Bob Cabana two days ago, or yesterday, actually, when I visited Kennedy Space Center in 2016, uh, and he was my personal guide at, at this uh, facility, and we uh, said to each other, well, next year we are going to see the launch, 2017. So it took some, some time, but again, an amazing mission, and we are all looking forward to Artemis 2, and specifically to Artemis 3, the first lunar landing with people inside the spacecraft since Apollo 7, uh, 17 in 1972. I'm not going into details about the difficult or challenging uh, way of uh, getting some funds from uh, private uh, investors and uh, the other issues of uh, how to finance the space business. This is something that uh, will be discussed here and in the next uh, uh, conference, uh, I believe. Uh, but it is becoming uh, Hard. So, this is something for next year to um, think about. The first commercial space war, the war in Ukraine, showed us the power of private and commercial space assets from commercially available remote sensing satellite giving targets to Ukraine to cyber operations of Russia against American uh, um, satellites like those of Starlink to the removal, this is unheard of, removing satellites just days before, days before uh, the launch from uh, Baikonur in Kazakhstan, uh, the satellites of uh, OneWeb. And to my knowledge, they are still in Russia. So, or at least in Kazakhstan, in Russian hands. And we saw, for example, another uh, implication of the war. Um, there is a mission by the European Space Agency in which Russia was supposed to build the lander, and now the future of the mission is uh, unclear, at least uh, uh, for, for the moment. And of course, denial of uh, engine supply to the, uh, the US, but we know that this year we might see 
the first launch of the Vulcan launch vehicle with BE-4 by uh, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos. And of course, this is uh, again something very new. Uh, one person, of course, uh, his, uh, let's say, his pockets are deeper than mine, but uh, he is uh, fighting against the Russian capabilities of uh, deny, uh, deniability of uh, internet access and so on, and we heard that the Ukrainians are also using this system not just for communication, but for navigation. So this is something uh, that we never, uh, never thought uh, we are going to see, how the private sector is playing an uh, ever more important role in the warfare on the ground. And the last uh, item on the agenda for 2022, actually it was December 30th, the last launch of uh, 2022 uh, was of an Israeli remote sensing satellite, very sophisticated satellite with color capabilities in high resolution. And hopefully very soon we will be able to see the uh, true potential and uh, the capabilities of this satellite, which uh, was built by IAI and owned and operated by ISI ImageSat uh, International. So, I see that I have 30, 30 seconds, I will uh, give them back to you, and uh, hopefully we will see uh, each and every one of you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tal. Now that we've heard about the growth and investment in the space sector in the past year, Let's talk about navigating the investment landscape of the new space revolution. To lead this panel, I'm honored to invite Ms. Emma Vardimon, Director of Global Partnerships at Startup Nations Central. Joining her at the panel are Ms. Casey Swales, Deputy Associate Administrator for Business Operations at NASA. Mr. Doron Zauer, General Partner at Earth and Beyond Ventures. Mr. Tzvika Goldsman, Acting VP Growth Division at the Israel Innovation Authority, and Ms. Renana Ashkenazi, General Partner at Grow Ventures, and Ms. Lynn Zoinen, Principal and Managing Director at Alpine Space Ventures. Bevakasha. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be on this stage, not only as the Director of Global Partnership at Startup Nation Central, a non-profit organization that is uh, connecting Israeli innovation to the world, but also with my second hat as one of the founding members of uh, We Space, Women in Space, an organization that is promoting uh, gender equity in the Israeli space sector. The Israeli tech ecosystem is well known to pivot easily when an interesting challenge is presented. I sit on a daily basis with senior directors and managers from multinational corporations that are coming to Israel in order to harness this agility to their needs. Our purpose here today is to hear about new trends and enable you to identify potential growth engine and investment. I'm happy to introduce our distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Doron Zauer, general partner at Earth and Beyond Ventures. Doron Zauer is an experienced investor, director and entrepreneur focused on the Israeli technology market. He is a co-founder at Earth and Beyond Ventures, an Israeli early stage Israeli VC fund, investing in deep tech and new space technologies in partnership with the Israeli Innovation Authority. Lynn Zonen, Managing Director of Alpine Space Ventures, a new space-focused VC fund from Germany. Before joining the investor side, Lynn built her career in the new space startup ecosystem in Luxembourg. Casey Swales, Deputy Associate Administrator for Business Operation at NASA. In her role, Casey leads and integrates mission support functions across the agency builds and advances the agency's industry partnerships and act as the deputy and principal advisor to the associate administrator on overall day-to-day -day operation and NASA's long-term strategic direction. <coughs> Renana Ashkenazi, general partner at Grove Ventures, a leading Israeli VC empowering early stage company to shape the future of the world through cutting edge technology. Prior to Grover and I work at Applied Materials in product and technical management roles. 
Tzvika Goldsman, VP Growth Division at Israeli Innovation Authority. Tzvika Goldsman is an experienced manager and entrepreneur with expertise in innovative technologies and multidisciplinary projects in the medical devices and the defense high-tech industries. Welcome all, thank you for joining us. First, as I said, as my second hat as uh, one of the board members of WeSpace, I'm very pleased to see that we have three women in an investment panel, so <laughs> kudos <laughs> for the organizer. So, Lynn, I would like to kickstart with you as you bring us uh, the global perspective of the investment. 2021 was a great year for space investment with, you know, over 15 billion raised. Out of that, 69% was from VC, which was a, a good growth from uh, previous year. Uh, 2022 is a bit different caused by the global economic situation, but I would like to see how at uh, Alpine uh, you see uh, what are the most promising areas of investment in the space industry right now. Thank you, Emma. So um, <clears throat> maybe just some uh, brief context on Alpine Space Ventures. Um, Alpine Space Ventures is, as Emma said, a new space focused venture capital fund, which was founded by Bülent Altan, who's the former chief engineer uh, of Starlink. Um, he then brought in Hans Königsmann, the former chief engineer at SpaceX, and their right hand, Katrina Chambers. Um, we do not invest into launch uh, with our fund. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in launch and space transportation in general. Um, but in, with, with our fund, we're focusing on two verticals where we see immediate market demand, and those two verticals are connectivity and data. So we've seen it in the, in the previous presentation. Um, I think if the Ukrainian crisis has shown us something on, on the sp in, in terms of needs of space technology, then it is really that satellite connectivity has become the backup option when terrestrial network networks become targets. So um, that's where we really want to focus on uh, connectivity with our funds. Um, we think that there are many uh, different applications. We um, see uh, an emerging competition in direct-to-cell communication. We think that satellite IoT will be a huge growth driver across many different industries. Just two weeks ago, we hosted an event which was attended by all the major German car makers who look into satellite internet because they are interested in anything around in-car entertainment, real-time hazard warnings, uh, predictive maintenance, supporting the use of autonomous driving. Um, and um, so I, I do think that uh, there is a real case for satellite uh, connectivity constellations supporting more than half of the industry's growth by 2040. And then the second um, area that we're covering with Alpine Space Ventures is uh, data, so Earth observation data, which again is an area where we think that there is a lot of, lot of cross fertilization with terrestrial industries. Um, we, well, I think we're going to talk about the, the different use cases later on, but these are the two areas where we see the strongest growth at the moment. Thank you. They're only with uh, Earth and Beyond, an early stage uh, uh, venture that is investing in uh, dual application uh, companies. Uh, how do you think the growing commercialization of space will impact the investments? Thanks, Emma. So um, I guess the simple answer is that, that now there's a market um, where there hasn't been in the past, but maybe, maybe I can complete the picture. Um, so historically, everybody knows there's been a bit of an issue with how much deal flow there is in space, um, getting entrepreneurs to focus efforts on, on bringing innovation to the space industries. That not mean maybe enough investors investing in space, and that's kind of a, a, a vicious circle. Um, but may, maybe the base reason for that is, is there hasn't been enough money um, in it, and entrepreneurs go where the money is, where the revenues are. And space market in real terms, obviously, there's, there's revenue and there's a lot of money, but compared to some other um, more attractive industries that are more easily accessible, maybe uh, space hasn't been as attractive. Uh, other reasons, um, high barriers to entry, both, both in terms of CapEx in the past, strong legacy players, the US uh, prime contractors, and you know, all, all sorts of aerospace players that have been around for, for, for a long time. Um, time to market, uh, all sorts of things that entrepreneurs don't like, VC funds don't like. Um, and I think that's been the reason why in the past that there's been a, a, an issue with opportunities or investment opportunities in the space industries. Um, what's changed recently? 
uh, space is becoming commercialized, as you say, and, and what are the reasons or the, the trends? The trends are a movement from government defense to, to the private hands and, and more commercial applications from uh, the space industry. Um, probably been spoken about a lot, uh, lowering launch costs and, 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 and SpaceX and, and other competitors of theirs. Um, smaller satellites, smaller payloads, cheaper satellites, cheaper payloads, we can do more with less suddenly. Um, and this is creating a big market, and there are different statistics out of it uh, uh, about that, up to 30 or $50 trillion in, over the next decade. Um, and it's creating opportunity, and, and investors and, 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 and uh, entrepreneurs, they go where the opportunities are. Um, and, uh, and that's probably across the different space segments, the, uh, the upstream, building the assets, sending them into space, each of them needs components, subcomponents, which means that there are opportunities for innovation and, and technology advancements. Um, Midstream operating the assets in space, also a lot of, uh, a lot of different opportunities there and innovation that's required. Um, even new things like feeding astronauts in space, digital health and, and keeping them healthy in space, all sorts of things that are going to become relevant over the next uh, five years or so. Um, and, and then probably the biggest growth, growth part of it is uh, downstream applications of all these new and wonderful and, and thousands and tens of thousands of satellites that are going into space over the next few years. Um, suddenly entrepreneurs might think of ways to to bring applications uh, from all these uh, different payloads and, and assets in space, and um, you know, it can be climate tech, solving food challenges, all, all sorts of different things. So I guess uh, a long way to answer, there's a, suddenly a market. Thanks. So we're talking about you know, Earth to space, we're talking about deep tech, and uh, Renana is a leading investor in deep tech. What proportion of the startup that you see have the potential to utilize their technology to solve new space challenges? I wish I had a quantitative answer, um, but if you think about the whole commercialization of space, then it was mostly defined, all of it historically has been defined for, by uh, space for Earth applications, right? Space tech or space-based technologies that were used uh, for products or services here on Earth. And now we're starting to see more and more not a lot, okay? You're asking about a number. I don't want to put a number because it's depressing. But we're starting to see more and more technologies that are being used here that could be relevant for uh, space. And maybe the most interesting one is everything that has to do with uh, in-space manufacturing, right? Uh, and that has a ton of potential for various use cases. For example, you know, everything that you launch is constricted by weight simply because whatever you, 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 want to, uh, you want to launch is, A, it's gonna be uh, more expensive the heavier it is, and also it correlates directly to the power of the rocket that actually launches it, right? So we have an inherent constriction. And all of a sudden, you can start thinking about sending parts or raw materials that are so much more, that are so much smaller than what you could have sent, or so much, uh, they could be so much larger when uh, constructed in space than what they could have been pre-constructed here. So we're starting to see technologies that are relevant for Earth that are being used and deployed for space applications. But, you know, if we're talking about the fact that space technology, space products, say space services are long-term, then I think that what you're talking about, Earth technologies relevant for space are probably the longer um, the, the ones with the, with the longer horizon. Yeah, yeah. actually, it's, it's raising the awareness of the challenges and the new opportunities that are there that startups that are not, you know, defining themselves as space uh, will, you know, turn to that uh, challenge and, and try to... Uh, challenges? No, no challenges. What challenges, no challenges are you talking just about? Just opportunities. <laughs> we turn to, to that so opportunities. Um, so... As you said also, Doron, you know, uh, for investor, you're always looking uh, for uh, the long-term investment. It's, it's heavy and you have to have a client. And the first client that uh, still the, the, the forefront client is NASA today. I think they're one of the main clients uh, in the sector. And uh, I would like to ask you, Casey, uh, in practice, and I've heard that there are a lot of entrepreneurs and people in the, in the audience that would like to know, in practice, how does NASA work with such startup, uh, knowing that there are at different phases, you know, of uh, development, maturity from the likes of Boeing and SpaceX? So, what is the, how could they approach you, and how you work with them? 
Yeah, well, thanks. And first off, I just, I just want to say it's great to be in Israel. Um, I've actually, I knew it was a startup hub, but I didn't know quite how much until I got here. So this is my first time here, uh, my 77th country, so it'll be a memorable one. Um, but uh, it's really interesting when you talk about it that way, and NASA kind of is this primary investor, because I'll say that's really been an evolution for us, you know, over the last uh, particularly decade or so. So I'm going on my 19th year at the agency, and the last decade has really taken a huge shift uh, for just how we operate. And it's funny, you said, how do we do it differently than companies like SpaceX, implying that's, you know, a large company. There's many people at the agency that were still around when SpaceX was a startup itself. Um, and I look even today, you know, companies like Axiom that it just in the last, I think they started in 2016, or I ran into one of my iSpace colleagues if uh, he's in the audience, and uh, we recently signed an agreement with them. Um, so this has been a big shift for us going through just major um, contracts for players that have been around the industry for a long time. And one of the questions when uh, Duran and I were talking down there, he asked me, he said, hey, have you had a lot of your workforce, you kind of shift to going kind of in and out um, to industry and coming back? And I said, well, interestingly enough, that's actually been a shift. You know, this is starting to impact even how do we look at our workforce models um, in the future so that people feel like they can boomerang. Um, historically, I would say we haven't had a lot of attrition. You know, our attrition across the agency runs somewhere between three and 5%. So you don't have a lot of those skills that have, you know, gone to the private sector and have come back. And you hear the conversation around old space versus new space. Well, there's a lot of players that were around, you know, before we were operating in a startup type environment. Um, and really how that's impacted us is thinking differently around our internal operations. So how do you interact differently with these companies than you do some of the larger ones that have essentially large machines where um, they can spend, you know, kind of months on uh, proposal teams and they have large shops to do that. Now you go and you work with some of the startups and they're like, I don't have six months to execute an agreement. I mean, we might be out of business by then if we don't get through our Series A. So um, that's something that we've had to spend a lot of time talking about is how do we keep now at the pace of industry? And you heard on the heads of agency panel, they talked about that and kind of the speed and the pace at which this industry needs to move. Um, and how do we as the federal government kind of move at that pace? I will say historically, the federal government is not typically known for speed. Uh, so that's really been kind of pushing um, and looking at that differently. Um, we now, we spend around 80% of our total budget goes out the door in acquisitions. And so we're seeing more and more, um, you know, players pop up in the market. And so really thinking through how do you make sure you're still being mindful of the small businesses that really can offer innovations. And we're lucky we have a, we have a lot of different mechanisms to do that. Um, one is through um, SBIRs where we look at um, small business innovations. We have uh, technology transfer programs. Uh, we do prizes and challenges where we'll throw out a problem, say if we were trying to get, hey, a, a unique solution to a fastener, throw it out to our workforce and, you know, get different ideas coming back. Um, and the other uh, thing that I think that we're doing that's a little bit different because we're kind of in the shift of being the owner and operator, even how do we think about our big programs differently? Uh, so last week I was down in Florida with uh, Jim Free, who you heard from earlier, and um, Kathy Kerner, his deputy, and we're, we were really talking about the Moon to Mars architecture. And how do we even look at the architecture differently? Previously, NASA would be known for having all the capabilities how does that really shift to where we're taking an objectives-based approach to where we say, hey, here's what we need, here's where we're going, here's the things we want to accomplish, here's the gaps from what we have in the agency to what we need. Now, here they are, can you come to the table with where you can fit into that architecture? And so I really think that's the role that we're starting to play going forward is making sure we're being mindful around things that we can let go of and give to industry let it go so that we can focus on exploration and the, the areas where there's frankly just not an incentive in the private sector because there's no profit there. I don't know if it's some comfort, but I must say that in my daily work, I also sit, you know, with multinational and startups, and we see the gap of the culture and the governance between them. So it's not just NASA, it's, I think, 
every big organization with a small entity that has to to be able to find a good way to to work together and really to thrive from this uh, new spirit and new technology. Uh, Svika, we're getting to you. You are the genesis in Israel of stimulating space activity and investment. Uh, what do you see as the role of the Israeli government in this? And as a follow-up question also, what new trends do you find exciting for investment in this sector in your work? Yeah, um, thank you. A um, few words, uh, ju I'll just say a few words about the Israel Innovation Authority. Uh, we invest about uh, 2 uh, billion uh, shekels uh, annually in cutting-edge technologies. Three main principles, we don't dilute the entrepreneurs at all. Uh, we give them a conditional loan, meaning that in case they fail, they don't owe us anything. Uh, in case they do, they have to pay royalties in the future up to the amount they got from us. And we always uh, expect for a matching from the side of, the, of, of our... We are, we are never 100% of the, of the investment. Um, so uh, as for your question, um, it, 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 the, the space is... is the, this field is, is a real uh, challenge from the point of view of, uh, of the Israeli government due to the fact that Israel is, uh, we are quite a small country, um, and the space industry demands a huge amounts of money and for, for a long time. So it demands from us to try and find, even though we, we admire, we, we, we look for a technological risk, uh, to take a market risk is something that we can't afford in this case. So we look usually for the niches where we, we can see the market in, in this field. And if you ask me about the relevant uh, places, at least that we, we are seeking when we do the investment, because we do look for technological risk, but not for market risk. So uh, we know that Israel has a huge experience in, uh, in the defense sector, satellite, rockets, navigation, communication, system of systems both civil and uh, defense. Um, and then when we look for a reachable, feasible market in, in, the, in, the, in the horizon that we can, we can see, so, it's, so we uh, um, sort of components that uh, for microsatellites, remote sensing capabilities, uh, data processing, uh, ground station communication, and cyber are the fields which we are feel more comfortable and when we deal with the space industry. Um, I guess that sums it, yeah. unless I didn't answer it. No, no, it's okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to you, Doron. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, dual earth and space application. Uh, how do you see their role uh, today as we, we try to bring, you know, more investment and more money to fuel you know, this uh, very capex, opex, expensive uh, industry. How do you see this, them to, in expanding the pipeline of investor outside of the regular space circles? <laughs> um, thanks, Emma. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, take the opportunity to explain a little bit more about Earth and Beyond Ventures and what we do, and hopefully at the same time answer the question as well. Um, so, you gave a nice uh, brief introduction, but just a little bit more um, depth there. So, Earth and Beyond Ventures, we're a new, <coughs> a new VC fund. Uh, we've invested pre-seed stages. Our LPs are, um, a couple of the, uh, the distinguishing features about, about us is we have very involved LPs, um, strategic players. Um, the more notable ones are a Corning, a, a big US a material sciences company, Coasera, a, a big Japanese uh, electronics group. Um, and more uh, locally well-known uh, Spacecom, uh, a SATCOM operator. They're all very involved, supportive. They're not at kind of arm's length. They get involved in the DD, deal flow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the second distinguishing feature is that we have a very close partnership with the Israel Innovation Authority, um, which under one of their programs, under the incubator program, provides us with uh, all, all the portfolio companies where we deploy money. They provide match funding uh, alongside us. Um, another part of what we're doing is... Uh, we're working with industry partners and, uh, and the ISA to promote the local space tech ecosystem here. Um, and that kind of, uh, th that's expressed in industry events we hold, uh, 
trying to educate the local ecosystem or the entrepreneurs that space is a good market, um, talking about the overlap between or application of, uh, of cyber and space. We did an event yesterday together with uh, AWS. Um, mobility, uh, climate tech, all sorts of overlap and, and different more topical applications of uh, uh, or where, where the space industry intersects with those industries. Um, and we work with ISA about and, and, and help and promote um, the local space tech ecosystem abroad, work with multinationals and try and expose Israeli space tech to them and get them to come to Israel and look closer at what we're doing here. Um, I digress, back to a, a, a dual application. So. Um, our investment thesis is that we, are, we're a, a, we, we look at deep tech startups that, are, that are, have application both in space and on Earth. So it can be a, a focus on one or the other. So intuitively, if you're a space tech company, you're trying to solve a, a space problem, you identify as a yourself as a space tech company, we want to be talking to you and, and you know, we want to be working with you. Um, dual application is a bit more complicated, but it's a way that we broaden the, uh, the deal flow. Um, and, and you could look at it in two ways. Uh, Lynn touched on it in different words, and so, so did Renana. Um, it can be a startup that is developing a sensor, collision avoidance technology, semiconductor, um, optical uh, uh, breakthroughs that might be looking at earthbound applications that are more immediate, mobility industry, could be industry 4.0. Um, and we encourage those same entrepreneurs to maybe look at space as a potential market. Um, the same sensors might have application in, in building space assets, getting them to space, operating them in space. That's kind of one, one way of looking at dual application. And the other way which uh, Renana uh, focused on was using what's in space and trying to solve Earth problems. So an example can be a company that calls themselves or identifies as a climate tech company. Um, and there are plenty of examples. Um, one great Israeli connector, Israeli founded uh, climate tech company, which is doing weather prediction. Um, it's an area that, it's not just convenience, for us it's convenience, but for agriculture and crop success, it can save millions of lives and, and bring people above the poverty line. Um, they're now deploying a very low cost constellation in space, of a, not nano satellites, kind of mid-sized satellites are very cheap and putting on them their sensors and radars in order to, to solve climate tech challenges. So, um, you know, we're hoping in the, in the coming period, more and more startups will start looking at space and seeing dual application as a, as a route to that. Great. Renana, you're coming from the outside circle of space investor, but you've become also a space investor. So how do you do space tech really as an investment segment in Israel? Why do investors should be excited about it? How did you do this shift uh, at Grove? I don't think it's a matter of, uh, of a shift. I think the, the, the most frustrating thing that you discover when you become an investor is that fascinating technology and great entrepreneurs are not enough to build a successful company, right? It's not enough that the technology will be cool. It's not enough that the vision is going to be, you know, uh, exciting. There actually has to be a business use case. There actually has to be money at the end of the road. And unfortunately, or not unfortunately, a lot of money. And I think that the problem for many investors in Israel is that space is something that seems very remote, very far, very complicated, and also still very detached from actual revenues. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Some is just, you know, a lack of knowledge and understanding. Some is the fact that we still don't have, you know, tens of extremely successful startups that have made it big and could be benchmarks, right? Or good examples for someone to say, yeah, I'm going to be like, they're starting to be more um, popular <laughs> startups and companies, but still, you know, we still need to create those and support those. Um, and I think that what we're trying to do in our humble education efforts to, uh, to the uh, investors ecosystem is to maybe highlight the... Um, I call them the less frightening applications because like, like Doron said, there are many use cases that are hyper relevant for our day-to-day -day lives today. Climate tech and uh, positioning and navigation and research and military support and disaster recovery. I mean, it, even the pandemic. Think about what, how the space community rose to the challenge during the pandemic. Uh, viruses are hyper place focused, right? And so geospatial data is uh, an optimal tool to monitor 
how uh, uh, diseases are uh, are spreading, right? And and the three uh, the three largest agencies, right? The ESA, the uh, the NASA, right, and JAXA have collaborated in a way I think they've never collaborated collaborated before during the pandemic in in creating that online. You, you'll probably be able to talk about it much better than me, but in creating that um, a huge database of imagery. And they made it publicly available for people to actually derive insights about the impact of COVID on, on, on our lives, right? On, on the economic impact, on, on the disease spread, on effects of, uh, uh, of lockdown, on water quality, on air quality. Uh, so we're seeing more and more um, ordinary applications of space-based technologies. And I can talk about climate for hours, I'm not going to do it, I know that I'm, I'm, being, I'm trying to be very mindful of time, but I think that's where we can start, and I'm saying we, I mean not the hyper space focused investors, the more generalist investors, I think that they should start with the more trivial things, and then move to, I don't know, ISR, Casey wants to say something. Yes, she wants to. Well, no, I... I, I I, it's such an interesting way that you put that too. And you said, and I heard two things from the heads of agency panels. There was two questions. You know, one was really is, is there still a need for government agencies or space agencies out there for countries? Um, that was one question. And then General Ron said something to the effect of, you know, and then, you know, how the hell do you make money? And, you know, and I think really when you think about uh, the, the role of government agencies, government agencies are able to take risks for the betterment of the economy without worrying about whether or not there's a profit incentive at the end of it. And I think that's really the challenge. A lot of these um, startup companies or space companies, they do have a profit incentive because you're right, it's not just enough to have a great idea and hope they make it. Um, you know, and even it, it becomes a risk based discussion. You know, even NASA, we've made um, several big bets in risks. If you look at our uh, CLIPS missions, which are commercial lunar payload services missions, um, we are betting on companies to take payloads to the lunar surface that have never flown anything before. You know, we, have, we are making big bets hoping that, you know, that, that works knowing that some of them may not. And so I think that's really the role when you think about kind of what the difference is where, um, you know, government's really still needed, particularly in this sector where um, there's not a stable market yet. Yeah, I agree. So you can keep the mic because I had uh, the next question to you, Casey, actually, because uh, um, we, we've talked about NASA, you know, as a client, as, uh, as one of the, the first clients. We've talked about you. You also raised the, the fact that you are um, echoing the challenges there, the, the needs, uh, helping the, the startup, the company to refine their technology, to refine the solution, and to, to understand what is needed, where, where they should be developing in, to, to be able to, to sell it, uh, what are the real needs out there. And um, we've touched the, the subject of climate tech. Actually, we had an entire panel before that uh, uh, on the subject and uh, NASA is really uh, providing robust data to understand uh, climate change. It's a big player also with this. So how can space tech help, you know, uh, address the crisis? What would be the opportunity for the space tech startup in your opinion? Yeah, well, uh, let me first just to give a little background. I would actually say um, climate and the way we've talked about climate as an agency, while we have been observing our planet uh, for many, many, many years, uh, there's a lot of people that when they think of climate and the challenges associated with that, they haven't always thought of NASA as like the go-to kind of player for that. Um, and so that, you know, in addition to kind of the paradigm shift we talked about with industry, this has been kind of a big shift for us. We just released kind of an agency climate strategy earlier this year and taking a whole of agency approach and how we look at sustainability, everything from um, internal practices to how we look at, um, you know, uh, using climate data to, you know, battle the problems here on Earth. Um, and then even aviation, you know, that's going to be a huge, uh, huge push for us, particularly in this next year. Um, but I will say we still have a lot of work to do, I think, on elevating that conversation. And I think that's a role that NASA very much does play, um, you know, and even conversations that we've had with other organizations. Uh, there's, 
there's still a need, I think, to talk about how space plays a huge role and how space tech, frankly, plays a huge role in solving some of the challenges. Now, that being said, NASA, we're not a regulatory agency um, and we're not setting policy direction, but we can, again, help measure and monitor the Earth and provide data that really shows how rapidly these changes are occurring. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do within the next decade is uh, launch an Earth Systems Observatory, where we can essentially look at um, data across the board, everything from looking at uh, aerosols in the atmosphere uh, to air quality, uh, look at what's happening to uh, sea level rises, uh, get information to farmers on the best time to plant crops. Um, so that's something where uh, we've kind of taken that approach to really say, how can we take this data and give equitable access to people that may have not had it before and not making it just for scientists and people that you would have to have you know, three PhDs to really understand how that data has impacts here on Earth. And so um, that's something that I would say has uh, been a conversation that over the last couple of years is really ele elevated within the agency in terms of the Earth science application component, because uh, again, not new to the climate space, but really in talking about that application piece is really important. And I think uh, similar to a lot of the other industries we've had, climate, space tech still plays a huge role in climate when you look at even the amount of data that we're gonna get from something like an Earth Systems Observatory, tons of downstream data. And our intention's really to buy a lot of that data. So we already have partnerships with several startup uh, type companies like Planet, if you've heard of Planet. Um, and so looking at how do we utilize startups for uh, developing platforms, you know, analytical platforms, looking at how they can help us with the analytical data that we're gonna get from this so we can really turn it into um, more ap applicable use for predictability. And so um, I think that's really kind of where we're headed in that space. And then the other thing that I'd touch on because um, is really the aviation component because uh, we've recently announced a Sustainable Flight Demonstrator Award, which is really exciting for us. And I think the aviation industry is really prime for disruption. So looking at kind of most aircraft or single aisle aircraft and looking at kind of green aviation for how we do that. Um, you know, and I think a lot of what even NASA's been doing in terms of space communications. One of my favorite topics is smart cities. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think now you can uh, fly into New York and there's, you know, two airports in New York and you can take a vertical aircraft from LaGuardia over to JFK. So, um, but that being said, there's a lot of infrastructure that's gonna be needed uh, to drive some of those types of technologies forward. And I think that's really where we're playing a role and in trying to incorporate uh, startups and other companies in that space. That's great. I would like to stay more with the use case and turn to you, Lynn, to see uh, as a follow-up, what other immediate earthbound problems are being addressed by space tech companies? What do you see? What are the use cases and utilities? Well, I mean, today, more than 50% of the global GDP is exposed to risks related to the state and the evolution of our natural environment. So I believe it's absolutely crucial that we develop advanced capabilities for monitoring and analyzing, and then also taking action based upon reliable and more accurate data. So you can think of meteorologists um, getting information from environmental satellites, um, where they have a more accurate picture of sea levels and temperature, of geological features such as ice sheets. Um, you can think of more accurate measurements or, and capturing of um, greenhouse gas and methane uh, emissions. The list is very long. Um, Casey mentioned a number of other applications. Uh, one of our partners uh, recently told me that years ago he uh, attended an event by the World Food Program. And um, already at that time, seven out of the 10 startups that pitched were space companies. Um, so I think that there is a whole, uh, a very large range of, uh, of, of let's say, um, terrestrial benefits to, to space technologies, definitely. Great. So for the last question for our panel, I would like each of you, you know, as we are starting 2023, uh, what message 
would you like uh, to leave our audience with regard you know, of the challenges, opportunity for investors and startup in, uh, in the new space industry? If you, have, if you see something, uh, Zvika. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say from, from our point of view as the Israel Innovation Authority, um, we, we, by the way, I didn't mention it, but we, for the last 10 years, we have uh, a fund with the, with the local ISA, with the ISA uh, where we invested in a few dozens of uh, companies in the space um, industry. But uh, as you know, the competition in, in Israel is very, is very tough because uh, there are a lot of startups in all variety of, uh, of fields. Uh, so, we still don't have enough deal flow uh, uh, when we come to deal with, with the space industry. So, what we, my message to, to the local uh, entrepreneurs it, is that we, as the, the Israel Innovation Authority, um, understood this point and now we, um, we put more money in the earlier stages. I mean, we have... Uh, we have now, uh, for the first time, incubator, accelerator in the space uh, industry. We also uh, had a consortia in this, uh, in this field. And this, this, is, this is the kind of things that we do in, in case we don't see enough uh, uh, deal flow, relevant deal flow. So we move the money uh, to earlier stages. So there is uh, enough money from the Israel Innovation Authority to invest in very early stage I hope all the entrepreneurs here are hearing us and they're yeah. ready. You have the use case on one, you have the investor for the later more, stage. So more than ever there before, is enough it's money. <laughs> it's, it, it probably, it's, it, it will be never enough, but uh, no, never, much but more, you know, much more than, uh, than we used least to, to see kickstart. in the early stages. Yes, thank you. Definitely. Lynn, please. Well, to Let's start with the agency. So to all the representatives from, from the agencies in here, um, if I had to formulate two wishes, then it would be, first of all, secure or start developing a strong position as a customer. Procure services and solutions from the startups in order to support them, in order to bridge this uh, death valley. Um, and the second would be ease the procurement uh, process because the startups are not able to bear the same burden as industry incumbents. So this really has to change. Um, then I would say, well, to the investors out there, what I have learned from my colleagues who uh, built one or if not the, the most successful um, space company out there, um, it's to really focus your investments onto the things that, that really move the needle and that do not just build on incremental advantage. Um, what I have learned myself uh, in my two humble years as an investor in space, then it is that an investment is always a two-way street. So whenever you start engaging with a company, you also have to show what you bring to the table. So it's always adding value in two directions. Um, and then to, to the space entrepreneurs out there, um, what I have realized over the past two years is, and that was very surprising to me, is that many companies don't have a very good overview of their competitive environment, and I think that this is very, very important. So I know it's hard work. Um, the competitor specs are not published on their websites, but I think it's always good to engage with your peers um, in order to see where you are positioning. Uh, and where the competition is is moving. Thank you, Casey. Yeah, well, um, I can say for us, I mean, we're all in on space, right? We're very bullish on space, and uh, we're going back to the moon in a sustainable way, and on to Mars, right, Jim Free? I see you in the back out there. We're going, <laughs> um, and we're not going alone. You know, this is a, this is an everyone story, yeah. and you know, we need everyone. Collaborative efforts everyone in this market bringing their best and their brightest capabilities to really pull this off. Because I do think, uh, I do think we have a shot at Mars if, if we have everyone kind of on board and really wanting to play in this market. Um, I can see why there is hesitation, right? You know, because I think there, uh, some of the, the investments that are being made uh, can appear volatile from an investor perspective. But I'll tell you just even from like I said, over the last two decades, just even in the last couple years. So um, the Kennedy Space Center, where we do the majority of our launches from, we had 45 launches from Kennedy just last year. 
Um, and they weren't just rockets going up without anything on them. Most of the satellites that went into orbit were commercial. There was over 1,000 uh, uh, spacecraft in the first half of 2022, uh, which is more than we've had in the last uh, 50 years. Um, and then if you look forward to this year, we're going to have 90 launches from the Kennedy Space Center. Um, so that's more than one launch a week. That's double just from what last year. So uh, there's, definitely, there's definitely stuff happening in this market. Um, and I'm excited to see where it goes because I think we're going to see kind of a huge boom and shift um, as we go forward. Great. Thank you. Renana, please. Well, you asked for words of wisdom for 2023, <laughs> and I'm wondering how much time do we have. Um, one minute for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No pressure. So I think that one thing is that uh, we, we haven't touched upon it at all, but 2022 and probably 2023 are trickier years than, uh, than 2021 and 2020. And, and I think that what entrepreneurs should focus on understanding is that in times of crisis, necessities always win over nice to haves. So that's one thing that I would uh, keep in mind. And also that this is an opportunity. I mean, Lynn called it value of death. I call it blue ocean. <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities and you just need to focus on the ones that you can clearly see and choose your investors wisely. Great. You can all approach Renan after that. <laughs> Please, Doron, your words of wisdom for 2023 in one minute. No, it's, it's always tough being last and risking that someone else hasn't <laughs> beforehand, but still. That's right. Um, so uh, I, I guess two messages for uh, more for entrepreneurs. One is try and think of, of, uh, of space as kind of a new, uh, again, a blue ocean, find new use cases. It's easy to get assets to space. Um, high school students in Israel have done it quite, quite a few times, prepared nano satellites and send them to space. I couldn't do it, but you know, clearly people can fairly easily. Um, under a million dollars, you've kind of designed a nano sat and put it into space. You don't even have to put nanosatellites into space. There are going to be tens of thousands of, of nanosats in space collecting data. Um, you've got to do something with the data and think of more and more use cases. It can be software. It doesn't need to be kind of heavy hardware uh, uh, R&D. Um, it's kind of message one. And uh, message two is more, I guess, the dual application as well. Um, but even the, the, the other way, um, space applications that are uh, developed for space that have also Earth benefits. and. Some anecdotes from, from a while ago, the, the microwave uh, invented for the space industry are now kind of fairly common down here. Um, and one example from our, one of our own LPs, uh, Corning, um, they developed the windows, I'm not sure if anyone remembers, for the Apollo missions back 50, 60 years ago. Um, it wasn't particularly profitable for them. A huge amount of R&D went into it. Suddenly they had to be resistant to huge amounts of, of heat. Um, but still, it's the same, the same R&D but put into there. Uh, led to, 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 to a different application on Earth, which is optical fibers. So they were a, a leader in that, and that's been the backbone of modern communication. So um, feel free to uh, explore and do uh, space R&D. Thank you. Have other benefits. Thank you. We have to wrap up. We are out of time. Thank you very much. You are all invited to, to be addressing uh, and uh, coming up to, to our uh, distinguished guests. So thank you all. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panelists and hope to continue seeing this trend of space investment increase year over year. Now that we have the money, what are we going to do with it? Well, after we've manufactured almost everything we can think about down here on Earth, it's time to start manufacturing up there in space. Our next panel will be about manufacturing in space. To moderate the panel, I'd like to invite to the stage Mr. Yossi Amin, chairman and the CEO of Space Pharma, a company pioneering the area of health in space. The panelists that will join him, Mr. Amin, are Colonel Lee W. Rosen, co-founder, president, and chief strategy officer of Think Orbital. Mr. Christopher Allison, senior business development manager at Sierra Space. Mr. Christian Mender, Executive Vice President in Space Solutions at Axiom, and Ms. Helena Hubby, co-founder and CEO of the Exploration Company.
Can you hear me? Good afternoon. I hope no one is sleeping. You're going to get a very fascinating discussion today. And thank you for my guests who came from Berlin, Scotland, and USA. Lovely to see you here and to discuss the opportunity to do things in orbit. And when we spoke about the new space, mainly we were talking about small satellites, CubeSat, things that are going small. But apparently, there is a big stream coming, a new wind of in-orbit production. And I'm talking about industrial zone in space, industrial zone outside the atmosphere. People are going to love it because it's a, it's a change. So since 2011, you know, the Obama decided uh, to close the, the shuttles. And the station is very weak, 20 plus years, where every one of us experienced that the power is limited, capacity is limited, men on orbit or inside the station are limited. And now we would like to take it to further steps. So I would like each one of my guests, starting with Helen, to describe where, who is she, what is the exploration company, and then Lee Rosen, what is the uh, Think Orbital, our friend from Axiom, about what is Axiom, and this is uh, Christian Minder and Christopher from Sierra Space. So please, Ellen. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, hello everyone, I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Expression Company. We are basically uh, building space capsule. Um, the way we do it is first it's privately funded, so you can think about Dragon, Soyuz, we're doing that with private money. We've just closed the biggest Series A ever raised in Europe, so the company is 1.5 years old and we've raised 50, 50 million. And uh, we're a team of uh, experienced people, we've been uh, working on the Orion uh, program, so the European part, I was the vice president for that program. And I basically left Airbus with part of my team to create a company which is building capsule to serve the very growing market of space station that my colleagues are going to describe. And uh, we use also the same design afterwards to serve stations around the moon and to land at lunar surface. And of course, to come back, because uh, what is at stake is also how we bring back all the stuff that's going to happen up there. Thank you, Ellen. Lee. Great. Hi, I'm Lee Rosen. I'm president and co-founder of Think Orbital. And at Think Orbital, we want to build large, scalable, autonomously assembled infrastructure in outer space. So on a single Starship launch, we can launch four times the volume of the International Space Station. So think of us as the real estate developers in space. First, working with companies like Axiom and Sierra to um, provide additional space for their space stations, large volumes for experimentation, and then someday to work with companies like Space Pharma to build large uh, manufacturing facilities in space. Again, we, we don't want to do the manufacturing, we want to provide that infrastructure. And, you know, Yossi gets excited when he gets a, a thimble full of product back from the International Space Station. We want to bring tons of products back from a Think Orbital platform someday in the future. Lovely. Thank you, Lee. The little footballs behind, this is the station, and you see the Starship docking. This is a real story. And now, uh, Christian Minder, please, about Axiom. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Christian Mender. Um, I'm from Axiom Space, one of the earliest members of the team, and the company was really built around the idea of a world where we have hundreds of people living and working in space, and we're doing that through a mission where we're building the world's first commercial space station. Uh, we're doing that in phases, first with private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. As we develop the uh, space station platform that we'll start uh, building in this decade, and then ultimately, um, we are also in the business of building spacesuits for NASA and for the emergence of commercial space as we go forward. Um, as much as it's important to build that infrastructure, we're also a builder and a developer of markets um, because without markets to uh, actually sell your products and services, you're not going to have an ability to sustain a space station. So we're going to talk, I think, a little bit more about that today, Yossi, and uh, I, I look forward to it. Thank you, Christian. Now Christopher from Sierra Space. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm with Sierra Space, a fairly new name. Some of you may be familiar with our predecessor company, 
Sierra Nevada Corporation. That company still exists, but we took the Space Systems Group in 2021, carved that out as a standalone company, went out and did a Series A capital raise, raised $1.4 billion in a capital, or Series A, one of the largest in the US. Um, and so with that, that's postured us to partner with Blue Origin on developing what we're calling Orbital Reef, as well as continue to develop our Dream Chaser space plane, which will service the International Space Station, as well as future destinations on orbit. Similar to Christian and others here, you know, a lot of my work is finding and stimulating that commercial demand, the commercial use, the things that are going to you know, make money on our platforms and justify the investments that we're making. So looking forward to diving into those details. Thank you, everybody. So as you see, it's all commercial platforms. We, are, we can count four, but there are many more. There is a question, how many do you think, how many uh, commercial space stations will exist until the end of this decade? You won't believe. Now I would like to ask you, gentlemen and lady, how do you define the microgravity economy? Uh, how is it achieved, and what do you prepare for the clients using microgravity, using your vehicles? Do you want to start? Yes, please. OK. Um, from an Axiom perspective, we, you have to be careful about how you say microgravity environment or microgravity economy. It's actually used interchangeably with LEO economy. And I think I really want to focus on the low Earth orbit economy as a, as a way of talking about that. An economy, in event, if you go back to your, your high school lessons, you know, require both supply and demand. We are all up here as suppliers of services in a low Earth orbit. What, what really needs to be done to make an economy sustainable is making sure you have that balance in demand. And so from a demand perspective, we've really got to focus on building a multimedia set of, event, of, of demand for the space station, for the infrastructure that we're all building. And that demand comes from various sources. You have seen and heard today about the opportunities to create demand for human spaceflight, and that's certainly an important market. But you need to combine that with uh, building markets for research, and uh, not just research from a fundamental perspective, but really about applied research that is useful to commercial industry. You need to build uh, markets that support technology development, where the companies that are building the constellations of the, of the low Earth orbit today, and perhaps the sensors that are going to deeper space tomorrow have a place to prove that their technology works before they put it on expensive spacecraft and send it off uh, to wherever it's going. You need a, a platform, you need a market that supports in-space manufacturing, and that's, that's about using the environment, not just to make things in space for space, but also making things that you can only make in a microgravity environment that you would bring back to planet Earth for some cause or some purpose um, or so, for some profit. And then you can take all this infrastructure that we're working on and really leverage it to offer a lot of different infrastructure and logistics opportunities where you take the hardware in space along with the launch capabilities on the ground and create services around those capabilities. And finally, there's media and marketing and outreach. Uh, space is a huge stage with a worldwide audience. You know, how can you leverage that to create value for customers along the way? And separately, those are all important markets, but they're needed to be developed together in order to build this economy that we keep talking about from a low Earth orbit perspective. Thank you, Christian. So the Leo space economy, this is the right term. Lee. Oh, Ellen, sorry. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a good term. Uh, perhaps just to complement, I think there is space for Earth, uh, which is basically what you, what you spoke about, so microgravity research for the Earth uh, due to very special conditions in microgravity, and I guess you're going also to... I mean, Space Pharma is an amazing example of that. But we have also space for space, and you're speaking about manufacturing in orbit. I think this is a huge market also, because we have the capacity of uh, Starship, uh, it's clear that there'll be, and you're an example of that, few stations, and there'll be so new capabilities to um, build immense, not only stations, but I think also um, storing, uh, storage infrastructures for both commercial and military purposes. So there'll be a whole in-space economy for space that's going to develop on top of in-space economy for the Earth, as you rightly mentioned, research, especially in pharma, but also materials, um, and as you also mentioned, branding, what 
I see how everyone is branding is that it's very important to build a story. Lots of people are saying, okay, why, why shall we send watch to space and then break down? What, what's the point here? So there is very important research for meaning. And for example, we're using green propulsion. So telling people, hey, flying with us means you contribute to build a more sustainable space ecosystem. So there is, people are not having ready just to send things up there because it's fun. It needs to have a purpose. And here what I'm experiencing also is that education and thinking about you know, this conference and the Raman Foundation, education is, I think, also a key enabler of this market where these infrastructures can be open also to children to learn, to test some experiments, not only space companies, but also, and this is a ways meaningful impact um, on how we can also bring this new ecosystem to the next generation of pioneers. But what has changed at the Leo economy since we have the ISS with us already 20 years plus? Why do we need so many stations? What has changed? I, I think you're thinking about it all wrong, Yossi. Um, we, we think in terms of what we have today, what not, we, what not what we will need tomorrow, right? And if we continue to think that way with small scale, small volume, things like that, we'll continue to have a market that develops small scale, small market. But if we start to think big and start to build big, that will change. And, and I hate to build it and they will come because you can't run a business on, on a hope and a dream. But to some extent, you need the picks and the shovels. You need the infrastructure out there to go develop that economy to make sure that folks can start to think about it. And I think it's gonna be a win for all of us when Regular companies, when, when BMW, when Tesla, when other companies that are traditional terrestrial manufacturers say, you know what, I can build that in space because it's better, it's cheaper, and it's faster than doing it terrestrially. How big it is, uh, Christopher? How big is your uh, orbital reef? Sure. Just one thing I want to address on that. I think what's changed in the market now, too, is a bit of a culture shift, and we've heard it on a few different panels today. One catalyst, I would say, is NASA, right, shifting from a model of being the doers to the facilitators. Um, and so Axiom, us, a few other companies have certain contracts with NASA to help stimulate the development of these commercial space stations. And part of the reason for doing that is we are at a point in time where there is kind of an end in sight for ISS, right? So we're at this point that it's not speculative if it's going to continue or not. So we're at this point where we have to do something else and look to the future, as was mentioned. Um, in terms of the size, so Orbital Reef, you know, part of you know, what we're doing to lower the ben barriers to entry is we're leveraging a lot of lessons learned from previous uh, work that NASA's done, other commercial companies. Orbital Reef is an example uh, in the image here behind me. That is uh, in four launches about 91% of the habitable volume of ISS. ISS, I believe, took about 42 launches to deploy in its current configuration. And so right there alone, even if there was no change in launch cost, you see a dramatic reduction in the access to space or that cost to access to space. And parallel to that, another cultural shift that we've seen is that the access to space launch costs have diminished or come down quite significantly. And now what industries do you believe is going to be benefit the most. I saw a report from McKinsey and company last week that says that the pharmaceutical, industrial, as well as material science are going to lead about three to six billion US dollar annually, annually by using the outer space for how a high yield products. So do you see that the same? Who is your first gainers? Well, I, I will agree with you that pharma in general, or health, healthcare in more widely said, is a big market for space, but it is a market that's gonna require time to develop. Um, because not only do you have to perfect whatever capabilities you are on your research or manufacturing side, but you have to, you have to think about the regulatory processes as well. But in terms of what happens in microgravity, in terms of what happens uh, to biology in microgravity and how biology behaves in microgravity, it serves a great purpose to the healthcare market because one, it creates in space a number of opportunities to use space as a research model, as an analog, so to speak, for disease on Earth. Um, and that's incredibly valuable to industry when they're trying to challenge that disease with, uh, with a treatment that ultimately might be beneficial to humans on Earth, but also 
the way, same way that biology behaves uh, for research also means that you can leverage it to potentially make treatments in space as well. So I think there's a, a big value there. Um, advanced materials is certainly another area. Microgravity changes the way physical, prop physical behavior of materials changes, sedimentation, convection, combustion, um, surface tension, all of those things are different in space and you can really exploit that if you know what you're doing to make materials that you really can't make on Earth. Uh, that's my first contribution. Yeah, and in addition to that, I, I think that the initial markets, as you said, kind of on the biological and, and health side, uh, but even before that, um, obviously the replacement of the space station that you also mentioned, but on the military side as well, um, I, I had the luxury and honor of, uh, of serving in the military for over two decades, and uh, the, the new mission areas that the U.S. Space Force is exploring uh, in space assembly and manufacturing, active debris remediation, all of these kind of things are going to bring uh, new capability and new uh, markets uh, that, that we're really getting excited about and that the government is actually taking steps to start to provide funding and, uh, and, and folks are really uh, building new capability that, that uh, can provide servicing for satellites, uh, interchangeable sensor systems, uh, active quick response, satellite servicing and refueling, all of those kind of things I think are, are exciting. There's companies that are, are taking uh, recycled materials and turning them into spacecraft fuel and those kind of things. And, uh, with our infrastructure that we'll have in space, the ability to make that stuff happen at scale, I think, is really what's next. Fascinating. Ellen. Per perhaps to add, because actually we triggered the study with McKinsey, <laughs> so they work together with us. Uh, so I, I would completely agree with pharma, especially on the stem cells, which is a huge bottleneck of the pharma industry on Earth. Uh, and knowing that stem cells are more resilient, more solid in space, that's probably a market which is quite solid for research, not for serial production. And I just would like to add to what you mentioned, um, refueling in space, especially spaceships, uh, because uh, we see and that space is, has become so critical for the Earth, so it means the constellations, they have to be highly resilient. So the capacity to repair constellations, to protect constellations, fast response, exactly what you said, and for fast response, it means the capacity to stay in orbit very long, and to have a very high delta V, meaning probably cryogenic propellant, plus the capacity to refuel in cryogenic. And I think the in-orbit refueling business is going to be huge. Not only Thanks. for satellites, but for spaceships. Yeah, I think one point I want to bring up too, and we've all, I think, touched on it, but I just want to like explicitly address it, is you know, we talk about pharma, advanced materials, these in-space logistics. You know, we have a great asset right now, which is the International Space Station, right, which is the proving ground where we can do some of the use cases and prove out this technology. And I think a lot of us in this room are space people, right, and we talk about microgravity and that's a vernacular that we all understand and subscribe to. And I think a lot of our job, everybody in this room, is to bring in people who aren't traditionally in the space industry, right? I think across the entire like space sector right now, that's not a large enough like customer base to justify some of the investments that we're making, right? So it's going out to these large pharmaceutical companies, startups, right, and showing them some of the evidence of what can be done in space, what's differentiated in this environment, and getting them to join the club, if you will. You know, many people or organization were asking how to, you know, how to contact you? What need to be done? Uh, what are the uh, applications that can be used in order to use our, your stations and services? Uh, my first question to you, Ellen, is the BSGN at Europe is a unique arena where clients, users, can approach and ask for doing things in orbit, and then there is a very specific, uh, organized process how to use the providers, and who is going to fund it? Can you tell us a little bit about the BSGN at Europe today? Yes, of course. So Europe basically has started a few, um, several months ago, this uh, initiative of BSGN is basically to open uh, space and microgravity to also commercial clients. So if you're a pharma company, if you're a material company, if you're a BMW, et cetera, you can go there. It's like a, a one-stop shop uh, with local a representation organized pair, uh, one for material, one for health, etc. And they have 
signed partnerships. We are one of the companies with uh, whom they signed partnership of companies who can basically carry stuff into space, uh, up to, of course, the space station, but like Space Rider and also us have signed partnership and we'll be able to carry for in a very fast amount of time for a very low uh, amount of money. Our, basically, our price is 25K per, per kilogram or per U, uh, up and down, so it's quite low if you compare to others. Um, cargo, not only space cargo, not only the traditional experiment for space stations, but also space cargo for non-space industries. So you just like go on the website of the European Space Agency in the case of Europe, and you can you can kind of book a slot. Yeah, thank you, Len. So this site is already on air like a few months, and we achieved the more than 150 experiments across the basic criteria that now we can support those directly using this uh, arena or platform. Uh, but what do you do in the United States, uh, maybe Christian? We would like to use Axiom tomorrow morning. What, what do we need to do? Uh, do you know any great investors? <laughs> no, That's I'm first. just teasing. Um, what do we need to do? You, Axiom is already providing access to space today. We provide access, obviously, through the space station that exists uh, on orbit today, but we also provide access uh, above and beyond what can be done on the space station with our private astronaut missions and what we can do. So if you have a project that is worth flying today, um, worth it to you, and we can make it work, we can put it on one of those flights. Um, otherwise, we're already taking customers for the first habitat module uh, that is flying in late 2025. And uh, we, that habitat module is going to have places for crew to st sleep and stay, but it also is going to have uh, accommodations for users uh, whether that be research or in-space manufacturing. And that's just going to scale as each piece of the space station is, is added. And what about you, uh, Christopher? I would like to fly into the Dream Chaser something. When is it the next flight, the coming flight? Yeah, so first flight to Dream Chaser will be this year, uh, servicing uh, cargo resupply to the National Space Station. 2023, you mean? Yep. Around the corner. I know. I can't believe it's already Here 2023. Um, and so... Yeah, I think in a similar position, we have you know worked with clients to gain access to the International Space Station, per my comments earlier about utilizing that resource while we have it now to do some of the research and development that we need to get technologies to the point that they're ready to commercialize uh, and industrialize on these commercial platforms. Um, secondly, we are, you know, deep in the, in the trenches of, of building Orbital Reef. We're doing a lot of development of our life habitat module. Um, we have other technologies in the pipeline, Dream Chaser, once it becomes operational, we'll be able to ha have the capability of doing free flying missions as well. So over the next couple years, um, you know, we want to have these systems on orbit in order to start having commercial access. We don't want to wait till ISS is over to start. We need an overlap period there. So that's a big focus of us at CR Space and with uh, the Orbital Reef team. And now we are moving to animals in space. Uh, you know, the preclinical trial, requires use of animal by, by the FDA, but no more. Since two weeks ago, the FDA eliminated the requirement for animal testing. So by modernization act by the FDA, it is now allow faster, more cost-effective drug development, means no more animals at the loop. When I was asking my clients to fly mice to orbit, I told to my scientists, let my competitor fly mice. And why is that? Because we bet on organ on a chip. Those are very unique creatures that we can build today in orbit to expedite research of medicines that at the end are going to be used by us as a personal medicine. What can you tell us about this modernization? No more animals in orbit, but to build creatures known as organoids in space and get those back to Earth to be our mimic body for testing. Christian. Why do I always get the tough questions? <laughs> so what's been really interesting about space research is that we have, had, have seen a spectrum of both animal models and human models in terms of organ on a chip, tissue on a chip, and organoid systems tried it tried in space. It's been really hard, uh, though NASA has put in an enormous amount of effort with uh, them and their, their partners, including JAXA, to standardize a research model that supports uh, uh, murine or mouse research in space. The 
the trouble is, is that it's hard, it's expensive, quite frankly, it's messy, um, and it hasn't been optimized. But what we found is that, that tissue chips in space, uh, evolving into organ chips in space, and then ultimately looking at whether you put or don't put organoids, which are essentially small groups of cells that behave similar to an organ that it come from, um, you can use those, as I was talking about earlier, for a lot of different applications. Maybe someday that those things help do some sort of production of some sort of pharmacological agent or active drug ingredient. But today what they do is they provide a really more uh, simplified and robust research model that quite frankly is much less cost. So when you talk about bringing pharma as a customer along, um, creating the opportunity for them to do the, the testing that they need to do where they don't have to move through an animal model but instead can actually use human tissues and human cells in these systems is going to be very beneficial. And space provides a benefit, again, because it provides access to an environment where you can design some disease models that you really can't design on in 1G. Lee. And, and Yossi, as we kind of talked about earlier today, um, you know, the, the future of medicine is kind of individual tailored to the, to the person type of healthcare and research, right? So even on one of the big chips that you have, what, what, you know, how, many, how many different organites can you, can you farm today? I can place uh, 74 mice on a chip. Right, so 74, right, um, it, it is great. It's a great start, but what does the future look like? If you could scale that to 74,000 or 74 million um, that then you have something that is applicable to the human population. I think that's where the future yes. needs to go, right? Exactly. So millions of billions of organoids are going to be used by the scientists here on Earth to produce new uh, medicines, new cultures, and of course to tailor the medicine towards the clients, which is not the case today. Today we are using statistical medicine, but tomorrow we want to use more and more private and uh, uh, classified, tailor-made tailor, tailor medicines towards uh, uh, personalization. And this is the beauty of space. By the way, to build those organoids on Earth, it is very costly. Why? Because the tissue cultures cannot grow without help of scaffolds, and that requires more money, more costly, but you won't get the shape or the, the creature, the organoids, that can be easily produced in orbit. And this is the beauty of the organoids. Uh, I would like to appoint a little bit towards the monoclonal antibody, which is also a wealthy market, and we believe that uh, a lot of clients will jump on this opportunity because we can define crystals in different shapes in 3D that uh, we will take from the hospital care to the home care, and we, all of us are aware about the COVID-19, where we suffered and we could not reach hospitals. And now we can uh, 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 provide those medicines at home in a very delicate technology that must go through uh, Leo, as we discussed, Leo uh, economy. So the monoclonal antibodies market currently hold by the big players, like Sanofi, like Merck, uh, uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, do you think those clients are ready to adopt this technology? Do we have enough infrastructure to, you know, to sustain this demand? Do you believe that the temperature control, the access to orbit, the re-entry capability are all together with us today? Of course, the cost is the, the second issue, but do we have enough infrastructure to provide this demand. Christopher, start, please. Well, I would say today, specifically, we don't have the infrastructure, right? I mean, most of us here on the, everybody here on the panel is developing that infrastructure right now. So I think it's quickly becoming a reality. I think the other element of this um, that's kind of the invisible hurdle, right, beyond the physical challenges that we have of putting anything into space is the regulatory environment. So. It's making sure that we have the appropriate controls in place, and Christian, I think you touched on that earlier, but making sure that we have the support of the regulators that as we start to manufacture and produce these items in space, that then they can be used uh, appropriately uh, and legally within you know, different consumer markets here on Earth. Christian, how far are we? 
I don't think we're that far off. I would actually say we're able to do the research that we need to do today to support the industry. Um, protein crystallization growth is something that's been done and tried actually a number of times in space. There is an opportunity today, even with the International Space Station, to pilot the optimization and the industrialization of that uh, crystal production so that you're helping the industry on Earth. Um, uh, again, uh, the pharma industry struggles sometimes to understand what targets they're going after in a disease, and sometimes that's because they can't understand the structure of the proteins that they're going after, especially when it comes to membrane proteins, which are the complicated pieces of the, uh, the, the, the outside of a cell. Um, when you want a good drug that interacts and, and in, interacts in a good way with the cell, you need to understand the membrane protein structure. Space has proven to be, in some cases, a very good way to do crystallization because you change the way diffusion works and you change the way sedimentation works and you can get crystals that grow larger and more pure, um, which then, if brought home, can be used and analyzed in a way that helps you understand the structure better. So, can we support the industry today? Yes, in a limited fashion with the space that we have available on, on the International Space Station. The opportunity that's presented and emergent here, especially with Axiom in the next couple of years, is that as we start to multiply the available volume that's uh, available in space, we can start to scale up some of this work where we can do production scale work, uh, even in protein crystallization, if that's something that the industry wants to support. Yossi, you taught me to follow the money. Right? Right. Where's the money coming from? Who's, who's one of your new investors? Right? That's yeah, right. I think few of them are sitting in the crowd, no? For Axiom? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. So where is the money company. coming from? How much money? Yeah, pharmaceutical, right? Yep. So that's a, that's a big deal, $50 million investment from the Korean pharmaceutical company. And I think that's, you know, that's just the beginning. When one sees it happen, the other ones will start to say, well, True. why am I not getting in on this deal? Uh, as well, because they don't want to be left behind. Yep. By the way, the market of the monoclonal antibody today, annually, is 156 billion US dollar. It's only 119 uh, medicines divided, you know, by around 1. Point something billion US dollar per medicine. Uh, there is enough margin there to go to orbit. Helen, can you tell us about the European? medicine market, and how do you see that using your vehicle? Yeah, so we've been talking to, um, I mean, you have a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies in Switzerland, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, so we've been talking to them, and, uh, well, actually we have some, uh, so we, we've built already a baby capsule, and we are now in the process of building our teenage capsule, which we're going to fly with uh, clients. And we have among clients some, uh, some pharmaceutical companies uh, embarking with us in 24. Uh, launched by SpaceX, by the way. But okay, uh, my point is, for many of these companies, frankly speaking, it's far away. Like, they have other priorities. So we need to come with something very specific. Like, hey, I have a problem with stem cells. In our experience, this is, for example, what has worked. Perhaps, you know, organisms are cheaper, etc. But we have, like, a specific problem, and we need kind of to prove them that from a ROI perspective, like the R&D department is investing money because that's going to, you know, bring back some more products afterwards. This is worth it. And we are at the beginning where basically on our side, I would say space people, we have to prove that we can industrialize the stuff. Like, hey, today it takes like three years. Can you do it in six months? We have to be able to do it in six months, three months, one month to be able to send stuff up there. And um, then what's the cost? And how can I try like super small and to scale it afterwards? So I think we are, we are at the beginning. We have our homework to do is basically how we can industrialize the stuff, which is a question of size, of cost, of frequency. Um, and they have also kind of their homework to do, which is from a scientific perspective, to understand what really can be done at scale. Because producing some medicines up there and then bringing these medicines back to the people on Earth means you have to go through the whole um, application, you know, FAA process, etc. So I think the first step will be research. And then potentially if research works, then really building at scale and adapting also our FAA procedures um, for that. But feel free to compliment because you're more no, the expert just, than I me on that. I just wanted to echo, we must move at the speed of industry. And, and, and that is something that we don't do well with the International Space Station today, not because it has failed, simply it is built to be a different animal. But if we're going to be successful, all of us, uh, all of the players on this stage, including and all of the launch providers that are out there too, we have to be able to move with, with the expedition, with the speed of what industry needs to be responsive and 
they work on annual cycles and annual budgets, and if they don't have a question answered, they move on to the next question. We have to be able to do that. And that goes for not just launch cadence and uh, speed of getting their projects prepared for orbit. It also means putting the tools that it need, needed in space to actually do the analytics in space. Today, the model is do an experiment, bring the result home, analyze it, take another shot at doing something different, but that takes multi-years to cycle. We have to turn that cycle into multi-months. And by doing that, we need to do two things. We need to put analytical tools in space, both the compute power along with the tools that you need to actually understand what you're looking at. And then you also need to train the human crews that are going to be doing some of that research to be those technicians, those scientists, and, and or put in the sensor technology to provide quick answers from an automated fashion. If I might, uh, the, the only addendum I would say is, I, I don't know if I would agree with the speed of all industry, right? I think it has to be with the, the, the speed of physics um, to, to understand what the limitations are, right? Because if we start limiting the way we do business by the regulations, by the, the, uh, the, the different factors that are out there, then, then, then you won't be able to explore the possibilities. So if we, can, if we can understand what needs to be done physically, make that happen very, very quickly uh, on a commercial type of scale, um, I, I mean, we learned this lesson over and over again when I was at SpaceX, where, it, you know, if you drive fast, if you let physics be the only limiter and then worry about the other stuff later, um, th those are all rules that are made up by humans. Uh, sometimes for a good reason, sometimes not for a good reason, because it's the way it's always been done. And if we carry that mentality forward in the manufacturing world, we're dead. So we've got to figure out a way to go fast. Totally agree with you, Lee. Christopher, you would you like to add something? No. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a very uh, interesting panel here where we, you see that we are really ready to host more and more clients to prepare those to use the Leo economy, the platforms, the vehicles, the variety of technologies that are all around. In the next two minutes, I would like to show you a little movie. Are we ready with that at the back? Yes. Can we run it now? Thank you. This is so cool, Yossi. Wherever did you get it? You tell me. Is it real? It's, it will be real someday. Again, 4,000 cubic meters, uh, about four times the size of the International Space Station on a single Compared Starship Compared to this launch. hole, half of it. So With this is how you build the new infrastructure in orbit. Amazing uh, technology. It looks like a football size. It's a foot. It looks like a football, but it's a football size field of of the uh, 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 facility with all the nice, niciest things together with Axiom and Think Orbital, where they're gonna take us to the next horizon of, of course, industrial zone in orbit. So I'd like to thank you, everybody, for, this, uh, uh, for participating in this panel. And if there is a question from the crowd, we are here to answer about three minutes, unless you are still awake. Any questions? Yes, please. From 
now. So 2050 we are talking about. Um, I guess to repeat the question for other people, and correct me if I'm wrong, but where do we see in space manufacturing 20, 30 years from now? It's so a 2050, 2060 time frame. Uh, I think a lot of us have a similar pre um, premise up here, right? Supporting thousands of people, hundreds of people living and working in space, right? So I think there's elements of in space for space manufacturing. Uh, there's elements of in space for Earth, but I also anticipate by this point in time, based off of a lot of the other panels and investments that are being made by different agencies in exploration, that you're going to start seeing manufacturing with items, materials, raw materials that we've collected in space for other applications, whether that's back here on Earth, whether that's other bases that we have on other planetary bodies. That's my hope and dream. Yeah, I would just add large-scale applications that are for benefit of humans on Earth, large-scale space applications that are really building spacecraft infrastructure for not just low Earth orbit, but at this point we're going to be cislunar, potentially even towards Mars, and really investing in the applications that help build that infrastructure that sends people to and from. Uh, so in a, in a sense, a, a manufacturing base that sustains sustained human presence in low Earth orbit and sustained exploration to the Moon and to Mars. Perhaps just to complement, I think from the logistic and also infrastructure point of view, uh, on the Earth we have container ship, we have trucks, uh, we have things which are specialized for, for example, fuel, the other things which are specialized for goods. I feel we'll see the specialization also in space, both in the infrastructure, infrastructure for people, for storage, for military purposes, and vehicle like container ship, starship, trucks, probably us. Um, that will specialize in, in various part of the, of the value chain, basically. Once again, any question? Here, please. I think it was on artificial gravity and you know making humans compatible with uh, living long term in orbit, which is is obviously a problem. NASA has a lot of data and research that they've done, um, and, and and other space agencies have have looked at long term human habitation. Um, is is one G something that you want to do? Well. It, it, perhaps for the human habitation piece, but that's almost antithetical to what we want to do from the manufacturing piece, which is why a place like the space station is, is an awesome research facility, but when you got people running on a treadmill and you want zero G, then, then you got kind of a, two things that aren't necessarily completely compatible. So if we can do some of these things in separate spaces where they can be isolated and take advantage of that um, microgravity environment as well as that human habitation uh, where you can separate it. I think that's an important piece of the future. Lovely. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Lee, Christian, Christopher, for joining us here at the Ramon Con International Conference. And hope uh, we are taking notes. Three, five years from now, we're going to see in orbit industrial zones. It's a commitment. Done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys, thank you very much. Uh, it's time for a 15 minute break, so let's come back here at 4.15 for our final sessions. Hello again, hope you had a lovely break. And now after discussing methods of manufacturing in space, Let's talk about extraction of space-based technologies for new applications and their benefits for humanity. Space exploration has inspired humanity and brought about significant investments for our society. In this next panel, we will look at space technologies and data and how they combine with current technologies to provide innovative applications that can help us in our daily lives. 
To moderate this panel, I would like to call to the stage Mr. Ido Priel, co-founder and CEO at Raimondo. Ido is experienced in the space industry from his roles in the defense sector and in the private sector. Following Mr. Priel are our panelists, Mr. Marco Villa, Chief Re Revenue Officer and EVP of Terran Orbital, Mr. Yoav Cohen, COO and co-founder of 4M Analytics, Mr. Ami Daniel, co-founder and CEO of Windward, and Mr. Doron Sterman, Chief Technology Officer at ImageSat International. Hello, gentlemen. Wonderful to have you here. Space, go ahead. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. But we meet in an hour of change, in a decade of hope, in an age of knowledge. Even though I realize that this is, in some measure, an act of faith and vision, for we do not now know what benefits await us. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon, 240,000 miles away, a giant rocket carrying all the equipment needed for survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, and do all this and do it right before this decade is out, then we must be bold. Exploration of space will go ahead. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. So, humanity has been looking up into space since the dawn of history. The first telescope was invented in the early 17th century, and we have managed to fly a first object into space in the late 50s of the 20th century, and the first humans in the early 60s. Space has always been an inspiration. On the one hand, curiosity to explore beyond our planet, and on the other, overcoming tremendous challenges and risks, which usually need to be overcome with technology. The budgets, that have been invested into exploring space and building these technologies have been vast. And while sometimes this is a topic for a debate, with some arguing that the funds could be better spent elsewhere, we're all here because we believe that the benefits of space exploration justify these large investments. The potential rewards are enormous, and the inspiration and motivation that space exploration brings is invaluable. On a more practical level, space exploration has greatly contributed and led to the invention of camera phones, CAT scans, LEDs, foil blankets, enriched baby formulas, portable computers, and much more. In more recent years, there has been a large focus on data coming from space and combining it with AI and other technologies to utilize this data for various applications that can benefit us all. And as we look into the future, perhaps who knows, the biggest benefit is building those technologies that will help save humanity by moving us to a new home planet. So in this panel, we'll try talking about all this and more. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists uh, didn't uh, make his flight or the flight was canceled. Uh, we wanted to bring in Chad GPT um, <laughs> to cover for him, but I think our panelists will have uh, better answers. So let me start by introducing uh, the panelists. First of all, Doron Sterman from ImageSat. Doron? Thank you. ISI takes the next step in space-based intelligence solutions with the launch of its game-changing Eros C3 satellite. For two decades, ISI has combined cutting-edge technology and advanced analytical capabilities to deliver one-stop shop solutions for diverse commercial, defense, and security applications worldwide. 
ISI satellite imagery revealed China's deployment of new missile batteries on Woody Island in the South China Sea. As the Evergreen container ship halted global trade, ISI satellite imagery helped experts see the bigger picture. Following Russian attacks on the airport, high-resolution ISI imagery showed how infrastructure had been reduced to rubble, including the world's largest cargo plane. ISI's data analysis of satellite images detected 15 landing strips hidden in Brazil's Amazon rainforest that may serve illegal activities like drug and weapons trafficking. Today, Eros C3 will take its place in the Eros NG constellation. Tomorrow, its data will be used to defend against new threats and reveal more about the world we live in. ISI – Space-Based Intelligence Solutions – Making the World a Better, Safer Place Yes, so thanks for the great introduction by this uh, movie. Obviously, there's nothing more to say uh, after this, uh, this uh, example. Um, but as you've seen, uh, today ISI is uh, the biggest space company in, in Israel. Uh, we are a public company traded in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. And uh, we, our, our main focus is intelligence, or more specifically, um, the extraction of uh, meaningful intelligence using space-based uh, sensor and obviously some ground-based uh, infrastructures as well. Thank you, Doron. Next up is Marco. He's the CRO for Terrain Orbital, and I'll let him introduce himself. Thank you very much. Uh, not to self, make a catchy video, Marco, next time. Instead, I don't have to describe the company. Um, Marco Villa, I've been uh, in the industry for uh, 25 years now, and lucky enough to, to see um, the evolution and the transformation of this industry from the beginning um, and until where it is right now, which is at the new beginning of what our future is going to bring. I work uh, for Terran Orbital. Terran Orbital is, uh, uh, some of you may know it uh, uh, with the uh, name of Tyvek. Um, we are a company that has relentlessly focused on understanding our customers' problem or gaps that were in the, in the overall ecosystem and trying to create the infrastructure to resolve them or to provide a solution to with the customer for the customer. So in order to do that in an efficient and bringing value, we had to develop our entire, or we decided, I should say, to develop our entire infrastructure. So today, um, like we wanted to do from day one, we are able to literally listen to somebody's problem understand uh, and shape together what's the best path to get to provide the data or anything else that is needed to declare mission success and ultimately enable their business plan. And we do that by doing designing of the mission, by providing hardware. We do all, 95% of the hardware that flies is all done in-house. Um, we do it by arranging launch services. We have relationship with pretty much every uh, non-sanctioned launch vehicle that we can get our hands on, and ultimately by the most important part, mission operations, sustainability, and providing data uh, real-time or not real-time as is needed. Um, we have done it for many years. We mostly do it for the, uh, I should say, the US government uh, is, uh, is as often the biggest customer. Uh, we also do it for European governments, and uh, now uh, a lot of commercial, um, and um, in doing that, uh, as you, we will talk about later on, we have, have seen, have, uh, have access to a lot of what the topic of the discussion is, so what actually is the, the benefits to humanity, what is the benefits and the value being brought to Earth, why, what we do in space. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Next up, Ami Daniel, the CEO for Windward. Hi, everybody. How are you? I have first a question before I introduce myself. Can everybody who used ChatGPT please raise your, raise your hand? Great. Now look around you. So that's about 20 or 30% of you. Um, so, so I lead a company called Winward. Uh, we're shipping an AI company. Uh, less than, according to rec recent research by McKinsey, less than 1% of the organization on Earth have, are actually dealing with AI. So, so all of you who raised your hand with ChatGPT, you're the minority. I am the minority, by the, by the way, as well. I use it three times a day. 
um, uh, as did Amazon developers by giving them their proprietary code. Um, we built this company in Israel called Winward. We took it public in London last year. Uh, we're a multi-source platform. We work with 135 customers, ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, uh, the US government, HSBC, Standard Charter, DSV, and Fung, many others, Maersk ports, uh, across uh, uh, government supply chain and trading and shipping. Uh, if you would do me a favor and open your phones, which I've, I'm, obviously you're not going to do right now, but later please access the New York Times website uh, and you'll see one of the front page articles today is on how Russia is avoiding sanctions and it's powered by our data, uh, um, uh, our data and insights. And I think it's, uh, if I need to leave you with two messages for the beginning of the panel, one is uh, there is no, the world is big, there is no one source uh, uh, that is uh, enough. Uh, Eris 3C will be amazing, and I look forward to talking to you about that. But uh, tipping and queuing is the name of the game today. Nothing is about one source or three sources, and that's why we work with every satellite company on Earth. Uh, ISI, Hawkeye, Black Sky, ISI, everything that just finishes with an I. Um, and the second thing is the main challenge for all space companies in the world is uh, a single challenge and it's called revenue. That's the name of the game. And all the money, 90% of the money in the world is coming from less than 10 customers and they are the US government basically. Like nine of them are the US government. And I think that's the number one challenge. And if we solve that, you'll see more capital, more revenue, more use cases, more everything. Because the US government is big, but it's not big enough to finance everybody, uh, especially not in, a, in the world we're going into. So I look forward to these sessions today and thank you for having me. You answered everything. I think we're done. <laughs> Last is uh, Yoav Cohen uh, from 4M Analytics. Yes, yeah, thank you. For, uh, well, 4M Analytics is a subsurface utility mapping company, and probably it's raising a question what a subsurface utility mapping is doing in a space uh, convention. So maybe a bit background on myself, and it will, be, it will explain it. I was, uh, spent more than uh, 30 years in Israel Defense Intelligence. And my last position was the head of uh, Israel Girl Special Intelligence Agency, and uh, dealing a lot of with uh, Earth ob observation satellite and uh, related technology. And uh, like the trend in the industry, I've, I moved from government to the private sector uh, founded the uh, Forum Analytic uh, as a startup three years ago, three years ago, and we used the same technique of uh, Earth of observation and data fusion to map subsurface utility. Just a few words about what's happening in utilities. It's a mess. It's a maze of pipelines from gas, electricity, water, sewage, oil, oil, you name it, with no data reliable data. Uh, it's a complete chaos. We mapped every inch on Earth. We are mapping galaxies, as we've seen before. We do not know what is to fit under our underground. And in forum analytics, we do that with no sensor, just with data fusion. Uh, we know the answer is out there on the data. It's, it's just very complex to extract it. And we do it by a uh, uh, fusing three sources of data. One is uh, all the vector data, GIS, etc. Engineering, this is a man-made continent on Earth, and there's a lot of engineering rules, logic, standards that we collect and analyze. And our edge is the third one is pixels. We analyze uh, pixels from all source, satellite of course imagery, current and historical one, and we use that to confirm and to create a confidence interval on our data, and this is our edge uh, relative to, to competitors in the market. So uh, thank you for being Thank you, Yoav. Maybe you can still hold the microphone. Uh, I think uh, the first question before we go into actual practical examples um, is from your perspective, what are the biggest opportunities, whether they're technological or business that currently exist for utilizing space technology or data uh, and that can actually help us. Okay, so, so obviously we are, we are a downstream company and uh, in, in this uh, 
era or period of time, there are two uh, major points. One, there is a really big data from space. I mean, there is decades, decades of imagery of Earth. Okay, it's, it's enormous, it's really, really big. And on the other hand, of course, the artificial intelligence technology allows us to analyze it effectively. And uh, by the nexus of these two uh, capabilities, we can uh, get uh, very effectively insights on global phenomenon on, or on a specific question. And, and this is exciting uh, opportunity to my uh, view. Doron, I want you from your perspective, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, much broader, both in terms of uh, what image that does, which is not just uh, AI at the end. What do you see as the biggest uh, opportunities? So I, I think I want to suggest maybe a different uh, point of view to the mostly to the uh, data flood uh, that uh, is now being uh, of, um, all over, the, all over the, the industry and uh, all over the uh, use cases that you can think of. And the, the data is quite uh, intense. Uh, as, as my colleague just mentioned, it, was, it has been gathered for years now, and we're still gathering more and more dat uh, data with uh, higher quality and uh, higher bandwidth and uh, higher, higher uh, modalities. Um, but the way we think about it at ISI is really from, from the, a very different perspective. Uh, instead of trying to solve the, the data or the huge data challenge, we're trying to tackle the data collection as, as a starting point. Uh, because if you collect too much data, uh, well, you can claim that there is not, no, no such thing as too much data, but eventually uh, no one wants big data. Everyone just wants to get the, um, the, uh, the understandings that can get out of the data, or the, uh, as, as in ISI case, the intelligence that can, uh, they can, we can defer from the data. And we think that it all starts in how to collect the data, what da which data to collect, and which data uh, is redundant. And the way we do it in ISI is not just by the way we obviously collect the data, but it, we go all the way uh, towards also the design of the data collection sensor. And uh, we do that also with one of our partners here on the panel today with Tyvac. Um, ISI is designing its own sensors, uh, uh, which we are we're going about to launch in this, uh, in this year. And we think that it's not, it's not enough to just say we have a lot of data, let's try to make a sense out of it. Really, it has to do with uh, collecting the, the data in a timely manner and in, the, in a, the right manner with the right sensors. If I, if I can jump in, I promised you I'll jump in, right? Uh, Ido sent me the question, I so told, ah, leave the question, let's just talk on stage and have some fun. So I'd like to take a step back and offer some framework to look at all this space thing, okay? Obviously there's upstream and downstream, right? But it's also horizontal and vertical. And I think not many people understand it. If you look at Planet Labs, planet.com, which is probably the biggest and most successful space company, we did a SPAC, I think, in December last year, um, then their strategy is the following, if I understand it correctly. They're a data collection company, and they collect data, but then they need partnerships because there are hundreds of use cases which are completely impossible for one company to crack. And that's where the vertical thing comes in. So AI, and I think 4M Analytics is a great example. So AI can really lower the bar to build any applications because of SageMaker by Amazon or TensorFlow, may, may he rest in peace, um, and other technologies like that, but that only lowers the bar for vertical applications, because at the end of the day, they, any, somebody wants to know, should I water my crops more, or should I insure my crops for more money, or should I fix the sewage, or am I going to swallow in, be swallowed into the middle of the earth with my car, like it's happening every, twice a week here in Israel, or uh, what is Russia doing on sanctions? And I think if you talk about opportunities, then in this day and age in the capital scene, where the interest rates are higher and capital investments are much more few and far between, especially for space, then I think that's what's interesting to talk about. So it's became much more, much cheaper to build a downstream company right now, because there's all these satellites popping up with a lot of space, so the cost per data 
square meter or per data bit is going down, like 10x down, the quality is going 10x up, and people are getting used to, because of ChatGPT and stuff like that, saying, well, what can AI do for me? And I think that's the biggest opportunity we should all be talking about. Sorry for jumping in. I love it. <laughs> so now after we've talked uh, at a higher level, let's take actual examples, practical examples, that, or use cases that you all as uh, CEO and, and, and uh, you know, uh, C-level in your companies have done and demonstrate how to do it and to actually create that uh, benefit at the end. Yoav, I don't know if you want to start. Um, and Here I need my slides. We're looking at the slides, yes. So, so, so piling on, on Ami um, saying, I think it, it's, it's the vertical it's, and it's the context. Okay, data, data from its space itself is, is of course meaningful, meaningful, but if you leverage it with the other uh, set of uh, data and give it another context, then it can leverage the, the value. And this is an example, this is what we do for a living. This is a, a construction project in uh, Texas, and you see the underground utilities with all the right colors uh, as they mapped out of, uh, the, we extracted that out of the records, and actually a field survey that has been done in this uh, interchange. And um, actually there are two field surveys, one in 2019 and one in 2022. Can you shift one? But adding to that uh, imagery. Uh, what am I looking at? What is this? Yes. So this is the yellow one is a gas pipeline uh, that been missed on all the field survey. And the consequence of missing uh, gas pipeline can cost millions of dollars and even uh, loss of life. And how we are doing that is because uh, we are looking on the, on the area from different perspective. perspective it's from, from space. And, give me just and so we can see the drill site and the gathering site, of course, and uh, we connect the dots and then we understand the network. And if you click another one, and we can see also from a medium image from 2006, the, I don't know if you can see the excavation footprints of the gas pipe uh, itself. Now, it's interesting, two points about this use case. One, for some of the audience here, it's look obvious. I mean, okay, look at the surrounding, let's look on history. I can tell you for the construction industry, it's science fiction. Okay, they cannot think in the way that they use this kind of data for construction. They are confined to the corridor of the, of the road in this case. The other thing, it's not a coincidence that we found this image from 2006. Um, from our experience, it's not coincidence, it's statistic. We know the data is there and we can count on it. So uh, we are, know it's there, we leverage them, leverage it and uh, supply the data that no one in construction industry imagined before. Thank you. Marco, it would be interesting to hear your example. I don't know if you would like your slides back up uh, because they, uh, they skipped yeah, a few slides. If they come up, it's useful, but, but um, let's see. We, as I said before, we have a, a pretty broad view of the different use cases that comes to us. Uh, a few worth mentioning that are earthbound are uh, we talk, I heard in a panel before about climate. Well, we have been enabling at least three different companies to come up with three different ways to record uh, uh, data and uh, put them together in order to have a much better view of forecast. One of them uh, is a private company in the US that actually stemmed from uh, JPL. And then it was all about GPS radio occultation. And, uh, and so the private-public partnership with JPL allowed to actually have the best performing radio occultation instrument flying on a very small satellite on a 6U and yet get, gathering the best quality out of the numbers of flight and, uh, satellites flown rather than uh, uh, just pure quality itself of one instrument on one satellite. Um, 
that match with another satellite that we flew that was the first uh, of its kind, the first nanosatellites flying a, a full up KA radar system. That one was in order to have a much better mapping uh, of uh, rain formation. So try to catch very early on any rain formation. Um, and that matched with uh, uh, something we did in Europe, in which we had two satellites flying in formation, one with uh, a different type of radar, and another one with an hyperspectral camera. In, uh, the goal there was to have uh, understanding of the ice and ice formation, ice uh, 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 modification and thickness. So when you combine, and, and obviously is my colleagues here have much better understanding than me on how to combine this data, I'm a mere producer of the data and enabler of that, but when you combine all of this, um, it was actually we were the one telling to one party to talk to the other one, to talk to the others, and put all of those information together to have even better uh, 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 dissemination and understanding of the different phenomenology that they were looking, all of them in sliced up in different ways. Um, the other big application is uh, uh, IoT. IoT was uh, a very catchy word for me a few years ago, and actually I did not work with a few companies that were coming in, 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 my door, in my door saying, we want to do this, and I couldn't understand their business plan because it wasn't very clear. Now I understand it, now I get it, and it's been an incredible explosion of, um, again, not appropriate word in aerospace, I have to remember not to say that anymore, but a, a, a proliferation of applications based on IoT, coming especially in the mining industry, and um, um, it's by far the one that is catching up the most. Our customer, commercial customer in Australia is uh, really making a mint right now in being almost the only one providing that type of information uh, to many different mine companies. Um, but now IoT, the concept, is applicable to an amount of other applications. And the most important thing in our business is easily scalable. And that's one of the aspects that uh, maybe later on we can dwell a little is coming up with business plan, coming up with technology, coming up with ideas that have to be inherently scalable. Otherwise, you're not going to make a business because you're always going to be connected just to one specific aspect. So IoT certainly falls into that category. So, so I live to segue, and I think it's a great segue to the size of the market. So actually, if I may share, I think a lot of people use satellites for, I would say, anomalies or sorry to say this bluntly, anecdotal use cases. And they find an anecdote. They find, oh, listen, I found a picture of these guys doing that. But actually, how, much, how, many, well, how big is the market? How many people really want to buy this insight on an ongoing basis? I'm not saying there's no insights. I'm saying there's a ton of insights. But I think if there's one thing I've learned is to work from the size of the market back versus from the, pardon my French, sexiness of the, of the insight forward. So a good example would be the supply chain market. If you talk at, look at logistics and the unreliability of the supply chain globally, it's absolutely crumbled in the last three years. China has forbid any non-Chinese entities to collect data on ships and shipments coming out of China. And, you know, last time I heard, it's about 50% of the world's exports, right? So, so I think satellites really enable that at scale because you don't have to ask for permission for China, from China, please well, may, we, may we collect data from your, your coastline? The answer is no, by the way. They won't let you unless you're a Chinese regulated entity, which none of us are, is probably. Um, but also, I think that proliferation of satellite data enables IoT and different elements of visibility for supply chain. And if you look at the supply chain market, you're talking about 10 million customers, prospects. So IKEA, Walmart, you name it. And all of them are looking at shipments. So I think it's a different uh, perspective to look at that challenge and opportunity. Um, and I think maybe I'll connect to what you said is I actually like the fact that of course no constructor is looking at satellites. Why would they? But nor should they care. I think good companies, I think, omit the need for the customers to ask, how do you give me this insight? How do you give me this insight? I don't really care how ISI gives me the insight. We, people pay them for the insight, right? So that, I think a good outcome would be the fact that space could be so approachable and so usable and so common that people would pay for the AI-driven insights and use it across their business. 
And I think that's the potential for space, and that's the potential use cases where it's supply chain visibility per parcel, which we're very far from per parcel. We're still per container. Uh, if it's sanctions, I think, again, I refer you to the New York Times. That's a big thing going on in the world. Modeling oil flows, I think it's, it's absolutely there. Climate tech, we had COP27, which in my perspective was like blah, blah. But, but climate tech is a trillion dollar opportunity. And everybody, there's, uh, I think, uh, carbon credits were just blown to pieces in the last week because they're, it's basically greenwashing. So, so even monitoring of carbon credits and going after climate tech like we are, we have, a, we have a product for measuring fuel consumption, reducing fuel consumption and carbon emissions for shipments. But it all comes back to the size of the market and the use case and finding customers with a pulse uh, willing to pay for it versus you know, people with a presentation at a conference which I love you all, but that's not how you build a company. Ami, hold your thoughts. I want Doron, first of all, to give us an example of how ImageSat or what ImageSat does, uh, an actual uh, specific use case, and then I want to go back to what you said uh, and ask you another question. Thanks. So, as you can imagine, most of uh, the use case I can share or cannot share has to do with, uh, with defense uh, issues that we've been tackling uh, all around the world. Um, maybe most of, one of the most famous to, today is, the, is the, what's going on in Ukraine and uh, ISI has been quite active in supporting this effort and collecting the, the data and obviously also analyzing it. Um, I can share more to more in a bit more details something that we are doing not in that realm, uh, which has to do uh, maybe with what Ami's company is doing, uh, and that's uh, in uh, illegal fishing or uh, human trafficking or, dr or drug trafficking. So obviously, when when done, for example, with chips, uh, in some cases those chips can uh, or transmit data. It might be uh, true data or it might be false. Uh, someone might collect it, it can be a satellite, it can be an offshore sensor, but in the more interesting cases, uh, those ships uh, are not really collab collaborative, they don't really share the, what they're doing, uh, and if you don't know uh, where they are, there's nothing to do about it. And for, uh, one example I can share is uh, the effort we're doing at ISI to detect those ships that are doing illegal activities, and obviously there is not just one sensor involved. So people are, people are talking about the fact that if you want to do uh, meaningful uh, things, you need to combine multiple sensor or multiple, multiple data sources. Well, of course, we've been doing it all the time, all along, right? So there's nothing you can do with just an image that was captured with in the right time or in the right place. It all has to do with the operation uh, surrounding this infrastructure. It all has to do with, uh, with combining multiple sensors and multiple data sources. And, and in this case, for in, in the case for uh, illegal shipping, we do see the, the transmitting part of the ship, which, is, which we call an AIS, to be only a, a basic part of the, of the data that's, that's needed. And, and as I said, as when you know what you're looking for and what's the right way to look for it, you don't really need to take pictures of the whole world the entire time. On the contrary, if you, get, if you collect more data than you need, you'll be stuck with, with more data than you need and with some, G, some uh, chat GPI that do, doesn't necessarily do the work for you. So what we're doing is reducing the amount of, of data we are collecting in an intelligent manner. Uh, and eventually um, we do share, you can go online to, in, in our website to see some example where we were, we were the only one to, to capture those uh, illegal activities, obviously all around the world. Thank you. So going back uh, to your statement, everybody says space is uh, sexy, but nobody treats the end uh, markets or the bigger markets. Uh, I think when we look at, uh, you know, uh, space or space using uh, companies, you don't find very big examples out there of very successful or big uh, companies. W w so what do you think the challenge is? I mean, uh, if, if you say the markets do exist and there are problems out there, wh where is the challenge? Well, first of all, it's hard. You need to understand, you know, I'm speaking here at a satellite conference. Most people ask me, why are you speaking at a satellite conference? So, so you need to understand both the upstream, which is the satellites, and, and you spent years doing that at the, at the, the Army. I didn't. I was just a Navy guy. 
but, but you need to figure that out, right? It's tough. Not everybody understands upstream and downstream and satellites, and there's RF, and there's optical, and there's AIS, and there's this, and there's that. You know, it's like, it's a schlep. A. B, you need to understand the customer. You need to productize that at scale. And still, most of the revenue is government revenue. And, and, and venture capital doesn't love government revenue. Uh, Shyam Sankar, the, the CEO of Palantir, wrote a really interesting article on shyamsankar.com. Uh, take a look at it. I think it's really interesting. Uh, and he, he, he spoke about the fact that actually, it's, if you look at the big companies built on government, new companies on government revenue, that's Palantir, Anduril, and uh, another one. Uh, but it's all the same founders. Um, so so I, I really think that that's the, one of the biggest challenges. And the question is, how do you go towards really big markets, commercial revenue? Uh, because I think illegal fishing is a great market. We have great illegal fishing customers. You have great illegal fishing customers. But in the grand scheme of things, how much revenue really people make from illegal fishing combined the world? 30 million bucks, right? There's a guy from Amazon in the, cr in the crowd here. You go to the CEO of Amazon, you tell them the market is 30 million bucks. He tells you, excuse me, who are you, please? So you can't, you can't do that. You need to go after big problems and you need to go after repeatable problems. And that's where I think it's all about, we should all work together to increase the size of the pie. And if there's one thing, please take uh, uh, from here is competing on the small size slice is pretty stupid in my perspective. The perspective is how do you work together to create a bigger pie? Um, and, and I think specifically here in Israel, I think that's something we need to learn to do, how, know how to do together. Thank you. Marco, I'd like to hear your, uh, your answer, because I think your answer regarding the challenges would be much more technological, uh, or perhaps I'm wrong. Yeah, no, it all boils down I can, to I can do technological. You want me to do technological? I'm kidding. <laughs> well, sure, we, you can. So the... the, the um, the, the concept, I mean, to me, the biggest challenge is maintaining that flow, um, kind of like piggybacking a little bit of the discussion that both of them were doing. Um, listen, there are good pockets of excellence into, the, into making satellites. There are good pockets of excellence into making payloads. Um, there is great pockets of excellence into taking the data, analyzing, and so on. There is no flow. So very often, um, we have customers. When I say customer in this case, I mean end customers, right? The, the big oil companies in the world or, 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 or other companies that actually already have revenue streams and they are trying to understand how to make them bigger or better or more efficient their operations by utilizing space uh, uh, services. Not inventing anything new, just optimizing, which is the, per se is one of the biggest challenges, right? But there is no coherent and continuous flow from the need I need to do this to, okay, this is the person that can do this data analytics for you and repacketize whatever raw data comes from space to the one that says, okay, I know how to collect it, to the one that says, okay, I know how to make it, to the one that says, okay, I understand which instruments to do so that at the end, that is the right set of utilization. That flow is very chopped up. And, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's why the pie doesn't get that much bigger because we spent, I think all in our community, we spent an enormous amount of time um, doing education aspect and connecting all these dots. That is to me the biggest challenge right now. It's if we can find a way to relax a second, not keep on pushing uh, products or technology or anything else, but simply pushing problem solving skills and, and listening to what the requests are and creating the flow so that people can depend on it and actually make a business plan out of that. All of a sudden, everything should be a little better uh, because things get bigger, there is more opportunities, and now different technologies got a way to, to, to take place and, and, and there is space for everybody. So that, that is the biggest challenge right now to make it bigger. Yoav, how do we solve these challenges? What needs to happen in the next five to 10 years? So we'll sit here on stage and uh, Ami will talk differently. I think Ami, Ami is right. I think we have to find the, the right problems and uh, to see how we uh, expand the circle of value of uh, space data. Um, and I think this, this is the, the key, to find the right markets. Uh, for example, the, the construction market is, is a huge market and uh, space data is a complementary, just complementary data over there, but it's, 
it's crucial to leverage the, the market. And once you find the right problem and the right market, then you create a demand and uh, the space uh, can flourish. Uh, this is the, my two cents on that. We're done. Uh, I want to thank you, our panelists. Before we go, I want to lo uh, use the last uh, minute to inform you. I don't know if uh, you can put the slide on for the Mafat uh, challenge. Uh, Mafat, which is like the Israeli DARPA, will be releasing tomorrow, uh, February 1st, a satellite vision challenge. It deals with uh, object detection from satellite imagery. The challenge is a competition with prizes. You can all find uh, more information online, but uh, you're welcome to scan it. There is another slide, scan the QR code, and uh, hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you again to the panelists for the interesting discussion. Thank you all very much. We talked about technology, we talked about science, we also talked about investments. All of these areas are bound by laws and legislations. Therefore, our final panel is all about space law. I'm happy to invite to the stage advocate Karen Shachal, senior deputy legal advisor at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ms. Shachal will be moderating this panel. I'm also happy to invite to the stage our esteemed panelist, Ms. Rebecca Brett. Associate General Counsel for International Law at NASA, and Advocate Milton Skips from Sherman and Howard. So, hi everyone, and thank you for uh, staying until uh, the end of the day. And thank you both uh, for taking a part in our panel on practical aspects of uh, space law, AX1 and Rakia case study. So, this panel is uh, special since it includes three lawyers that covered different angles of the legal envelope of the Rakia mission. I thought it would be interesting to show our audience uh, for the first time the kind of 360 degrees of the legal coverage of the mission. People should probably know that beyond every uh, space mission, space event, there is a significant time with attorneys from all kinds. So I'll start by explaining um, my, uh, my professional, personal uh, angle with the, the Rakia mission. Um, according to the OST, the Outer Space Treaty, states are responsible for nationals, for their national space activities. The Rakia mission was the first time an Israeli, Israeli national, was about to become a private astronaut. A status that we were not familiar with before. So as the government, uh, we had to understand what kind of responsibility we are bearing as the state of nationality. And to make sure Eitan was uh, covered and legally protected in all circumstances, and also what sort of undertaking the government was taking upon itself. So the first thing that we did was to brief Eitan um, and his team about uh, international space law and the multilateral treaties, uh, especially all the relevant rights and obligations and responsibilities that would possibly uh, be related to the mission. For me, this was a novel experience. Uh, I've taught and explained space treaties for years, but that was the first time that the astronauts treaty had a potential of having practical implications. I should say that Eitan was a perfect partner and uh, asked great questions. Then, my legal team 
had some meetings with the NASA's legal team, and I'm looking here at Rebecca. Uh, I had a lot of uh, Rebecca time back then. <laughs> Um, in order to assess what would be Israel's uh, responsibility as a state of nationality. So I think, uh, Rebecca, you were uh, dealing with such a situation for the first time as well, of a state of nationality asking you, what, what is my share <laughs> of responsibility in all that? So after some long conversation and correspondence and a lot of documentation that we got from NASA. Um, we, could we could finally uh, really understand and explain to our government what, what we probably could have said from the beginning. However, from Israel's perspective, Israel's responsibilities in connection with the Rakia mission were its general responsibilities deriving from the OST, from the Outer, outer State, uh, Space Treaty, minus the responsibilities of the US government as part of the PAM project, the Private Astronaut Mission Project, and as Axiom's states, state of nationality. Um, that was my angle as a lawyer of, I mean, as a legal counsel of, uh, of the Israeli government for that issue. Um, Skip, would you like to share with us your angle of the mission? Yeah, and let me start by saying uh, this is the best time ever to be a space lawyer. Uh, there's so much going on in, in commercial space, and uh, I've been doing this for almost 40 years now, and I would have to say that certainly one of the two or three highlights of my career was this opportunity to represent Eitan uh, on his private astronaut mission. Uh, it's, it's just an exciting time and that was, was the highlight of, of doing this. Uh, but let me give you a little sense of the structure uh, before we get into some more of the legal issues. But uh, this was a private astronaut mission uh, and the PAM provider was Axiom Space out of Houston. Axiom had a contract with SpaceX for the launch and the return, and Axiom had a contract with NASA uh, for its uh, clients to be hosted on the International Space Station. Uh, then Axiom had a contract with the individual uh, private astronauts, one of whom was, was Eitan. Uh, so that was the overall structure. And then the, the legal environment uh, that we dealt with was, as you mentioned, the Outer Space Treaty on the international side. There's also the intergovernmental agreement of all the uh, space station partners. And then there's many memorandums of understandings, MOUs, between the various space agencies uh, that are involved in the space station and crew code of conduct, uh, some other things. Um, and then you have the national space laws. The, in the U.S., the Commercial Space Launch Act, extensive regulations from the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, that licenses, launches, and returns. And, uh, of course, NASA has a few regulations of its of its own. So that was kind of the, the legal environment uh, that we had to address for uh, this private astronaut mission and the contract with Axiom. Thank you. Rebecca, do you want to share your side? So first of all, Karen, thank you for, um, for having me. Um, it's nice to be back. We, we were on a panel 10 years ago at this um, conference, so it's, it's, it's nice to be with you again here in Israel. Um, so I think Skip covered the transaction part um, very well. We, in addition to what Skip had mentioned, we also had something what we call a, um, a reimbursable Space Act agreement with Axiom where they entered into an agreement to use our facilities, but then they contracted with our contractor that used those facilities for crew training. So while they um, used our facilities for crew training, they were contracting out for the actual 
for the actual training. Um, you know, this, this wasn't the first time that the International Space Station was hosting a commercial or private astronaut. The, the Russians have been doing it for, for well over 20 years. Um, in 20, uh, 2001, Tito was the first astronaut. And at that point in time, the, the partnership, it did come to, um, come to us as a bit of a surprise, but we did figure it out. And then after that mission, all of the International Space Station partners worked to figure out how are we going to include private astronauts. At, at that time, we called them space flight participants. So when this came up, we at least had some structure in place to follow, but it was different because this was the first time that the United States was bringing up a private, private astronauts as opposed to, to the Russians and using US vehicles. And in addition to not just having one spaceflight participant, but having four private astronauts on the station at one time. Um, my primary, my primary um, role was really to look at the risk from an agency perspective and then advise NASA and NASA leadership so then they can make their decisions on how they want it to move forward. Um, in addition to that, I, it was kind of a hub and spoke type environment. I felt like I was, I was this hub where I was talking to Skip, talking to Karen, negotiating with Axiom, advising NASA, and then also at the end of the day, I needed to talk to all of the international partners of the International Space Station to ensure that they were happy with how we ultimately um, made our decisions on how to handle certain issues. Um, because we had already 20 plus years with our international partners, as I said, there was a legal framework already in place and not just, um, not just agreements, but also policies. So it was trying to take those policies and th that framework that we had in place with our international partners and to use that and to still comply with that, but in a more commercial manner. Um, up to this point, we had primarily, like I said, government astronauts, and a lot of the spaceflight participants that we had were more, um, it was more a tourist type, um, tourist type participation as opposed to what the AX-1 mission was about. Um, and then a lot of the other issues that came up, we, we were required to, to follow liability that we had already agreed to, a liability framework that we had already agreed to with our partners, um, a crew code of conduct. As Skip mentioned, we had the, the International Space Station Intergovernmental Agreement, which had a lot of requirements that we, we were bound to follow. So again, it was, it was that balance of we understood that we, NASA, were now mandated to commercialize low Earth orbit, but how do we balance that with all of our other requirements? Thank you. Thank you both. I, I should say that uh, while preparing for this panel, I, I learned some new anecdotes and new things about uh, all the legal aspects uh, which weren't transparent to me when, when we worked about it. So, uh, um, Skip, how, how would you describe the, the role of legal advice in space missions? Well, uh, the big picture is you, you evaluate the, what the risks are. You identify the risks and then you figure out how you can manage them. Can, you manage, can they be managed operationally? Uh, if they can't, uh, can, you, can you manage that risk via the contract? And if you can't do that, can you insure it? And if you can't do that, then you just have to evaluate it and, and, and go from there. Thanks. And, and Rebecca, what, what were the biggest legal challenges from NASA's perspective regarding the Iraqia mission? Um, so that list is, is pretty long because this was the first time that, that we were doing this as well. It was new for everybody. And um, I was very appreciative of Axiom being patient with us as we figured it out and um, Aton and, and the whole crew being patient with us. I would say, again, the, the biggest issue for us was taking a government structure and then trying to 
use it for a, allow it to be used for a commercial purpose. So I, I give you some really good examples. Um, one being the crew code of conduct. We, we have a crew code of conduct in place, which was really based on an ethics regime that was meant for government employees, US government employees. And there were some restrictions with the crew code of conduct, particularly where crew were not allowed to use their official capacity for any type of personal gain or gain for others. So how does that interplay with wanting to do commercial endeavors or endeavors where you want to do something for a non-for-profit and very wonderful and well-meaning activities, but did it fit within our crew code of conduct? Um, and that, that is where, and, and I am far from the only attorney that worked on this. There was a team of us. Um, but we looked at the crew code of conduct and how can we interpret the crew code of conduct to allow for some of the activities that the AX1 crew wanted to do, but still, again, being a government entity, we still had to comply with both our um, ISS partner requirements as well as what activities were allowed because the crew code of conduct is actually codified into US law. So we really tried to find that balance um, and that's where Skip and I had a lot of conversations on what can the crew do even after we wrote the policy and wrote the requirements, he was still saying, hey, Rebecca, how, how do you read this? Um, and, but I think we, we did get to a very good compromise where, again, it allows for commercial activities, but also being true to what our requirements were. Another one was the, the liability regime. So we have cross waivers. It's a cross waiver. It's the ISS cross waiver. It's built into our ISS agreement as well as codified actually in, into US law. So we're required to follow it. And basically, the ISS cross waiver allows for many entities to get involved in space activities but agree to not sue one another or any of their related entities. And we do that because space, as you all know, is inherently dangerous. And there, there is really high liability. If something goes wrong or if it is a bad day, it's, it's gonna be also very expensive for that en entity. So everybody agrees not to sue one another and it gets more people involved and more entities wanting to cooperate, more governments wanting to cooperate. Um, but with that, there are some exceptions to the ISS cross waiver, one being that it allows for natural persons to sue. And NASA took the stance that we allow for natural persons to sue, but we did actually state that the, um, the private astronauts could not come back and sue and use that exception. And, and there was that concern. Again, there was that balance of risk for the agency the risk for our crew members also on orbit and our requirements to ensure that they were protected, but then also not just NASA crew members, but our international crew members. And we also had to answer to, as I mentioned, our international partners and in getting them comfortable. Um, the third issue I would say was the insurance requirements. And we really went back and forth significantly with Axiom on that. You know, it's, you know, we, we, we had to ensure that there were certain insurance requirements that our international um, partnership levied on, on us, and that we had to levy then on Axiom. And there were insurance requirements that we wanted to ensure that the crew members were properly covered if something went wrong. And when it came to third party liability, we, we got to a point where the, we, we thought the third party li liability was fairly low and the agency decided to allow Axiom to self-insure for third party liability, but self-insure or buy whatever insurance that they felt w was necessary. The, the other issue that we got to was insuring for damage to the ISS and Ensuring damage to the ISS can be fairly expensive. So while we did require some insurance, it was a low amount 
um, in comparison to what damage could be caused, but we also realized it's going to be next to impossible to insure at higher levels. So we were very reasonable, I thought, with um, our insurance requirements for allowing Axiom to move forward and um, not be a, cr a cost prohibitive activity and us also being able to fulfill our requirement to commercialize low earth orbit. You know, if I can just talk for like one minute about the cross waivers and I promise you it won't be longer than that because I know how you love to hear about cross waivers of liability. But one of the interesting things about this mission was it's, it's the only mission that I'm aware of that had literally just about every type of waiver possible. There was a launch waiver, there was a return. There was a waiver with NASA for uh, activities on the space station. Uh, and there was training in Texas and Florida, and both of those states had requirements for waivers, so we had those. And then there was, this was human space flight. Uh, so, Eitan, I'm sure you remember how much fun it was listening to the informed consent briefing that SpaceX gave you about everything that could go wrong and then asking you to sign here. Uh, so every type of waiver possible was on this mission. Sounds like a medical procedure. <laughs> hey, uh, one thing on that, though, the, the good thing about that, again, is, as I said, if nobody's suing anybody and you're all responsible for your own liability, then you're less concerned that somebody's going to come in and sue you and more likely to then want to cooperate and be involved in the activity. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I am... Skip, what... Can you share with us an example of legal advice that you provided that made the emission better, the emission better? Sure. Uh, uh, Eitan and I talked about uh, what would happen if he did all this training and shortly before uh, the launch, for one, for one reason or another, he was unable to go. So we negotiated a provision for a backup astronaut, and uh, the backup astronaut was able to train with Aton throughout the, uh, the the extensive training process, and and basically be there to step into his shoes almost literally if he wasn't able to go. Uh, and Aton chose as his backup astronaut his daughter Sheer, and I think there's nothing cooler than training with your dad to go into space. So that was uh, uh, an awesome aspect of this contract. Sounds like it improved significantly <laughs> Eitan's and Shear's experience. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to ask you both, or, or Rebecca, or a, um, about general and practical legal suggestions that you would provide to our audience with regard to space missions. For example, I'll give an example. Um, if someone would have asked me for a tip or a suggestion on something uh, that would be useful, but perhaps not yet uh, intuitive to, to the space Israel, uh, industry in Israel, I, actually I would refer to an unmanned mission in this case, but I would say I would raise the, the need to get a, a third party insurance in order to have a space object registered by the government of Israel. It is not intuitive. And I should explain uh, in this context that Israel doesn't have yet a space law. We are in, a, in the initial steps of uh, drafting it. Uh, when such legislation would, is, is completed, requirements like that of a third party insurance will be very clear to everyone. But, but meanwhile, it's something that I would, for example, suggest to, to our space industry. So, so do you have special legal suggestions to our audience members? Rebecca, do you want to start? Yeah, so you touched um, earlier on Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. So I think it's important to remember um, space activities are very unique in that the state takes responsibility not just for state activities but also for commercial activities. Um, and we do that primarily through licensing, through, through authorization. So in the United States we have um, launch and landing licenses through the FAA. Um, 
What is still unknown, I think, in many countries is the authorization of the activities that are occurring in space. And that area, I think, is morphing, it's developing. So really keeping your eye on how that, how that develops, I think, is, also, is, is very important. Um, also remembering, too, that liability, now liability and responsibility are not, not the same necessarily. Um, liability in space, if you're the launching state or you're the state that procures the launch or the state from where the launch occurs or from the state from where the facility is located where the launch occurs, all four of those entities can be liable. So it's really important to keep that in mind. So before you enter into an activity, it is very clear on how that liability is apportioned amongst those entities. Um, I would also, you know, from, from my learning from the Axiom One mission was, you know, intellectual property rights. So what activities do you want to do in space? Are there the proper intellectual property provisions in those contracts to allow those private astronauts to do those activities. As well as, I'm, I'm expecting these commercial space stations to have some sort of crew code of conduct as well. So what is that crew code of conduct? I'm, I will, I'm guessing, probably not as restrictive as the crew code of conduct that we had, again, because ours was originally written for government astronauts, but what is that crew code of conduct and does that allow your astronauts, your private astronauts, to do the activities that they want to do. Okay, um, Kip, do you want to add anything? Sure, I'd, I'd just say if you're planning a space mission uh, at some point in time, get yourself a good lawyer and somebody who, uh, who knows the aerospace industry. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, I, I, Second, the Skip's uh, recommendation, uh, people really don't understand how many legal aspects and legal uh, considerations are involved in every space mission, manned or unmanned, and uh, there is a need of, uh, for, for a good legal advice in uh, every such uh, case. So at this point, I, <laughs> I would like to thank you both Skip and Rebecca, for the interesting insights and, and for sharing with our audience uh, some of your rich legal experience. I've enjoyed our conversation and, and their, its preparation as well. And uh, I have many more questions, but uh, due to time constraints, uh, we, we couldn't refer to all, the, all our questions. Um, but uh, Skip and uh, Rebecca have has, asked me to uh, relay to, to the audience that they remain in the conference tomorrow and will be happy to answer questions. And it goes for me uh, too. So thank you all. And I hope you enjoyed uh, our panel and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been an incredibly enlightening and productive first day here at the 18th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. We have heard from some of the brightest minds in the field and have been presented with a wealth of new ideas and perspectives. As we come to the close of this first day, I would like to remind you all of the importance of the work being done in the space sector. The advancements and discoveries made in advanced exp in space exploration have the potential to greatly benefit humanity, and it is our duty to continue pushing the boundaries of what is possible. I'm very excited for tomorrow and looking forward to another day of stimulating discussions and collaborations. Thank you all for your contribution, and I hope you all have, I wish you have a very good evening. Thank you very much. After, but after all, we're just a bubble in a boiling pot, just one breath in a chain of thought.